Damon was escorted to a cell. He sat alone, feeling forgotten and abandoned. But as the night wore on, his keen hearing picked up a faint sound. Please let me see my husband. It was Fifi's voice pleading with the police to let her see her husband. Damon strained to listen as the conversation grew heated, with the officer on duty refusing to let Fifi in. Damon's heart sank as he heard Fifi's desperation, but he couldn't help feeling a glimmer of hope that she was still fighting for him. The officer's dismissive attitude only made Damon more determined to clear his name and prove his innocence. As Fifi's sobs faded away, Damon was left alone with his thoughts. He knew he was in for a long haul, with no end in sight, but he refused to give up, even as the police station buzzed with activity around him. Despite the uncertainty and fear, Damon was determined to fight for his freedom and clear his name. The next morning, Damon found himself face to face with the same policeman who had interrogated him the night before. The officer's stern expression made it clear that he wasn't messing around. Are you ready to confess to your crimes? But Damon's mind was elsewhere. He couldn't shake the memory of Fifi's cries from the night before. He knew he had to act fast. Sir, please, I need to speak with Pitbull, Edgar Gates, and Inspector McDuff. He pleaded. The policeman shook his head. I already told you, I won't give you their contact information. Don't even think about lying to get close to them. Your best bet is to come clean. These three individuals are some of the most powerful people in all of Meyerson. Pitbull had built an empire in just a few short years and was acquainted with the criminal underworld. Edgar was a financial tycoon with assets that could make heads spin. And Inspector McDuff? He was practically a legend of the police force, with connections and influence that extended far beyond the city limits. The seasoned police officer had seen it all before. He knew Damon was bluffing and wasn't about to fall for his tricks. Criminals always tried to name drop and make connections, but it never led to anything substantial. It was just a messy web of drama. Damon didn't even bother trying to convince the officer. He simply stood up and ripped the handcuffs off like they were made of paper. The officer was frozen with fear, unable to utter a word. Damon wasn't done yet. He picked up the phone on the table and dialed with ease, his powerful memories serving him well. When the call connected, he spoke with confidence. Pitbull, it's Damon. I'm at the police station. Come get me, and while you're at it, give me Edgar's number. I'll call him myself. Oh, and don't forget to give me Inspector McDuff's number too. Absolutely, sir, replied Pitbull with utmost respect. Damon was curious to see how much power Robert and his grandfather still held in Meyerson, especially after his criminal act. The police officer was stunned. How did Damon know Pitbull? Soon enough, Pitbull transferred the call to Damon, who dialed the number of the super tycoon in Meyerson's financial circle, Edgar Gates. Hello, is this Edgar Gates? Who are you? Edgar snarled. Edgar was taken aback, not recognizing Damon's voice, but he had to answer the call, as it was his personal phone. Only someone very close to him would have his number. My name is Damon Walker and I need your help. You should come to the police station. I'll wait for you here. Edgar's tone changed. You? What? You're Damon Walker? I'll be right there. The policeman thought that he had misheard. The police were initially skeptical, but as soon as Damon spoke with Edgar Gates, they knew they were dealing with some serious big shots. The officers wondered if Damon was involved in an elaborate ruse. They needed to keep their guard up and not get too carried away. Damon made a call to Inspector McDuff, but he knew the police were eavesdropping, so he hung up quickly. The police officer couldn't help but mock him. When will the big shots you mentioned come and save you? He sneered. Damon was unfazed. Right away. He answered with certainty. The police officer couldn't believe it. He had seen many swindlers in his time, but never someone who dared to lie and remain so calm while they were in custody. At this time, Dr. Delilah Lithwick, Mr. Kovac's lawyer, entered the room. She leaned in and spoke in a low, menacing tone. Young man, have you thought this through? What if the sentence is 10 years longer? There's still time for Mr. Kovac to drop the charges. It could spare your life. Damon's mind raced as he weighed his options. Dr. Lithwick seemed to be offering him a way out, but something about her intentions felt off. Was she looking out for Damon's best interest, or was she trying to get him to confess and then use that as leverage? As if reading his thoughts, Dr. Lithwick continued, Do you want to save face or save your life? You're still young, don't waste your time running away in a cell. Damon was suspicious of the lawyer's motives. It seemed like she was trying to manipulate him into admitting guilt, with no guarantee of actually helping him in the end. And if he did confess, there was no telling what Mr. Kovac might do. Damon's smile was as cold as ice as he looked at Dr. Lithwick. Do you want me to repeat what I said yesterday? He asked. Dr. Lithwick was taken aback. What? 
Damon's eyes narrowed. I told you to get lost, but it seems like you still don't understand. He said, his tone laced with contempt. Dr. Lithwick's anger boiled over. You! You! She sputtered, her voice shaking with rage. Fine! If you want to throw your life away, that's your business! But let me tell you something. Mr. Kovac was right. You're nothing but a lowly peasant who can't tell right from wrong. Your brain is as dull as a pig's. You're a worthless piece of... Before Dr. Lithwick could finish her sentence, Damon had already stood up from his seat. With a fierce determination in his eyes, he grabbed Dr. Lithwick by the collar and slapped her across the face. The police arrived just in time to save Dr. Lithwick from Damon's blows. But even in the presence of the law, Damon remained defiant. You dare to hit people in the police station? The police officer shouted. Damon was unapologetic. She was threatening me. The police officer balked. After witnessing Damon's arrogance and the fact that even the handcuffs couldn't trap Damon, the officer didn't touch Damon for the time being because he was a wise man who didn't want to fight when the odds were against him. At this time, a middle-aged policeman walked in hastily. Excuse me, are you Damon Walker? Damon had expected this. Yes, I'm Damon. I'm sorry, the man exclaimed. Our bureau chief has just called and said it was a misunderstanding. The other policeman was confused. Misunderstanding? This guy hit Mr. Kovac and even beat up Dr. Delilah Lithwick. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. The officer thought of the few phone calls Damon had made just a moment ago. Could this young man in front of him have some serious connections? I will investigate the matter shortly, but for now let's put it aside, said the middle-aged man. Then he turned to Damon. Mr. Walker, I don't know about your relationship with our bureau chief, but I apologize for any convenience we may have caused you. With a flick of his wrist, he helped Damon unlock the handcuffs. Much to the surprise of the police officer, Damon gave a nod of gratitude as he heard the sound of a car approaching. It was Edgar, a man of great importance who had canceled his meetings just to come to Damon's aid. He even rallied the troops, blowing a whistle to summon backup. The police officers were taken aback by the sudden influx of people storming into their tiny station. The once skeptical police officer felt his legs go weak as he realized the gravity of the situation. The officers couldn't believe their eyes. They had always thought that Damon was just a big talker, but now they were witnessing the real deal. Their hearts pounded as they realized they could have easily made things difficult for Damon and the consequences would have been unbearable. A man wearing glasses strolled up to the front desk. Where is Damon Walker? He demanded. Edgar's words sparked a frenzy of discussion among the surrounding crowd. Did you hear that? That's the financial tycoon Edgar Gates. Gasped one person. Shortly after Edgar arrived, an imposing man strode in behind him. It was Inspector McDuff, a legend in the Meyerson police force. His presence at the small police station was a rare occasion. The staff all stood at attention as he approached, bowing slightly in respect. Hello, Inspector McDuff, what brings you here? They asked. Inspector McDuff nodded at them politely, then turned to Edgar. Have you found Damon yet? Just then, Damon emerged from the interrogation room, flanked by police officers. Damon had expected his grandfather's colleagues to arrange something grand, but he was still taken aback by the sight before him. A row of people stood outside. The entire street was filled with luxury cars. Edgar rushed to Damon's side, eager to show his loyalty. He even wanted to kneel and bow before him. Everyone was shocked by this display of subservience. Edgar was trembling as he looked Damon up and down. You are the young master? He asked, his voice filled with awe. I'm sorry I came late. Inspector McDuff approached Damon with a friendly smile, his eyes twinkling with warmth. Excuse me, are you the son of Robert Brokerton? He asked. Damon nodded, feeling a sense of familiarity wash over him. You must be Inspector McDuff. He exclaimed, recognizing the inspector from his father's stories. Inspector McDuff chuckled. Hello, hello, your father's a hero. He's done me countless favors over the years. If you have any troubles in Meyerson, please let me know. I'll do my best to help. The young policeman who had been interrogating him earlier looked visibly shaken, his confidence shattered by Damon's impressive lineage. Officers, please release this man from custody at once. Inspector McDuff commanded. The officers had no other choice. They begrudgingly signed Damon's discharge paperwork. Damon couldn't shake Fifi from his mind as he checked the time. It was time to pick Junior up from kindergarten, but his thoughts were interrupted by a group of people walking in front of him. Mr. Kovac and Dr. Lithwick had their heads ducked, whispering to one another. When they saw Damon, they scowled. Mr. Kovac pointed at Damon. What the hell? How is this man walking free? He deserves life in prison. Dr. Lithwick wiped the sweat from her forehead. 
I know it's outrageous, but legally speaking, his crime doesn't warrant a life sentence. Mr. Kovac rolled his eyes. He at least deserves to be punished. He ran up to the police officers. Excuse me, who let this criminal walk out onto the street? The young policeman and the chief saw Mr. Kovac had arrived. Their faces turned green with fright. Mr. Kovac, please leave. Don't cause any trouble, said the cop. You can't let Damon Walker get away with his crimes, screamed Mr. Kovac. Pitbull, who was standing at the side, couldn't hold back his anger. He raised his hand and slapped Mr. Kovac's face. What the hell are you talking about? Mr. Kovac lay on the ground, his body aching and his spirit broken. This was a new low. How could he have let this happen? Was he really that weak? As he struggled to get up, he felt like he was made of paper. Had the gravity of the earth disappeared? Was he floating in space? Dr. Lithwick appeared, jumping up and down with a rage. Why aren't you arresting him? She shouted at the police. He hit Mr. Kovac. What kind of cops are you? Pitbull pushed to the front until he was face to face with the lawyer. Dr. Lithwick stuttered, trying to form a response, but her eyes widened with recognition. Pitbull was infamous in Meyerson. No one wanted to cross him. Edgar and Inspector McDuff walked down and stood beside Pitbull. Their arms crossed. Dr. Lithwick's legs felt like jelly. The group turned their attention to Mr. Kovac. What did you say about Damon? Pitbull growled. Mr. Kovac's jaw dropped. You, you're friends with Damon? He felt dizzy. Wasn't Damon just some nobody? Seeing that Mr. Kovac didn't speak, Inspector McDuff narrowed his eyes and turned to a police officer. What's going on? The officer hurried to explain the situation, careful not to show obvious bias. Everyone listened attentively, but clearly it was Mr. Kovac's fault. Mr. Kovac knew things wouldn't go his way. He dropped to his knees and begged for forgiveness. Dr. Lithwick was taken aback by Mr. Kovac's sudden display of contrition. Get up, she hissed. Mr. Kovac shook his head. I know you're my lawyer, but there are some things we can't argue our way out of. We can't offend these people. Mr. Kovac and Dr. Lithwick were more cowardly than dogs. They pleaded for mercy. All eyes were fixed on Damon, who held the power to decide Mr. Kovac's fate. It was clear that his word would be determined whether the man lived or died. Everyone waited with bated breath for Damon's decision. Damon looked down at Mr. Kovac and let out a sigh. Get lost, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. Relief flooded Mr. Kovac's face as he thanked Damon for sparing his life. Dr. Lithwick, too, was quick to follow suit, scrambling away as fast as possible. Damon turned to Pitbull and said, I need to go find my wife and pick up my son from kindergarten. You guys head back without me. Pitbull's confused. What? Didn't this whole incident begin at kindergarten? Let's go with you. Edgar chimed in. I believe my daughter attends the same school. It'll be convenient if we all go together in case there's more trouble. Damon hesitated but couldn't bear the thought of his son being hurt and Fifi being scared. He finally agreed. Okay, let's go find her. Junior's kindergarten was located in a well-to-do wealthy suburb. Entering this kindergarten was a privilege reserved for the elite. Only the wealthy and noble could afford the exorbitant tuition fee of $50,000 per year. It was a world apart from the ordinary, and Junior knew it all too well. As he stood outside the classroom, feeling dejected after a fight with two other students, he couldn't help but wonder why his parents even bothered sending him there. Those two students were his bully Weston's lackeys always ready to do his bidding. They had teamed up with Weston to bully Junior before, but he had fought back and given them a taste of their own medicine. This morning, as Fifi dropped him off on her Vespa, they dared to surround her and insult Junior, calling him a poor kid who didn't belong in such a prestigious school. Even at such a young age, these kids were already wise beyond their years. With backgrounds that set them apart from the norm, they carried themselves with a certain level of maturity and sophistication that was hard to ignore. They were fighters, and not just for themselves, but for their beliefs and ideas. And when they clashed, it was like watching a battle of the titans. Junior's fighting skills were unmatched. Even when he was up against two opponents, he still came out on top. The other kids did not stand a chance. When the teacher finally intervened, it was chaos. Some of the kids were lying on the ground, crying and hurt. And when the parents of the injured children found out, they were livid. They rushed to the school demanding answers and justice, but even among all the chaos, Junior remained unfazed. His face was bruised and battered, but he stood tall and proud. It was clear he wasn't afraid of anyone, no matter how powerful or wealthy they were. 
The teacher knew that compared to the other two classmates, Junior's background was nothing to be intimidated by. The scene was straight out of a Hollywood movie as the parents arrived, a thin man in a Ferrari and a bald man in a Rolls Royce, flanked by a few burly bodyguards. Who hit my son? The thin man's eyes narrowed, his jaw clenched, and his fists balled up at his sides. The bald man standing next to him was equally furious. I want to break that little brat's hand, he growled. The teacher felt a shiver run down his spine as he looked at the two parents' ferocious faces. He knew he had to defuse the situation quickly. Parents, today's just a misunderstanding, he said, his voice shaking slightly. The thin man put his hands on his hips and glared at the teacher. We sent our children to your school to study, not to get beaten up. The teacher felt his heart racing as he asked, Then what do you want to do? The bald man's eyes flickered over to Junior, who was cowering in fear. He smiled ferociously. I'm not an unreasonable person, but I heard that this kid is making things difficult for my son. In that case, as long as my son can give him a taste of his own medicine, I'll let him go. It this, but... The teacher was at a loss. Theoretically, all he needed to do was to calm the children down. He couldn't let violence beget violence. The bald man seemed to have guessed the teacher's thoughts. Teacher, I know what you're thinking. I promise Junior won't be beaten too harshly, and I'll make sure my son only hits him in a corner where the camera won't catch him. Plus, I guarantee he won't tell his parents. The thin man chimed in and threatened to file a complaint if the teacher didn't agree to the request. But then the little boy who had been slapped by Junior spoke up and said, Dad, Junior comes from a poor family. It's a waste to hit him. The bald man was practically bouncing with excitement. Did you hear that? Why are you scared of the backlash from Junior's family? The man chuckled, reaching out to grab Junior's ear, but was stopped in his tracks by a deep, menacing voice. Whoever dares touch my son, try. The voice belonged to none other than Damon, who had stormed into the room brandishing a knife. His anger was palpable, like a lion ready to pounce on its prey. The teacher's face drained of color as he realized the gravity of the situation. He knew Damon was Junior's father, and the memory of him beating up Mr. Kovac and getting arrested was still fresh in her mind. The bald man pursed his lips. Well, 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 aren't you intimidating? The thin man smirked. I heard your family's poor. I don't think you can afford the lawsuits if you touch us. With lightning-fast reflexes, Damon lifted his leg and delivered a powerful kick to the bald man's stomach, sending him flying. The thin man was left trembling in fear, realizing he was no match for Damon's strength and skill. The thin man could only imagine what would happen if he took a kick from Damon. He'd probably be flying out of the Milky Way. The scene was tense as the bald man struggled to get up, his face twisted in anger. You, you dare to hit me? He spat out, his voice shaking with fury. Bodyguards, where are you? In a flash, a group of bodyguards appeared, surrounding Damon and making it clear that they meant business. But this was no ordinary kindergarten. Along with the teachers, there was a team of security guards who were there to maintain public safety. The two groups of people closed in on Damon, making sure he couldn't escape. Suddenly, a voice boomed out from behind them. Who has the guts to surround our master? Pitbull's voice echoed through the air sending shivers down everyone's spines. With a fierce determination, he led his army of loyal followers to surround the bodyguards. Edgar and Inspector Macduff were among the crowd. Their hands were poised at their waist, ready to draw their weapons at a moment's notice. Some of them were packing some serious heat, including pistols. Edgar's face twisted in anger as he demanded to know what was going on. The bald man was as pale as a ghost. He recognized these men from somewhere, but he couldn't quite place them. All he knew was that he was in trouble. With a nervous stutter, the bald man asked, I Excuse me, are you Inspector Macduff? Inspector Macduff confirmed his identity and wasted no time in getting to the bottom of things. He turned to the teacher. What happened here? The teacher was beside himself with fear, realizing he had unwittingly put Junior in harm's way. He had let the bald man and the thin man unleash their fury on him and even allowed Damon to catch him. When Inspector Macduff had asked what had happened, he was at a loss for words. The weight of everyone's gaze was suffocating, and he felt like he might break down in tears. At this time, Edgar's daughter, Lulu Gates, arrived at the scene. As it turned out, the kindergarten was owned by the Gates Corporation, an establishment that prided itself on its top-notch service. 
but today one of the teachers had gone against the interest of another student to appease some angry parents. And to make matters worse, that student just happened to be Damon's child. Something was amiss, and Lulu was not about to let it slide. Lulu's heart raced as she considered the implications. If Damon were to blame her family for this injustice, the Gates family would be in deep trouble. But Edgar had always warned his children never to betray Damon, no matter how powerful the Gates family became. Damon's family influence was simply too great to ignore. Wait, are you Lulu Gates? The security captain's eyes widened in surprise as he recognized the woman standing before him. Lulu was the big boss of the company, and he had only seen her from afar during the annual meeting. To her, he was just a small fish in a big pond. But to him, she was the powerful force he could only dream of seeing up close. Lulu's voice was cold as she questioned the captain's actions. If you know who I am, why are you all still surrounding me? Why haven't you called the director over? Without hesitation, someone rushed to the office to call the director, and the security captain waved his hand to disperse the guards surrounding Damon. The group of people looked at Damon with fear, knowing that the CEO of the parent company, Lulu, stood behind Damon. A flurry of commotion erupted as the kindergarten director sprinted toward them, her face furrowed with urgency. I heard the CEO of the company is here! She exclaimed breathlessly. The kindergarten director was a middle-aged woman and had worked tirelessly for years to climb the ladder and attain her current position. But when it came to Lulu, there was a clear gap in their levels and authority statuses. What happened? She asked, looking at the teacher for answers. But the poor teacher was too scared to speak. The director crossed her arms. Tell me what happened right now or you're fired! Thus the teacher told the director the entire story. The kindergarten director's face went white as a sheet, and her body shook with fear when she heard the news. Lulu, on the other hand, was calm and collected as she warned that if there were any further violations of the law, she would not hesitate to involve the judiciary. The director turned to face the angry parents who've been involved in the confrontation. From today onwards, your sons don't need to come to our school anymore. The bald man and the thin man's expressions changed drastically. What the hell? The bald man exclaimed. This is my son's district school, and we pay a pretty penny in tuition. You can't expel us. However, Lulu didn't care. You can sue if you wish. I don't think you'll have a good time fighting back against the Gates Corporation. As Lulu stood her ground with a tough attitude, the bald man expression twisted into an ugly scowl. Despite his status and the potential for a lengthy lawsuit, he couldn't afford to waste any time. This was no ordinary kindergarten, it was a private prestigious group that would do anything to protect its reputation. The bald man's eyes darted to the person standing beside Lulu, Edgar Gates, a tycoon in the financial circle. Even with his wealth, the bald man couldn't compare to him. And that wasn't all. There was also Pitbull, Inspector McDuff, and Damon, who had gathered these powerful forces. Even if he was a pig, he knew better than to mess with this circle of influential people. As the bald man sat in silence, the thin man couldn't resist speaking up. Director, I want to make it clear that I'm not with him. Please don't expel our family. The kindergarten was difficult to get into. The application process alone took months. If a child excelled at kindergarten, they would be at the right track to landing a good private elementary school. Then a high school, they could even reach the Ivy League. Many parents moved to the neighborhood only to send their children to a reputable private kindergarten. If they were to get the boot from this kindergarten, it would be a total disaster. They had bought a house nearby for a reason. After all, if they were forced to find a new kindergarten, they'd have to trek 10 or 15 miles away. And in Meyerson, where traffic was a daily nightmare, that would be a headache for both the kids and adults alike. But Lulu said coldly, I'm sorry, the same goes for you. Your child and his child must leave our kindergarten tomorrow. Your child likes to beat up other children, and our school doesn't welcome you. You're welcome to sue us, but you must leave. Her tone was firm and unwavering, leaving no room for a negotiation. The two men were left speechless, their tails tucked between their legs. But it wasn't just Lulu who had the power here. Inspector McDuff and the others were also present, and their mere presence was enough to make the bald man and the thin man back down. They knew they couldn't win against Damon's team, so they left, defeated. The staff at the kindergarten looked at Damon with newfound respect. They had seen how he had stood up for his family, and they knew that he was not to be messed with. Even the teachers who had previously been indifferent to him now rushed forward to greet him, eager to show their support. Damon's power and wealth had given him a certain level of influence. 
no one would dare to cross him or show any disrespect to his family. And now that he was back, he would ensure his wife and children were never mistreated again. After wrapping up the junior situation, Damon couldn't resist calling Fifi. He needed to know where she was and what she was up to. Fifi was taken aback when she saw Damon's name flash on her phone screen. Wasn't he still locked up in the detention center? How did he manage to call her? But Damon quickly put her worries to rest. He had been granted a call to his lawyer and wanted to let Fifi know that everything was under control. Little did Fifi know Damon had a surprise up his sleeve. He hadn't mentioned it on the call, but he had been released from jail. He couldn't wait to see the look on Fifi's face when he showed up. Hey, where are you? Damon asked, trying to contain his excitement. I'm at work, Damon, but don't worry. I went to see a lawyer last night. He said your charges aren't that serious and you should be out soon. Fifi reassured him, trying to be a beacon of hope in his dark situation. Fifi hung up the phone in a frenzy and immediately covered her face with her hands, tears streaming down her cheek. She was at a loss, having lost her job a while back and now desperately searching for a new one. Her heart was heavy with despair, and she feared that if she spoke any more, she would reveal too much. That morning, Fifi called her mother Karen, first sharing the news that Damon was still alive. She then went on to explain the difficulties Damon was facing, and hoped that Karen could help him out. Karen was shocked by the news of Damon's survival, but she still refused Fifi's request. Fifi knew that this was the path she had chosen for herself, and even if she begged on her knees, she would still have to walk it. Back at university, Karen had been against Fifi and Damon being together, resulting in Fifi being transferred to another school. But fate had a funny way of working, and the more Karen tried to stop it, the more it flourished. Damon may have had some accomplishments, but being born into a poor family meant his success was ultimately futile. Similarly, Karen was also born into poverty, and despite her tenacity, she couldn't change the fact that her family was no longer what it used to be. With no high-ranking position in the family, Karen was powerless to help. Meanwhile, Fifi had become a mother herself and was left to fend for herself. After hanging up the phone, she wiped away her tears and knew that she had to work hard to find a job. Even with Damon in prison, Fifi couldn't rely on anyone else but herself. She had to be strong and independent, with no family to fall back on. Fifi had always been passionate about music and dance and had spent years honing her skills, but finding a job in these fields was no easy feat. When she approached a dance troupe for work, she was politely turned away. I'm sorry, beauty, but our dance troupe doesn't need anyone right now. The staff member told her. Disappointment washed over her, but she tried to keep her head held high as she turned to leave. Suddenly, a voice called out to her, Beauty, wait! Fifi's eyes lit up. Could this be a second chance? She turned back around, her eyes shining with hope. The staff member looked her up and down, a wretched smile playing at the corners of his mouth. To be honest, he said slowly, our singing and dance troupe staff is already full, but... Fifi leaned in eagerly, waiting for the rest of the sentence. As Fifi stood there, waiting for a response from the staff member, she couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. Instead of answering her question, he looked her up and down with a sly grin on his face. So beautiful, so charismatic. Fifi was taken aback by his words and felt her anger rising. She turned to leave, but the staff member called her back. Beauty, how about I introduce you to a few better jobs? He said, trying to smooth things over. Girl, let me tell you something. You are drop-dead gorgeous. Even the leader of the singing and dancing group can't hold a candle to you. Sure, you may not be the most talented dancer, but who cares? You've got legs for days. How about I introduce you to the nightclub scene? Trust me, with your looks, you'll be a star in no time. You could become the mistress of a high-ranking official. With that body, you'll be able to make a meteoric rise. Fifi was fuming with anger, her whole body shaking with fury. You scumbag! She spat at the staff member who had just made a disgusting proposition to her. But the sleazy man didn't get the message. I have a lot of connections. You'd love to work for my strip club. Fifi couldn't believe what she was hearing. Was this guy for real? Damn it. What era is it now? She snapped. Why are you still pretending to be pure here? In a place like Meyerson, some women don't like money. The staff member muttered to himself as Fifi stormed off. Fifi found a quiet corner to hide in and let her tears flow, but she didn't let her emotions get the best of her for long. After a few minutes, she wiped away her tears and resolved to find another job. 
Be strong. She told herself, you must be strong. Just as she was about to leave, she heard a voice behind her. Didn't you say you were working? Why are you here? Fifi turned around and saw Damon standing there with a smile on his face. She couldn't believe her eyes. Damon was supposed to be in a detention center. What was he doing here? The setting sun cast a warm glow on Damon's back, making him look even more handsome than usual. Fifi's heart skipped a beat. You... didn't you... why? She stammered, lost for words. I got out. Damon mummered. Didn't you say you were working? Why are you here? Fifi wiped her tears and explained. No, this is just a business trip. I'll be going back soon. Damon knew something was wrong. Don't lie to me. He said gently. I just came from your company. They said, you quit your job. Fifi's face fell. She had been hoping to keep this a secret from Damon, but it seemed he already knew. I'm sorry, she said quietly. Damon took her in his arms. Why didn't you tell me? He asked. Fifi bit her lip and shook her head. She was worried about how Damon would react, about the financial strain on the family. But Damon already knew what she was thinking. Are you worried about the family? He asked. About me not having a job when I come back? Fifi nodded, tears streaming down her face. The expenses at home get bigger every day. She sobbed. Damon held her close and whispered, Silly goose. Trust me, I promise you a superior life. I'll never go back on my word. Damon couldn't resist a mischievous grin as he watched Fifi's worried expression. Don't worry, Fifi. People always find a way. How about we sell your car and make some money? Your car has been broken for weeks anyway. He never expected Fifi to take him seriously, but to his surprise, she furrowed her brow in thought and nodded. Oh, I think that would be okay. As it turned out, Fifi had bought the fancy car to maintain her son Junior's reputation at his prestigious school. With all the wealthy noble families around, Fifi couldn't bear the thought of her son being laughed at for driving an ordinary car, but now it seemed that Fifi was willing to make sacrifices for the sake of her family's well-being. Damon furrowed his brow. Making Fifi feel better would be more difficult than he anticipated, but Fifi knew that survival was more important than maintaining a certain image. Thankfully, Damon had re-entered her life, and that was all that mattered. Even if they couldn't live the lavish lifestyle they once had, they could still make it through together. So Damon promised they would start downsizing. It may seem like a far-fetched idea, but Fifi didn't care. Having dreams was better than having nothing at all. Damon and Fifi didn't have a car available, so they took the subway home. Damon, what do you think will happen to us? She leaned her head on Damon's shoulder, and her eyes sparkled, looking forward to the future. Damon stroked her hair. I don't know, but I promise everything will work out. When we finally achieve financial freedom, I want us to embark on an adventure around the world. With Junior by our side, can you imagine all the amazing places we'll get to see and experience together? Damon smiled at Fifi's infectious enthusiasm. He gently ran his fingers through her hair and replied, Absolutely, my love. I can't wait to make that dream a reality. As Fifi snuggled up to Damon's chest, she shared another dream with him. You know what else I've wanted? To open up a beautiful flower shop and surround myself with the sweet scent of blossoms every single day. Would you be interested in running it with me? Without hesitation, Damon agreed. Of course, Fifi. I'd love nothing more than to make that dream come true for you. But as they both came back to reality, Fifi reminded Damon of their current priorities. As much as we want to chase our dreams, we need to focus on finding a job first. Damon chuckled and added, And let's not forget about selling our broken car for some extra cash. As soon as Fifi stepped into the subway car, a group of men couldn't take their eyes off her. Despite looking a bit worn out from job hunting, her stunning face and charming personality shone through. One man even assumed she must have come from a wealthy background, but was shocked to learn through eavesdropping that she was unemployed. A pot-bellied man spoke up. Hey, are you looking for a job? I'm the president of a successful company. I can help you. But his intentions were far from pure, as his eyes never left her chest. Fifi was disgusted and sought refuge in the protective arms of Damon, whose cold stare sent the man scurrying away. As the subway pulled into the terminal, Fifi stuck close to Damon as they emerged from the station and were greeted by a sea of luxury cars parked outside. Even Fifi, who had seen her fair share of opulence, couldn't help but be awestruck. 
Meyerson was no stranger to the wealthy elite, but this display of extravagance was something else entirely. Just then, one of the businessmen who had been boasting on the subway piped up. Wow, would you look at all these luxury cars? This is insane. Another man chimed in. If I could afford just one of these cars, I'd die a happy man. The potbelly man scoffed. You guys have no idea. That Rolls Royce is a custom-made version that's not even available for purchase. And check this other one. It's bulletproof. Do you think anyone with money can get their hands on something like this? He eyed Fifi to make sure she heard his extensive knowledge about luxury cars. Hey there, young master! Someone called out from the Rolls Royce, bowing his head in reverence. It was all part of Damon's plan, of course. He had expected nothing less. Fifi's eyes widened in disbelief as she watched the three boastful businessmen now cower in fear, tails between their legs. Damon? W what's happening? She stuttered. But Damon simply smiled and patted her cheek. Remember when I said I wasn't comfortable with you driving a broken car? Well, I thought we could upgrade to something better. Damon would always be her strongest supporter no matter what the future holds. His words were filled with passion and conviction, leaving no doubt in Fifi's mind. Thank you, gentlemen. That'll be all. Damon said to the man in the back. But despite his orders, the group refused to leave. One of their leaders explained that they had been tasked with ensuring Damon's safety by the notorious pit bull. Damon knew that he couldn't ignore such a request, so he reluctantly allowed them to escort them home. Damon and Fifi walked hand in hand, feeling relieved to be back home. As they entered the house, they were greeted by the sight of Mrs. Walker and Andrew, bringing Junior back from their outing. The little one was happily playing with his toys while the elders were busy cooking up a storm in the kitchen. But something was amiss. Selena was nowhere to be seen. Why didn't you come home yesterday? Andrew asked, unaware that Damon had been detained by the police. Fifi chose to keep mum about the whole ordeal, not wanting to scare the elders any further. Luckily, Damon had a quick comeback ready. He told them that he had bumped into an old classmate and had lost track of time. Mrs. Walker shot Damon a disapproving look. Seriously, dear, how old are you? When are you going to wake up? You're not a bachelor anymore. You have a family and a little one to think about. You can't just leave all night. Andrew nodded. You just got home and you're already trying to sneak out? If you even think about running off with some shady characters, you'll be letting Fifi down. And trust me, your mother and I won't hesitate to criticize you. Damon smiled bitterly and glanced over at Fifi. She suppressed a giggle and stuck her tongue out at him playfully. No matter how successful Damon became in the outside world, in the eyes of Mrs. Walker and Andrew, he would always be their little boy. After a delicious dinner, the family gathered in the cozy living room for some quality time. Later, Damon and Fifi put Junior to bed, snuggling with him until he fell asleep. Fifi had never felt so peaceful before. It was a stark contrast to the endless fear she felt just the night before. But now with Damon by her side, all the danger seemed to subside. Feeling grateful and safe, Fifi hugged Damon tightly. Damon, who are those people today? She asked curiously. Some of my friends. Damon replied nonchalantly. Fifi shook her head. If they were just friends, why did they call him Young Master in public? But she didn't want to push it. Damon assured her, There are some things that I can't tell you right now. All you need to know is that I'm stronger than ever. Fifi's heart swelled with pride and admiration for her husband. She climbed into his lap and asked, Damon, can we take a family photo tomorrow? Damon agreed. Fifi sighed blissfully, then wrapped her legs around him. Hubby? Her voice was soft and sweet, and her intentions were crystal clear. Damon couldn't resist teasing her. Can I help you with something? Fifi shot him a glare. You, you know what I want to do. I don't know. Damon replied, playing dumb. Fifi couldn't take it anymore. She bit her lip and looked down at him in longing. I want... Didn't we just have a wild night two days ago? Damon winked. Fifi blushed even more. That's not enough. Do you know how long I've been holding back? It had been a full five years. She had to rely on sheer willpower to resist her desires. They pounced on one another, rolling around in bed until one o'clock in the morning before they both fell asleep, satisfied and content. The next morning, Damon's peaceful slumber was abruptly interrupted by the shrill ring of his phone. He groggily reached for his device and was surprised to see Scarlett's name flashing on the screen. His heart skipped a beat as he answered the call, eager to hear her voice. Hey, Scarlett, he said. Why didn't you come back to work? Scarlett demanded to know. 
Damon had taken a few days off to catch up with his loved ones, and Scarlet had graciously granted him the leave. However, she couldn't help but to worry about him, and had been checking his department every day to see if he had returned. I'll be back in a day or two, Damon replied, promising to keep his word. Scarlet was silent for a while, then said, Well, okay, just hurry back, I miss having you around. Damon hung up the phone, but as he did, Fifi woke up and immediately cuddled up to him. Who is on the phone? Even though she couldn't hear the conversation clearly, she could tell it was a woman's voice. It was just Scarlet. Damon replied. Fifi frowned. It was just as she had expected. She pouted. Why did she call you? Damon let out a sigh and explained. She just wanted to know when I'll be going back to work. Fifi turned her head away, clearly not pleased. What do you mean? I promised her that I wouldn't resign for the company. I have to return soon. Damon traced Fifi's jawline. Please don't read too much into it. You know I don't have feelings for her. Fifi nodded. Though she wasn't thrilled that Damon was spending time with Scarlet, she knew he wasn't in a position to turn down job opportunities. Just as the dust settled from the previous wave of trouble, another came crashing in. Fifi had just gotten out of bed to prepare breakfast for Damon when his phone rang once again. As he picked it up, Damon's heart leaped into his throat. It was Emily calling. Normally, Damon would have been overjoyed to see Emily's name on the screen, but now things were different. He had his own little family to think about, and he couldn't just drop everything for her. He had been avoiding the necessary conversation for a long time. Though he was with Fifi, he would always care about Emily, and he hated to hurt her feelings. Emily's voice came through the line, Hey babe, where have you been? Are you avoiding me? Damon tried to keep his tone light as he replied, I've just been busy lately. What's wrong? Fifi took a deep breath. Can you come pick me up at the airport tomorrow? Uh, let me get back to you later. Damon stammered. He quickly hung up the phone. He thought he was ready to face the music, but it all seemed too complicated. My, you're popular this morning. Who called you? Fifi walked upstairs and into the room with breakfast on a tray. Oh, just a friend asking me to hang out tomorrow afternoon. Damon replied, trying to sound casual. Fifi didn't think twice about it, knowing that Damon had just returned and was catching up with old friends. Okay, eat your breakfast and then we'll go take family photos. The photo shoot was a whirlwind of poses, scenes, and outfits. Enough to make even Junior exhausted. But seeing the joy in Fifi's face made it all worth it for Damon. It was a day filled with memories that they would cherish forever. That afternoon, Damon made an excuse for Fifi and then went to the airport to pick up Emily. She was dressed in a pristine white dress, looking like a vision from a dream. With a small suitcase in tow, she hurried towards Damon with excitement written all over her face. The sound of her suitcase wheels clacked across the tile as she ran. Damon couldn't help but feel a pang of sadness as he saw how happy Emily was. He couldn't shake off thoughts of Fifi, who was waiting for him back home. His heart was a tangled mess. Damon! Emily's voice carried. Her eyes burned with fiery passion, fixated solely on Damon. It was as if he was the only one in the world that mattered to her. Other men looked on enviously. As she reached him, Emily threw her arms around Damon. The scent of her perfume filled his senses, intoxicating him with every breath. It was as if she was trying to seduce him, to lure him into her spell and make him hers forever. Emily rested her head on Damon's chest, feeling the warmth of his embrace. She closed her eyes, savoring the moment. After a while, she lifted her head and asked the question that had been on her mind. Do you miss me? Damon nodded, his heart aching. He didn't lie, but he knew he had to explain the situation to her sooner or later. Yeah, I missed you. He replied, trying to find the right words to express his feelings. Emily's eyes lit up with joy as she heard Damon's response. She had always been shy about expressing her feelings for him, but she had no more reservations after that unforgettable night when she gave herself to him completely. She was ready to fall into the depths of love without hesitation. Emily used to think that love was just a fantasy, something exaggerated in movies and books. She'd always been a rational woman, but being with Damon had shown her that love was real, and it was everything she'd ever dreamed of. It had been almost a month since Emily first laid eyes on Damon. The mere thought of being separated from him again made her heart break. She had already pulled some strings and transferred her work to Meyerson, but she kept the secret from Damon. It was her surprise for him, and she was certain he'd be over the moon when he found out. 
Damon is clueless about Emily's plans. It was clear that she was head over heels for him, and that scared him to the core. He couldn't bring himself to tell her the truth, that he was married. Damon held on to hope that Emily's words from before were true. She once said that Damon was just a placeholder until she found her true love. But deep down, he knew that wasn't the case. Emily had said those words to protect herself from getting hurt. She didn't want to lose her dignity in a love that was destined to be one-sided. Emily was oblivious to his inner turmoil. What's wrong with you? Are you unhappy to see me here? Didn't he know how much she missed him? She had gone out of her way to be by his side, but he didn't seem to appreciate it. Damon tried to brush it off. No, it's just work troubles. He was lying, but his face didn't give him away. Emily's heart swelled with love for him. It's okay. I'll support you. We'll get through this together. Damon brought Emily back to the old apartment he'd been renting, so as not to arouse his family's suspicion. As she stepped inside, she was taken aback by how clean and tidy everything was. Wow, Damon, this place is spotless. You deserve some serious praise for this, she exclaimed. As Emily explored the house, Damon watched her with a curious expression. What are you doing? He asked. With a sly grin, Emily replied, Just making sure you haven't brought any other girls here, especially not Scarlet. I could smell a woman's perfume from a mile away, you know. You're not allowed to hook up with other women. Damon breathed a sigh of relief as Emily confirmed that there was no other women sent in the house. As Damon stood there, lost in thought, Emily suddenly pounced toward him with a fiery passion that took him by surprise. He wanted to resist, but her enthusiasm was too much to handle. Damon couldn't help but be drawn in by her intense energy. Despite his reservations, Damon couldn't deny the attraction that was building inside of him. Emily's hot body was like a furnace, and he felt himself getting lost in the heat of the moment. He knew he should resist, but he couldn't help himself. Soon, they were both consumed by the flames of desire. When they were finished, Damon scrambled for his clothes. He couldn't believe he'd slipped up like this again. Attractive women were always his fatal flaw. Hey, what time is it? Emily asked, her stomach growling. I'm starving. You owe me a big meal, Damon. Damon agreed. Name your craving and I'll make it happen. But Emily wasn't convinced. Ha! Huh, you act like you're loaded or something. Damon grinned. I am. I'm rich again. That kind of rich that makes you want to buy everything in the sight. Emily's eyes widened with excitement. Oh, I want a feast. A scrumptious, mouth-watering feast. Luckily, Emily knew just the spot, an internet-famous restaurant that would put Damon's credit card to the test. After a delicious dinner, Emily turned to Damon with a twinkle in her eye and asked her to join him on an evening stroll. Damon, motivated by guilt, couldn't say no. As they strolled through the bustling streets, they found themselves wandering toward the riverside. The view was breathtaking, the water glistened under the moonlight, and the towering buildings on either side of the river were a sight to behold. Suddenly, Emily pointed ahead, and Damon's eyes followed her finger to a magnificent Ferris wheel. The lights were so bright that they illuminated the entire sky, and a spectacular fireworks show was taking place above it. The last few fireworks spelled out the message, I love you. Wow, how romantic, Emily breathed. Damon noticed the shy and expectant look on Emily's face. He knew exactly what she wanted, but he also knew that he couldn't give it to her. In the past, Damon would have done anything to please Emily. But now things were different. Damon had made mistakes, and he didn't want to hurt Emily anymore. Emily waited for Damon to say something, but all she got was silence. She was disappointed, but she didn't let it show. Instead, she took Damon's hand and led him toward the Ferris wheel. Come on, let's ride the Ferris wheel together, she said with a smile. Damon nodded and followed Emily to the front of the line. She talked to the staff privately for a moment, and soon they were sitting side by side by the Ferris wheel. Damon had lost count of how many times he had ridden the Ferris wheel. Each time was different depending on the woman he was with, but this time, he was in a different mood altogether. Legends of love surrounded the Ferris wheel, but Damon was skeptical. However, the woman he was with believed in them wholeheartedly. As the Ferris wheel released a dazzling display of fireworks, Damon was stunned to see them form into words. This time, the words included his name. Damon, I love you. Damon, did you see those words? Emily snuggled in Damon's arms and asked sweetly. It turned out that Emily had taken matters into her own hands and asked the staff to create a romantic moment for them. Damon nodded almost imperceptibly. He was getting in too deep. The Ferris wheel slowly reached its peak, offering a gorgeous view of the city below. Emily's long fluttering eyelashes added to her beauty as she leaned in for a kiss. 
Damon's heart struggled, but he knew he couldn't reciprocate. Instead, he hugged her tightly and turned his head away, trying to hide his true feelings. The moment was magical, but like all good things, it had to come to an end. As the Ferris wheel descended, the fireworks show outside faded away, leaving only the neon lights on the river to illuminate the night. That was great. I wish it could have lasted forever. Emily sighed. Damon's mind was elsewhere. He looked at her, but her eyes were distant, lost in thought. Damon knew that he had to make things clear, no matter what. He took a deep breath and said, Emily, I have something to tell you. It's important. But before he could even finish his sentence, Emily interrupted him. Damon, I have something to tell you too. I think you'll be pleased. Damon was shocked. He had prepared himself for this moment, but he never expected Emily to have something to say as well. They looked at each other, unsure of who should speak first. Damon finally gave in. He looked at Emily and said, Emily, I, I, I. His words trailed off and Emily's smile stiffened. She could see that Damon was struggling to find the right words. Just say it, she urged. Whatever it is, I can handle it. Damon took a deep breath and finally blurted out the words that had been weighing on his mind. We have to break up, he said. Emily clapped a hand over her mouth. Her heart sank to the bottom of the ocean. Emily, we need to break up. Emily had prepared herself for every possible outcome, but when Damon uttered those words, her body shook violently. She had considered the possibility before, but it was the worst and most realistic one she could imagine. What she feared most had happened. Emily was silent for a long time trying to process the despair that Damon had just inflicted upon her. Damon could see the tears in her eyes, but Emily stubbornly refused to let them fall. She turned away from him, not wanting to show her weakness. Finally, she spoke, her voice carrying a pleading tone. Please, can you tell me why? Why did you break up with me? Did I do something to make you hate me? Or is it because of Scarlet? If it's because of me, tell me where I went wrong. I'll do anything to make it right. And if it's because of Scarlet, how could she be better than me? Please, just tell me, I need to know. Emily's words were filled with desperation, and Damon could feel her pain. He knew he had to give her an answer no matter how difficult it was. Emily had always been confident, proud even, but for Damon, she humbled herself. She was willing to do whatever it took to salvage their relationship. However, fate had other plans in store for them. It wasn't something that Emily or even Damon could control. Damon shook his head. It's not because of her. Then who is it? Emily asked, her heart racing. Fifi, Damon exclaimed, revealing that he had a child with Fifi and they lived together as a family. Emily listened in silence, her face turning pale. She had thought there was still a chance, but with the revelation of Damon's child with Fifi, she knew it was over. If it had been Scarlet, maybe she could have taken the risk, but Fifi was Damon's first love and the mother of his child. The outcome of this competition had been decided 10 years ago, buried in the foreshadowing of their past. As Emily listened to Damon's words, tears streamed down her face. She felt like the biggest fool in the world. She had traveled all the way to Meyerson to see him, but now she realized that he didn't feel the same way about her. She had even transferred to a new job just to be closer to him, but it was all for nothing. Despite Damon's cold tone on the phone earlier, Emily had convinced herself that he was just busy with work. She was blinded by love and couldn't see the truth. But now seeing the strange expression on his face, she knew that she had been fooling herself all along. Damon wanted to say something to comfort her, but he didn't know where to start. Emily was heartbroken, and no words could ease her pain. She wiped away her tears and tried to salvage her dignity. Fine, if that's how you feel, she said, her voice shaking. I won't bother you anymore. And don't worry, you're not important to me. There's someone else I like anyway. It was a lie, of course. Emily was devastated and couldn't imagine being with anyone else, but she couldn't bear the thought of being rejected by Damon. She had lost the battle for his heart, and now she had to accept it. Hey, Em, remember that thing you wanted to tell me earlier? Damon asked, hoping to distract her from their painful conversation. But Emily shook her head, her eyes filled with sadness. It doesn't matter now. She replied, her voice barely above a whisper. Ever since Damon had told her they couldn't be together, everything else seemed trivial. Damon couldn't help but worry about her. She looked like a ghost, a shell of her former self. He knew he had to follow her to make sure she was safe. But before he could take a step, Emily turned around and glared at him. 
Don't you dare follow me, you big jerk, she spat. If you do, I'll jump into the river and end it all. He watched helplessly as she walked away, her figure growing smaller and smaller until she disappeared. The rain started out of nowhere, just a few drops at first, but before long it was coming down in sheets. Soon Damon was soaked to the bone, but he didn't even notice. His mind was consumed with thoughts of Emily. What if something had happened to her? He had to find her no matter what. Damon pushed through the crowd, searching for any sign of Emily. His panic grew with every passing moment. He didn't care about the strange looks he was getting from the people around him. All he could think about was finding her. Emily, Emily, where are you? Damon shouted at the top of his lungs. He didn't care who heard him. He had to make sure Emily knew he was looking for her. But there was no response. Damon's heart sank as he realized his phone was dead. He had no way of contacting Emily, no way of knowing if she was okay. As Damon frantically searched for Emily, his heart was pounding in his chest. But then, amidst the vibrant flowers near the riverbank, he spotted a beautiful figure lying on the ground. Without hesitation, he rushed over to investigate. Damon's face drained of color as he scooped Emily up and raced to the nearest hospital. After a thorough examination, the doctor revealed that Emily had simply fainted due to a lack of physical strength and the chilly weather. Her condition wasn't serious. Although Damon was relieved to hear the news, he couldn't help but feel guilty. Emily was always so full of life and energy, rarely ever got sick. He never expected her to faint from a little rain. He knew she was suffering from a broken heart. He had let her down. Damon whisked Emily back to the rented house. He called Fifi to let her know he had gone on a work trip for a few days. In reality, he knew he couldn't leave Emily's side. As he hung up the phone, Damon turned his attention to Emily. She was still passed out, her body weak and vulnerable. Damon wasn't exactly a master chef, but he knew he had to do something to nourish her. He grabbed a cookbook and got to work, carefully preparing a soup that he hoped would help her recover. He spoon-fed her as she drifted in and out of consciousness. But just as he was starting to feel a glimmer of hope, Emily's condition took a turn for the worse. In the middle of the night, she woke up boiling with a fever and spouting nonsense. Damon was beside himself. He couldn't even make out what Emily was saying. Thinking quickly, Damon grabbed some fever medicine and fed it to Emily. He prayed it would help her, but he couldn't shake the heavy storm cloud of dread that had settled in his chest. As the night wore on, Emily's fever finally began to subside. Damon's racing heart slowed down a bit, and he drifted off into a restless sleep. Little did he know that come morning, Emily's fever would return with a vengeance. This pattern continued leaving Damon helpless and worried about the potential consequences of this never-ending cycle. Determined to get to the bottom of things, Damon took Emily to the biggest hospital in Meyerson. After what felt like an eternity of waiting, they finally found themselves face-to-face -face with an expert. They had hoped for a simple diagnosis, but the doctor's furrowed brow suggested otherwise. Damon's heart clenched as he leaned in to ask the doctor, How is she? What's wrong with her? The doctor let out a heavy sigh before revealing the shocking truth. My dear boy, this is no ordinary illness. Your friend has contracted Rosetti's Phantasmagoria Syndrome, a rare and dangerous disease that can be fatal when combined with colds and fevers. And if she's surrounded by negative energy or stress, it could be even worse. The most likely outcome could be death. Damon's nerves are on edge. Death? The doctor's words were grim. Well, the patient has created a dream world for herself that she doesn't want to leave. She's so immersed in this fantasy that her body is deteriorating, and even if she doesn't die, she'll turn into a vegetable. It's a heartbreaking situation that never ends well. Damon felt as if he was struck by lightning. He never thought that Emily's condition could be so dire. The doctor cleared his throat. Sir, did this lady suffer a heavy emotional blow before she fell ill? Did her condition worsen to such an extent? Damon explained the situation between him and Emily, and the doctor's face fell. No wonder. Sir, forgive me for being blunt. Your ex-girlfriend's illness is quite dangerous. It has already reached the most critical moment. Damon's heart sank. Then, what do we need to do? He asked. The doctor took off his glasses and massaged his temples. We can't do anything for the time being. She's now in a semi-vegetative state. You must reignite her desire to live, and then help her with rehabilitation training every day. Don't let her bodily functions deteriorate. Otherwise... The doctor trailed off. Damon felt the weight of the situation on his shoulders. It was up to him to save Emily. 
and he was determined to do whatever it took to bring her back to life. As for what the doctor said after that, Damon couldn't remember anymore. He carried Emily back to his rented house. Determined to take care of Emily, Damon called Fifi again. He knew he had to stay by Emily's side for as long as it took, even if it meant putting his real life on hold. He told her his business trip had to be extended and he couldn't get out of it. Fifi understood, but Damon could hear the sadness in her voice as they said their goodbyes. Next, he called Scarlett, his boss. He had to be honest with her and explain that he wouldn't be able to come back to work for a while. Scarlett was disappointed, but Damon knew he had to prioritize Emily's health. Next, Damon began to treat Emily. She was like a corpse, devoid of any feeling from head to toe. But Damon was determined to help her. Whenever he had to spare a moment, he would transfer his essence into her body, coaxing her blood to flow and removing any stasis. Days turned into a week, and Damon's efforts paid off. Emily's face was regaining color, and if someone didn't know better, they would think she was just taking a nap. But Damon knew the truth. Emily was still asleep, and it seemed like she didn't want to wake up. Perhaps sleeping was her way of escaping the harshness of the world. But Damon couldn't give up on her. He continued to talk to her, hoping that one day she would open her eyes and see the world again. He couldn't help but feel responsible for exacerbating her condition. He sat by her side, talking to her in a soft and gentle voice, hoping that his words would reach her. Come on, Emily, wake up. I'll do anything if you just open your eyes. He pleaded. As he spoke, Damon reminisced about the first time he met Emily. She had an explosive personality and a wild streak that made him think she was a delinquent rebel. But when they met again, he was blown away by her beauty and grace. Em, remember when we met? We have so many good memories together. You're so smart and capable. I admire your stubbornness and no-nonsense attitude. I always felt like I could be myself around you. Damon held his breath, but Emily didn't stir. He continued. Maybe somewhere deep down, she would be able to hear him. When you agreed to be my girlfriend, I knew he had something special. But as he got to know each other, that love evolved into something deeper. It's a love that can only be described as pure and true. And that's the kind of love I have for you now. It transcends romance. You're my best friend. Damon sighed. Of course, I can only say this while you're asleep. I hope you can forgive me. I never meant to hurt you. All I ever wanted was to keep you in my life forever. If only things were different, if only I didn't have a child, maybe I wouldn't have left you so abruptly. Do you remember that first time when I visited your house? I had feelings for you even then, regardless of my wild ways. You were in your study and you gave me a cup of bitter coffee. The birds were chirping outside and we playfully fought until we accidentally kissed. That was a long time ago. You probably don't remember that anymore. Damon's voice trailed off, filled with sadness, but then a soft voice interrupted his thoughts. Of course I remember. Emily said, her eyes fluttered open, and she gave him a weak smile. She had to finally obtain the answers she had been seeking. As she stretched and yawned, memories of her first intimate encounter with Damon flooded her mind. But Emily knew that their love was impossible, so she had buried her emotions deep within. Just when she thought Damon was gone forever, he miraculously reappeared before her eyes. It was as if the heavens had heard her prayers, but little did she know that this would only lead to another heart-wrenching tragedy. As Emily stirred from her slumber, Damon's body trembled with excitement. You're awake. You scared me half to death, you know. He exclaimed, relief washing over him. As Damon fidgeted nervously by her bedside, Emily's complaints melted away. She couldn't help but notice how he had been tirelessly caring for her these past few days, and the soft words he whispered in her ear only added to her growing admiration of him. Due to her rare syndrome, Emily found herself lost in a terrifying fog that seemed to envelop her every thought. But with Damon by her side, she summoned the courage to fight through the haze and call out his name. And just like that, the fog lifted and she was finally awake. Emily was awake. It was a miracle. She blinked at Damon with her big eyes. What you said when I was unconscious. I could hear you, but it felt like you were a million miles away. Is what you said true about how much you care for me? Damon nodded. Emily began to cry. Damon, I told you not to chase after me after the incident at the Ferris wheel. Why did you chase me? Damon ran a hand through his hair. I was worried you'd be in danger. Yeah, right. Emily scoffed. You should be worried about your wife and children. I'm inconsequential. You abandoned me. What danger are you afraid of? Damon scowled. Hey, what's with the mood swings? A second ago, you were fine. Now you're practically yelling at me. 
You know I would never be able to forgive myself if something bad happened to you, and I could have prevented it. Really? Emily rolled her eyes. Then let me ask you something. If my syndrome flares up again and I turn into a vegetable, are you going to take care of me for the rest of my life? Damon nodded seriously. I'll take care of you until you wake up. I'm sure you won't be asleep forever. Emily scoffed. What about your wife and child? I don't think Fifi would appreciate you focusing on me. I don't know, but I'll be frank with Fifi. After all, this was Damon's fault, and Damon would be responsible for it to the end. Emily buried her face in the pillow. Her emotions were overwhelming. Damon patted her back. Em, please be careful. The doctor told me that stress can affect your condition. Hey, are you hungry? I'm trying to learn how to cook. Emily sniffled. I think I could stomach some soup. Easy. Damon grinned. Okay, you stay here. I need to run to the grocery store for some ingredients. No! Emily struggled out of bed. I want to go with you. Damon hesitated, but he didn't want her mood to sour, so he reluctantly took her with him. She leaned on him to steady herself, still weak from being in bed for so long. When they returned home, Emily collapsed on the sofa while Damon cooked. Damon, did you ever cook for Fifi? Damon shook his head. No, I wasn't much of a chef in the past. Emily's eyes lit up. That meant she was special. Damon watched as she slurped a bite of soup and closed her eyes. Well, is it any good? Emily swallowed. It's delicious. Damon smiled and began eating his soup. While they ate, a tear trickled down Emily's face. Why are you crying? It seems that you're still in contact with Scarlet. Aren't you afraid that Fifi would be jealous if she knew? Damon shook his head. Fifi knows Scarlet. I don't think she feels threatened. Emily was surprised to hear this. She had thought Damon was lying to her, but now she realized there were many twists and turns in his story. So you'll still work for Scarlet? Emily asked. Damon nodded, but Emily was not satisfied. What if Fifi can't be trusted and Scarlet won't let you go? Damon had faced this question before, but he had no answer. Men are so fickle. Emily exclaimed, frustrated. She set down her soup. Why did I even wake up? Damon drank more of his soup and wiped his mouth. Hey, before you fell asleep, you said you had something to tell me. Can you share it with me now? Emily's expression darkened. It doesn't matter anymore. Damon shrugged. Okay, if you change your mind, let me know. So, now that you're more or less recovered, are you going back to work? Emily didn't want to tell Damon that she had already completed the paperwork to transfer her job to Meyerson. She tore off a piece of bread and chewed it, glaring at him. They finished their meal in silence. In the afternoon, Emily made a bold decision and left Damon without telling him. Before she left, she left him a text message that read, Damon, I'm leaving. We should forget about each other. I know you care about me. There is an invisible thread connecting us. I originally wanted to cut this thread, but I couldn't bear it. Maybe one day that thread will bring us back together. She attached a photo of the two of them, along with Frank and Alex. It was the only photo they had taken together, and Emily had kept it all these years, thinking that Damon had passed away. Damon's heart skipped a beat as he read Emily's message. It was like deja vu, similar to the message Fifi sent him when she transferred schools and the letter Avery wrote to him. He couldn't believe it was happening again. Without wasting a second, he grabbed his phone and tried to call Emily, but her number was unreachable. He tried to send her a message, but it wouldn't go through. Emily had blocked him from all communication channels. Damon couldn't help but admire Emily's strength. She was a true heroine, gentle yet decisive. When she loved, she loved with all of her heart, but when she left, she did it with grace. He knew that unless Emily reached out to him, he wouldn't be able to contact her again. He wondered if he would ever see her again. Emily's text message promised a thread that would lead them back to each other if they were meant to meet again. It was a comforting thought, and Damon couldn't shake off the feeling that it was just a consolation. After collecting his thoughts, Damon returned home. Fifi had been sick with worry, and she was overjoyed that he had come home from his so-called business trip. He embraced his wife and son, unaware of the trouble brewing at work. The sun was shining bright as Damon made his way to work at the Leahy Company. He couldn't help but wonder why Scarlett hadn't called him in the past few days. Was she worried that he didn't have time for her? As he arrived at the company, Damon was shocked by the chaos that greeted him. The office was in a complete mess, and staff were frantically trying to settle accounts. Damon's frown deepened as he grabbed one of the workers and demanded to know what was going on. The worker looked at Damon skeptically and asked, Who are you? I'm an employee here. Damon replied. The worker scoffed. Employee? Don't you know that the Leahy company has been sealed due to some serious issues? 
Damon's heart sank as he realized the reason behind Scarlet's silence. He never expected that there was a problem with the company. Damon's eyes caught sight of a young man in a sharp suit. It was Dwight, a staff member from the same department as him. Without hesitation, Damon quickly stopped Dwight in his tracks and asked, Hey, Dwight, can you tell me what happened to the Leahy company? Naturally, Dwight recognized Damon. He remembered how Damon had come into the department and put Mr. Atkinson in his place. Damon had not only stood up for himself, but also for the ordinary employees who had been bullied by Mr. Atkinson time and time again. Before Damon's arrival, the employees had been subjugated to all sorts of abuse from Mr. Atkinson. They were scolded, punished, and insulted. But Damon's presence had changed everything. He had managed to suppress Mr. Atkinson's arrogance and give the employees a sense of dignity. Dwight lowered his voice. The company's warehouse burned down, and they lost millions. The company is up to its eyeballs of debt. CEO Leahy had to go bankrupt to settle the outstanding accounts. Damon was in shock as he tried to process the news. Why did this happen? He asked Dwight, hoping for some answers. Dwight's response only added to the mystery. I'm not sure about the details, but it seems like Carter Bostrich was behind it. That's the current rumor swung around the department. Dwight's sudden fear and hasty retreat only added to Damon's growing unease. He knew he had to act fast. He pulled out his phone and tried to call Scarlet, but her phone was off. Panic set in as he realized that something was seriously wrong. Just then, a big guy with big ears barged in, his arrogance palpable. What are you all doing? Don't you have work to do? He sneered. Have you finished counting your assets? In the future, this company will belong to Carter. He'll want to know he has some trustworthy employees left. Damon's face twisted with fury as he glared at the man. His back was turned to Damon, but he recognized that jerk anywhere. It was none other than the infamous Mr. Atkinson, known for his big ego and shady dealings. Just as Damon was about to confront him, Mr. Atkinson's phone rang. With a sly grin, Mr. Atkinson answered the call and spoke in a hushed tone. Damon strained to hear the conversation. His curiosity was piqued. Yes, of course, Carter. She won't be able to escape. She's on her way to the Buena Vista Hotel now. I put her in the taxi myself. It seemed that Mr. Atkinson was up to no good, plotting something sinister against a woman who was in trouble. Before Damon could demand answers, Mr. Atkinson abruptly hung up and turned to face him. Damon! His jaw dropped. Why? Why are you here? You... Where did you come from? Mr. Atkinson was shaking in his boots as he faced the terrifying Damon. Damon narrowed his eyes. What were you talking about on the phone regarding a woman in a hotel? Mr. Atkinson was in complete denial, insisting he hadn't said anything wrong. But Damon wasn't in the mood for games. He grabbed Mr. Atkinson by the collar and gave him a swift punch. Poor Mr. Atkinson didn't stand a chance against Damon's strength and power. He was left with a bloody nose and tears streaming down his face, begging for mercy. Finally, Mr. Atkinson gave in and spilled the beans. It turned out that there had been a massive shakeup at the Leahy Company. Mr. Atkinson wiped his tears and reiterated what Dwight had told Damon about the fire and bankruptcy. The stock market can be a treacherous place, but for the Leahy Company, things were looking particularly bleak. No one believed they could make a comeback, and the prospect of selling a large number of shares seemed impossible. That's when Scarlett and her father Don found themselves backed into a corner. They were desperate for a solution, any solution to save their company from ruin. And that's when Carter appeared on the scene. He made Scarlett an offer she couldn't refuse. If she became his lover, he would invest in the Leahy Company and help weather the storm. But the price was steep and if Scarlet decided to sell him to the company along with her body, she would have to accept the consequences of Carter's ruthless business tactics as well as the trampling upon her dignity. Despite the risk, Scarlet knew she had to take action. And so, at 10 o'clock in the morning, she got in a taxi and headed to a presidential suite at the Buena Vista Hotel to meet Carter. Mr. Atkinson had helped Carter arrange the entire affair. Damon's eyes blazed with a fierce intensity as he kicked Mr. Atkinson aside and bolted toward the Buena Vista Hotel. The clock had already struck 9.30, and any further delay could spell unimaginable consequences. As much as it pained her to admit it, Scarlet knew she had to do this. Her father, Don, had scoured every nook and cranny for money to no avail. Scarlet knew deep down that Carter was the mastermind behind this chaos. But what choice did she have? His energy was so powerful that disobeying him would only lead to a greater blow. As she stood outside the Buena Vista Hotel, Scarlet couldn't bring herself to enter. The thought of sleeping with that jerk made her stomach churn. He was the one who set fire to the warehouse and destroyed the Leahy company, and Scarlet knew it, 
but she was powerless to fight back. If only Damon were still in charge of Astromar, the crisis of the Leahy Company could be solved in a heartbeat. But he was just an ordinary person now, and Scarlet felt helpless. She loved Damon deeply, but entering Carter's room would make her feel dirty and unworthy of him. Tears streamed down her face as she apologized to Damon in her mind. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, she whispered. Perhaps I won't have the face to see you again. Scarlet's tears flowed freely as she made her way into the luxurious Buena Vista Hotel. It was a struggle to keep her composure, but she managed to pull out a tissue and wipe away the evidence of her heartbreak. As Carter sipped on a glass of red wine and puffed a Cuban cigar, his mind raced with anticipation. He had called in a favor from Mr. Atkinson, who promised Scarlet would come, and so he had prepared everything he needed to make his day unforgettable. He bought toys, handcuffs, and even aphrodisiac drugs. Carter had promised Scarlet the world and he intended to deliver. He had fantasized about countless ways to play. If she complied, he would transfer $1 million to her father's account. He didn't care about her dignity or personhood. He'd wanted this for a long time and she was finally within his grasp. As he waited for Scarlet to arrive, Carter grew increasingly anxious. He had been waiting for what felt like an eternity, and he couldn't take it anymore. He called Mr. Atkinson, but there was no answer. Frustrated and angry, Carter threw his phone to the ground. Damn that Mr. Atkinson, he yelled. How dare he not answer my call? He's supposed to be coordinating this. And where the hell is Scarlet? He stomped to the door and looked out the peephole. A beautiful woman stood in the hallway. It was Scarlet, but she seemed hesitant to come in. A lecherous smile crept across Carter's face. Carter was the kind of man who had it all. Looks, charm, and a long line of women vying for his attention. But there was one woman who just couldn't seem to appreciate him. Damn her, he thought. She must still be hung up on that Damon guy. The mere thought of it made Carter's face contort with anger. But instead of wallowing in his self-pity, Carter's competitive spirit was ignited. He was determined to show Scarlet and Damon who was the boss. He would ruthlessly torture Scarlet and trample Damon under his feet, all in the name of relieving his hatred. The door isn't locked. Come in. He hissed through the door. The door swung open. Scarlet stood there trembling. You're here, he exclaimed, eyeing her up and down like a predator. But then his face twisted into a scowl. Damn it, you're here to make love to me, not have a meeting. Why are you dressed like that? Scarlet shot a glare at Carter, but held her tongue. Carter's grin grew even more sinister. What's with that look, Miss High and Mighty? You think you're better than me? Scarlet's heart raced. Carter, did you burn down our warehouse? Carter's response was chilling. You bet I did. Not only that, I had someone collect the dead and rob the bank too. How does it feel to be on the losing end? Scarlet's eyes filled with hatred. You're despicable. Why would you do this to us? My father trusted you. We were classmates, and our family has never done anything to hurt you. Carter's eyes burned with jealousy. You really don't get it, do you? I did everything for you, but you chose that Damon guy over me. What's wrong with me? Why wasn't I good enough for you? Scarlet stuck out her chin defiantly. He has class, unlike you. That's something money can't buy. Strip down and let me have my way with you. Carter roared. Damn it. I'm spending money here. Do I need to ask you for permission to have some fun? Are you going to take off your clothes or not? Scarlet recoiled when she saw the toys on the bed. A dog growled in the corner. She shook her head vehemently. No, I don't want this. I want to leave. Carter blocked the door. We had an agreement, Scarlet. You can't go back on your word. Beads of sweat ran down Scarlet's forehead. She knew she was trapped. Carter's family owned the hotel. There was no way out. Carter's eyes gleamed with a sickening desire. You're going to take your stupid pantsuit off whether you like it or not. She knew she had to act fast. Summoning all of her strength, she broke the lock and bolted out the door. Quick, get her now! Carter's urgent shout echoed through the hallway, prompting two figures to dart out from the shadows. They caught Scarlet before she reached the elevator. You ungrateful witch! Carter spat. I'll make sure you regret this. Oh, we're going to have some fun today. Meanwhile, Damon had just arrived downstairs and was on a mission to find Carter. He approached the front desk and demanded to know where he was. I have a crucial matter to discuss with Mr. Carter Bostrick. It's worth millions of dollars, so don't even try to stop me. Before the receptionist could respond, a mysterious man in black appeared. He eyed Damon suspiciously and asked, Who are you? 
Damon flashed a charming smile and replied, I'm here to talk to Mr. Bostrix about a contract. It's important. Mr. Bostrix is working on a project. No one is allowed to enter. He declared firmly. Damon spoke in a cold, calculated tone. No matter how important the matter is, is it worth losing a few million? The man in black frowned and scrutinized Damon from head to toe. Suddenly, his expression changed and he exclaimed, No! I've seen your picture! You're Mr. Bostrick's enemy! Before the man could defend himself, Damon's fist made contact with the skull. The man crumpled to the ground unconscious. The receptionist let out a blood-curling scream as Damon lunged toward her. Spill it, lady! Where's Carter's room? He demanded. The, the supreme suite on the top floor! She stammered, her voice barely audible. Without a moment's hesitation, Damon smashed his fist into the marble front desk, shattering it into a million pieces. Take me there! He barked, grabbing the receptionist by the arm and dragging her toward the elevator. On the top floor, the two bodyguards waited at the door, outside the Supreme Suite. When Carter finished enjoying himself, it would be their turn. They were practically drooling. I heard she's the daughter of the boss of the Leahy Company. She's absolutely stunning! One of them exclaimed. I can't wait to get a whiff of her later. I never played with someone so high class. The other chimed in. Suddenly, Damon and the front desk receptionist stormed into the hallway, interrupting their daydreams. The two bodyguards didn't know Damon, but they did recognize the receptionist. What are you doing here? Do you know the consequences of disturbing Mr. Bostrich? The receptionist was too scared to speak, pointing her finger behind her in fear. Th this gentleman said he had something to do with Mr. Bostrich. The skinny man's eyelid twitched as he asked, What is it? Damon smiled and said, I want to talk to Carter about some business. The skinny man was angry. Mr. Bostrich is busy right now. Don't you know his temper? The man with the mustache added, No matter how big the matter is, we have to wait until Mr. Bostrich is done. Damon heard the sound of smashing and screaming coming from the suite. Scarlet was in danger. He moved to break down the door, but the two bodyguards blocked him. Damon didn't waste a second. With lightning-fast reflexes, he delivered a swift slap to each of them, knocking them out cold. He then turned his attention to the door of the suite. It was a formidable sight, with bronze plating and a sturdy frame. But Damon was determined to get Scarlet. With a mighty kick, he set the door flying off its hinges. The room inside was a chaotic mess, with Scarlet struggling against a menacing figure. Damon's blood boiled as he took in the scene. It's you? Carter snarled clearly surprised by Damon's sudden appearance. Damon didn't waste any time. What have you done to her? He demanded, his voice low and dangerous. Just having a little fun, Carter said, his eyes glinting with malice. Scarlet shouted frantically from the bathroom. Damon, is that you? Help! Carter grabbed her from the open bathroom and pulled out a knife. He threw her onto the bed. Damon's heart raced. Before she could move toward him, Carter beckoned the growling dog from the corner. And then to his horror, Carter cut the rope around the dog's neck, sending it hurtling toward Damon with a fierce howl. Damon, watch out! Scarlet screamed. Damon grabbed the dog's head and hurled it against the wall with a sickening thud. The poor animal let out a howl before falling to the ground. Lifeless, Scarlet couldn't believe what she had just witnessed. Damon turned to Carter, his eyes blazing with fury. You ungrateful bastard! He spat, his voice dripping with venom. I've let you off the hook time and time again! but you just keep getting worse. Scarlet was terrified. She had never seen Damon so angry before, but as she looked at Carter trembling in fear, she felt a twinge of satisfaction. He deserved whatever was coming to him. Damon, please. Scarlet pleaded. Don't do anything you'll regret. Damon yanked Carter by the arm and pulled him to his feet. You're lucky I don't kill you right now, he hissed, but I'm gonna make sure you pay for what you've done. Scarlet, run. Damon pointed to the door. Scarlet scrambled off the bed and hurried out the door, rushing to safety. As she walked out of the room, she heard Carter's screams echoing behind her. She shuddered, wondering what kind of punishment Damon had in store for him. When Damon emerged from the room, his hand covered in blood, Scarlet asked, How is Carter? Scarlet was worried, not for Carter, but for the legal repercussions that Damon might face if he were to harm him. But Damon reassured her with a confident shake of his head and a promise to take full responsibility for his actions. Scarlet's heart rate slowed down as she heard Damon's words. She had no idea what kind of lesson Damon had in store for Carter, but she trusted him. Little did she know that Damon's little lesson would leave Carter with a permanent reminder of his misdeeds. 
As they exited the hotel, Damon held Scarlet's hand tightly. She looked up at him with gratitude in her eyes and asked why he was there. To her, Damon's sudden appearance was like a god descending from the heavens to save her. Damon explained that he had just returned from the office and happened to run into Mr. Atkinson, who told him about Scarlet's situation. It was as if fate had intervened to bring Damon to her side and protect her from Carter's cruelty. Why didn't you tell me such a big thing happened to the company? Damon questioned. He was extremely angry. He couldn't believe Scarlet had kept such a huge secret from him. Did she think she was doing him a favor by hiding the truth? It was pure foolishness. Scarlet's heart swelled with warmth as she saw Damon's concern for her, but she knew better than to add to his troubles. I didn't want to burden you with this, she replied, shaking her head. After all, what good would it do to tell him now that he was no longer the big boss of Astromar, with unlimited resources? The Leahy Company was now in deep trouble, and the situation was only getting worse. It seemed like there was no way out, and the future looked bleak. The stakes were high, and failure was not an option. Scarlet was feeling helpless and hopeless, but Damon had a plan. He knew he could help, and he was determined to do so. Damon's mind was already one step ahead of Scarlet's. He knew exactly what was going through her head, and couldn't help but grin from ear to ear. Silly girl. He chuckled. I have the power to help you out of this mess. Even though I'm no longer the boss of Astromar, I'm now stronger and richer than ever before. Tell me, how much does the Leahy Company owe? I'll give it to you right now. Scarlet was touched by Damon's offer, but she didn't want to stress him out. Thank you, Damon, she said, wiping away her tears. But you don't have to comfort me. I'm just happy that you're here with me. She was still skeptical of Damon's claims. How could he possibly be even stronger now? She figured he was just trying to make her feel better. Damon could sense Scarlet's doubt, and it made him a little unhappy. He didn't want her to do anything rash, so he took out his phone and dialed Pitbull's number. Hello, this is Damon. He said into the phone, I need you to do me a favor. Can you find out how much the Leahy Company owes and send me the details? He hung up the phone and turned to Scarlet with a smile. There, now do you believe me? Thank you, Damon. Though she still didn't believe him, she was grateful he was trying to help. But her smile quickly faded when her phone rang. This time, it was a lone shark on the other end of the line. Scarlet's heart sank as she listened to the threats and demands. Please don't hurt my dad, she pleaded. Give me the address, I'll be right there. Damon offered to come with her to help. They raced through the city streets, their hearts pounding with fear and adrenaline. Scarlet's worst fears were confirmed. Her father is being held captive by a group of dangerous thugs. As Scarlet and Damon approached the address they'd been given, they couldn't help but notice the eerie atmosphere of the old alley. The dim lights cast shadows on the row of ancient houses, and the air was thick with the scent of cigarettes. But what really caught their attention was the group of young people squatting in the corner, their eyes lighting up as Scarlet appeared. With a determined look on her face, Scarlet demanded to know the whereabouts of her father, but instead of a straightforward answer, she was met with a dark smirk from a blonde man. Yo, gorgeous! Did you bring us the money your precious father owes us? His friend chimed in. Hey, sexy, there are other ways you could pay us. You've got a great body. The young men erupted in laughter, but Scarlet's face turned red with anger. Scarlet! Her father Don's voice cut through the hoots and howls of his captors. Scarlet and Damon caught sight of Don, but something was different about him. He wasn't the same high-spirited person they knew. He looked like he had been through the ringer. His body was covered in wounds and his spirit was broken. Despite this, Don tried to put on a brave face when he saw Scarlet. Scarlet, you're here. I'm fine, really. I just, I'm so sorry I let you down. Scarlet couldn't hold back her tears. Dad, what's going on here? She asked. Don let out a heavy sigh. Isn't the company running out of money? He said, his voice filled with regret. I tried to fix things, but it all went off the rails. How much do you owe? Damon questioned in a low tone. The blonde man overheard. Including the cost and interest, you owe our boss a total of 17 million. If you have the money, give it to us and leave now. If you don't have the money, well, let's just say you'll be paying with more than just your wallet. Don and Scarlet's faces drained of color as they watched the tense exchange between Damon and the blonde man. Man, can you be lenient for a bit? I'll pay you back tomorrow. Damon asked, but the blonde man was having none of it. Tomorrow? He barked. Damn, if you don't pay us today, you won't be able to walk out of here alive. 
with a wave of his hand, he signaled his underlings to shut the door tightly. Damon's expression turned cold. I said I'll give you the money tomorrow to give you face. Otherwise, he trailed off, leaving the blonde man to fill in the blanks. Otherwise what? The blonde man taunted. You don't know who you're messing with. I work for THE Red Rhino, and I know Pitbull. Damon was amused. You know Pitbull? Great, so do I. I'll call Pitbull right now. I'd like to see if he dares to accept my money. The room erupted in laughter and jeers. He said that Pitbull wouldn't dare take his money. Someone shouted. How dare he say such big words? Another piped up. Suddenly, footsteps sounded from upstairs. A tall man descended the staircase of the abandoned house. He went by the moniker Red Rhino. Don and Scarlet exchanged worried glances as the tension in the room escalated. It was clear that Damon had just made a grave mistake, and they would only hope he would be able to talk his way out of it. Don tried to defuse the situation. He called on Red Rhino to forgive Damon's ignorance. Be magnanimous, he pleaded. And don't let anger cloud your judgment. Don then turned to Damon and urged him to apologize before things got out of hand. Red Rhino was quick to show his displeasure. Who do you think you are? He bellowed, his voice echoing through the room. Step into the light so I can get a good look at you. Slowly, Damon turned forward. When he saw Damon's face, Red Rhino was struck with fear. He was so petrified that he couldn't even utter a word. Damon noticed his distress, asked him what was wrong. Red Rhino's face went through a series of expressions before he finally managed to force a smile. He then quickly approached Damon and stuttered, Excuse me, are you Mr. Walker? Damon confirmed his suspicions, causing Red Rhino's heart to leap into his throat. Oh my, Mr. Walker, I'm so sorry. I'm Pitbull's friend. The last time I saw you at the police station, I was behind Pitbull admiring your heroism. I had no idea it was you, Mr. Walker. I should hit myself. As he spoke, Red Rhino proceeded to slap himself in front of his underlings. Even Don and Scarlet were taken aback by his sudden change in demeanor. Just moments ago, he was acting like an arrogant thug, but now he was groveling at Damon's feet. It was a complete 180 degree turn. The blonde man stammered, Red Rhino, who the hell is this guy? But before he could finish his sentence, Red Rhino's hand came down hard in his cheek with a resounding slap. What did you just say? You're lucky I don't kill you right here and now. Apologize to Mr. Walker and do it fast. The blonde man hung his head in shame. Even though he didn't know who Damon was, he couldn't risk angering Red Rhino any further. M Mr. Walker, I'm sorry. Damon waved off the apology, more interested in the loan shark situation that Red Rhino's lackey had mentioned earlier. So, Don owes you money, huh? Red Rhino's face twisted in anguish. Yes, Mr. Walker, but I swear I had no idea he was your friend. If I had known, I never would have asked him for such a high interest rate. Then this money. Damon arched an eyebrow. Red Rhino shook his head. We don't want any interest. As for capital, CEO Leahy, you can return it when you have the money. There's no hurry. That's good. Damon nodded. Can we leave now? Yes, of course. Then a thought occurred to Red Rhino. By the way, Mr. Walker, did you drive here by yourself? Do you want me to ask one of my men to drive you and escort you back? Damon declined. No thanks, we'll be going now. As Damon, Scarlet, and Don made their exit, Red Rhino breathed a sigh of relief. The blonde band, who had taken a beating earlier, saddled up to him, wincing. Red Rhino, who is this guy? Why are you so scared of him? Red Rhino pulled out a cigarette from his pocket and lit it up with a flick of his lighter. He took a long drag and exhaled a cloud of smoke. How do you feel about Pitbull? He asked. The blonde man's eyes widened. Respect and worship, man! Working for Pitbull is the ultimate goal I've been striving for my entire life! Red Rhino nodded knowingly. Well, let me tell you something, kid. Even Edgar and Inspector McDuff bow down to him. So what? gives you the right to be arrogant in front of people in his corner. I hit you to save you from making a mistake. The blonde man's face fell as he realized the truth in Red Rhino's words. It can't be. Damon Walker knows Pitbull? Red Rhino chuckled. Believe me, I wouldn't have believed it either if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. The blonde man and his crew fell silent, realizing the gravity of Damon's connections. 
They had suspected he had a mysterious background, but this was beyond their wildest dreams. No wonder Damon had mentioned Pitbull so casually earlier. He had the power to back it up. They had dodged a bullet. As they emerged from the dark alley, Damon, Scarlet, and Dawn couldn't have believed what had just happened. Dawn was still shaking in his boots at the thought of being killed for being unable to pay back the money. He didn't have much money to begin with, so he was prepared for the worst. But to his surprise, Damon swooped in and saved the day, freeing him from his captors with ease. Thank you, young man. Don exclaimed, feeling grateful and a little guilty for misjudging Damon in the past. He had thought Damon was trying to seduce his daughter, but now he saw him in a whole new light. Scarlet asked, Dad, are you alright? I'm fine. Don replied, shaking his head. Although he had taken a beating from Red Rhino, the wounds were only superficial. He just needed some rest, and he'd be back to his old self in no time. Don breathed a sigh of relief as he realized he wouldn't have to deal with any loan sharks for the time being. Red Rhino had assured him that he could return the money whenever he wanted, but the Leahy company was still in a precarious situation. Would they be able to climb out of the mud pit they found themselves in? Just as Don was lost in thought, his phone rang. It was his assistant, Huey, who sounded like he was about to burst with excitement. CEO Leahy, quickly check your smartphone app and look at our company's shares, it's insane! Don wasted no time and pulled out his phone. As he opened the app, his eyes widened with disbelief. The share price of the Leahy company had skyrocketed by 50% in a short period. What's the scoop, Huey? Don asked his assistant, who sounded just as puzzled as he did. I'm not entirely sure, but I caught wind of some news. The bigwigs over at Edgar Gates Corporation are bullish on our company's shares. They've been buying up shares left and right, and even expressed interest in forming a strategic partnership with us. Huey explained. Don quickly checked the latest news. Sure enough, the headline confirmed everything Huey had just told him. The stock price was soaring, and Don couldn't help but grin from ear to ear. Scarlet, Scarlet, our company is saved! Mr. Gates Corporations want to work with us, and they're buying up shares like crazy! Don exclaimed, practically bouncing with glee. Scarlet rushed over to see for herself and was amazed at what she saw. The Leahy Company's share skyrocketed, and it seemed like nothing could stop them. Dad, this is incredible! Mr. Gates must believe in our company's potential! Scarlet remarked. Don nodded in agreement. He's got a keen eye for talent, that's for sure. I need to thank him in person for this. Without his support, we would have been done for. Scarlet's heart was overflowing with emotion. She knew that Damon was the reason for her happiness. When he had called Edgar earlier, boasting about his newfound strength, Scarlet was skeptical, but now she believed him with all of her heart. Scarlet's mind raced as she thought of all the events that had led up to this moment. Every memory, every word, every action, all culminating in one simple sentence that escaped her lips. Damon, thank you. Her father, Don, was caught off guard by her sudden gratitude toward Damon. Scarlet, why are you thanking him? He asked, confused. But Scarlet knew that Mr. Gates wasn't interested in their company until Damon made the call. It was Damon who had convinced him to help them. Don's jaw dropped as Scarlet told him the details. Red Rhino may have been a top figure in Meyerson, but even he had backed down and went face with Damon. Damon had shown no fear in the face of Pitbull or the thugs who had captured Don. Don realized the Leahy company had survived the crisis not because of luck, but because of Damon's help. He had been their savior, their guardian angel. Don pumped Damon's hand up and down. Thank you, Damon. I underestimated you. You've done a great deed. Don's heart was pounding with panic as he considered the possibility that Damon might remember the vile deeds of those who had wronged him in the past, including Don himself. But Damon decided to keep the peace. Don, it was my pleasure. Don smiled. I guess I should get going and see what's happening at the office. Damon nodded. It's also time for me to leave. Please don't hesitate to reach out in the future if you run into any trouble, okay? Scarlet bit her lip. Damon, you'll still come to work, right? Even if it's just to see you for a moment, it would mean the world to me. I will. Damon agreed. But now it's time to meet with Fifi and fetch my son. When Damon and Fifi rode their electric scooter to pick up their son from school, they had no idea what was in store for them. As they approached the school gates, they were greeted with an unexpected reception. The kindergarten staff were beaming with smiles, and even the school's director ran out to greet them. Mr. Walker, it's so good to see you. The teachers and security guards saluted Damon, making him feel like a VIP. 
The director was particularly enthusiastic. We just love having Junior here, he exclaimed. We have an upcoming ribbon-cutting ceremony to inaugurate one of our new buildings. Mr. and Mrs. Walker, we would be honored if you could attend. Fifi was unaccustomed to the warm greeting. She politely declined the director's invitation. Although the director looked disappointed, he could only nod his head. Damon had quite the reputation around the school, with rumors of his domineering attitude spreading like wildfire. Many of the other parents were curious about him. When they heard that even the likes of Pitbull, Edgar, and Inspector McDuff showed him respect, their interest was piqued. Some of the bolder parents even approached Damon, offering him a cigarette and striking up a conversation. Damon was surprised, but Fifi couldn't help but smile at the attention he was receiving. How is Junior today? Fifi asked the teacher. The teacher lowered her voice. He had a fever earlier, but I sent him to the nurse's office, and I think he's fine now. It didn't seem serious. Fifi put a hand on Junior's forehead, but he didn't feel warm. Feeling grateful and happy, Damon and Fifi decided to make the most of their day. They didn't rush home, but instead headed to the photography studio to pick up their family photos. Fifi had paid extra to have them rushed. At the photography studio, Fifi flipped through the pages of the photo album. She couldn't get enough of the memories captured in these photographs. As they left the studio, Fifi declared that she wanted to fill the walls of their home with the family photos. She also suggested they take Junior to the park that weekend to fly kites. Damon granted her anticipation for the future. Making his woman happy was all he ever wanted. But amidst all the happiness, Damon couldn't shake off a hidden pain. Memories of Emily, Avery, Vicky, Scarlett, and even Veronica flooded his mind. They were all beautiful and deserved happiness, but because they fell in love with him, their lives were thrown into chaos. Damon felt a faint pain as he thought of the past, but he knew he had to focus on the present and the future and make sure that Fifi and Junior always felt safe and loved. A thought flickered through his mind. He still hadn't found the Martinelli family. Could Fifi and Junior still be in danger? When they returned home, they heard crying coming from inside. Damon and Fifi quickly rushed in to find Selena in tears. Damon was worried sick and asked her what was going on. Fifi had a hunch and asked, Did your in-laws insult you again? Selena nodded. Her heart was heavy with the weight of her mother-in-law's disapproval. Damon probed further and discovered that their relationship had been strained for two long years. It all started when Selena, a woman from South Rivertown, married her college sweetheart, who hailed from Meyerson. Her mother-in-law never approved of her and constantly belittled her as a country bumpkin. Selena had endured years of living under her roof, but today was the last straw. Earlier that day, Selena had warmly welcomed guests into their home, but when one of them lost $500, Selena was accused of stealing it by her sister-in-law. Despite her best efforts to explain herself, her mother-in-law joined in the accusations. Selena had hoped her husband would defend her, but he was too afraid to stand up to his family. Though it wasn't her fault, Selena had no choice but to return to the Walker family home. Damon was all ears as Selena's intermittent narration revealed the struggles with her in-laws over the years. To maintain her husband's reputation, Selena had been secretly giving him money, which caused her mother-in-law to think that Selena earned very little. But things were looking up as her husband's work improved, and a promotion was on the horizon. The family became more high profile, and people gossiped that Selena had hit the jackpot with her husband. Andrew and Mrs. Walker knew about the bullying Selena had endured, but they couldn't do much about it. They were honest people, and if they quarreled with their in-laws, Selena and her husband would be divorced, so they could only offer comfort to Selena. Despite being a bit of a coward, Selena's husband treated her well, but today, Eric's sister had crossed a line by slandering Selena. She accused Selena of being a poor country girl who was stealing from them. Selena was heartbroken, so she ran to her mother's house to vent her frustrations. Damon was concerned as he listened to Selena's story. It was clear to him that Selena was being treated unfairly in her own house, and to make matters worse, her husband was a pushover. Damon knew he had to do something to help his sister out of this predicament. He was determined to show Selena's in-laws that they couldn't just walk all over her. Selena had expressed her desire to move out, but the exorbitant housing prices in Meyerson made it impossible for her to do so. Despite having a decent income, she had little savings to speak of. Damon had even given her a vacant villa in the past, but she couldn't bring herself to move in and leave her family behind. But Damon wasn't going to let Selena suffer any longer. He stood up and declared, Selena and I are going to make a trip to her husband's home. 
Damon hopped onto the electric scooter with Selena, and they zoomed off toward her in-law's house. As they rode, Damon asked more questions. He was curious about her husband and sister-in-law's situation, and Selena was eager to fill him in. It turned out that Selena's husband was a cop in Meyerson, and he was about to be promoted to detective of his division. His mother believed that her son had made a mistake by marrying Selena. She thought that he should have married someone who could help his career. Selena's sister-in-law was also quite successful. She worked at a multinational company headquartered in Meyerson. She had looked down her nose at Selena since day one. When they pulled into the subdivision, Damon was surprised. He thought that due to their attitude, the family must live in an opulent home, but it was just an ordinary suburb. Selena directed Damon through the streets until they reached the driveway of the house. They were being tailgated by a new Audi that was honking at Damon Selena. Damon moved out of the way and the Audi roared in front of them, parking in front of the house. The sleek Audi parked beside them and out stepped a stylish middle-aged man and a woman with heavy makeup. The woman sneered at Damon's electric scooter, but Selena's attention was elsewhere. Footsteps echoed from upstairs, and Selena's heart sank as a middle-aged woman and a young woman emerged from the house. These were her mother-in-law and sister-in-law, and Selena's face paled at the sight of them. Damon noticed his sister's discomfort. Who are they? Selena hesitated. That's my mother-in-law and sister-in-law. Her mother-in-law crossed her arms. What are you doing here? Selena's sister-in-law chimed in. She ran back to her mother's house in tears, but now she can't stay there anymore, so she's coming back here. Maureen's eyes roamed over Damon, sizing him up. Her gaze fell on the little electric scooter parked beside him, and a look of disdain flashed across her face. Who is he? She asked, her tone dripping with hostility. The mother-in-law, too, had noticed Damon standing there. Her expression was no less unfriendly. Selena introduced him. This is my brother, Damon. Damon, this is my sister-in-law, Maureen, and my mother-in-law, Mrs. Cohen. Hello to both of you. He greeted them cheerfully. Mrs. Cohen seemed about to ask something else. But then she remembered the two VIPs waiting in the Audi and bustled off to greet them. As they made their way into the house, Selena's husband, Eric, emerged from a room and caught sight of Mr. Marquez and his daughter. Hello, Mr. Marquez, Eric exclaimed, rushing over to greet them. Mr. Marquez's voice boomed. Eric, my boy, you truly are a talent. I pulled some strings to get you that promotion, and I'm confident the transfer notice will be on its way very soon. Just remember, when you're in a more important position, don't forget about me. Eric beamed. I won't let you down, sir. Mr. Marquez then beckoned his daughter over. Come say hello to Eric, honey. Mimi obliged with a cheerful, Hello, Eric. Mr. Marquez chuckled heartily. You two used to run around naked together as kiddos. Mrs. Cohen looked Mimi up and down. Wow, she's stunning and so charismatic too. Who in the right mind would ever divorce her? If my son doesn't snatch her up, I'll never forgive him. Meanwhile, Damon and Selena stood at the doorway, taking it all in. Eric finally noticed them and asked, Selena, you're back. Who's this? Selena said, this is my brother, Damon. Damon, this is my husband, Eric. Damon stretched out his hand and said lightly, Hello, it's nice to meet you. Eric was stunned. Brother? He remembered Selena mentioning that she had a brother, but she said that her brother had passed away. She didn't tell him exactly how he had passed away, but he never expected her brother to return from the dead. But here he was alive and well. Eric quickly composed himself and warmly welcomed Damon into their home. As Damon made himself comfortable on the sofa, Mrs. Cohen's disapproving gaze did not go unnoticed. Selena's sister-in-law, Maureen, curled her lips. Selena, why are you standing here like a statue? Go pour some coffee for our guests. Damon raised his eyebrows. It appeared that Selena's in-laws liked to boss her around, and they seemed to be silently judging the situation. Wait, hold on. Is that Eric's new wife? Mr. Marquez's eyes were glued to Selena, but his smile seemed forced and awkward. Mrs. Cohen let out a helpless sigh and confirmed. Yes, unfortunately, she's not the sharpest tool in the shed and quite clumsy. I have no idea what Eric sees in her. Mimi chimed in. Well, she did come from the countryside. Can't really blame her for that. Mrs. Cohen let out a boisterous laugh. Eric helped Selena serve the coffee and fruit. He set the fruit in the center of the table. My boy, let me give you some advice, said Mr. Marcus. As an honored guest in your home, 
You shouldn't place the fruit out of my reach. You need to be more aware of your surroundings. You never know who's watching. And if you want to climb the ladder in this world, you need to learn the ins and outs of being an official. It may seem like a small detail, but it can make all the difference in the eyes of the big shots. Trust me, I've seen it all before. Mrs. Cohen leaned forward. Mr. Marquez, how confident are you about Eric's promotion? Mr. Marquez took a leisurely sip of coffee before responding with a quiet confidence. With me stepping in, he will succeed. Mrs. Cohen was radiant. That's wonderful news. We'll be relying on your expertise in the future, Mr. Marquez. Mr. Marquez turned to Mimi and offered her some advice. Honey, I couldn't help but notice that you've been feeling down lately. Why don't you spend more time with Eric? I think he's well-versed in the matters of the heart. It might just do wonders for your mood. Damon frowned, sensing that there was more to this conversation than met the eye. Damon's eyes shifted to Eric, who looked perplexed and unsure. I'm not exactly a love guru, and I'm not great with words either. Plus, Selena's opinion matters too, right? Maybe we can all hang out together. Eric mumbled. Mrs. Cohen interjected, her tone sharp and stern. Why do you care about Selena's opinion? You've known Mimi since childhood. What could Selena possibly have to say about it? Eric felt a pang of annoyance at his mother's words, but he didn't dare to speak up. He knew better than to argue with her. Mr. Marquez turned to Damon and spoke in a tone that was deceptively kind, but with a sharp edge lurking beneath the surface. Sir, are you the brother-in-law? I am, Damon replied. Mr. Marquez continued. I heard that you and Selena are from a small town. Damon replied, South River Town, it's not exactly a bustling metropolis. Mr. Marquez sipped his coffee. That's right, your family must have been quite shocked when they first arrived in Meyerson, I imagine. Damon was taken aback. Why was Mr. Marquez making assumptions about his family? Mr. Marquez smirked. Meyerson is such a great city, so advanced and developed. How can a small place like South How can a small place like South River Town even compare? Eric's sister, Maureen, piped up. Why did you accompany Selena to our home today? Damon shrugged nonchalantly. Just checking up on my sister. I heard something happened and wanted to make sure she was okay. Maureen snorted. Oh, please. Selena just wants people on her side, doesn't she? I knew it. You're up to no good. Damon raised an eyebrow. What are you talking about? Maureen leaned closer. Don't play dumb. Your sister stole from our guest. And now you're here trying to find someone to help cover it up. Damon scowled. Selena would never do something like that. Maureen's voice dripped at self-righteousness. Oh, please. We have witnesses. And besides, how do you think your parents managed to start their business? They used the stolen money to fund it. Damon wasn't buying it. I used to think people in Meyerson were of high quality. But seeing you go on like this, I have my doubts. Maureen's anger boiled over. Your sister is a witch, she spat. Your family has no class. You're poor, uncultured slobs. Our upbringing is far superior to yours, he retorted. And when it comes to culture, my sister could crush you in examinations, even if she didn't attend a fancy private school. As for money, well, let's just say that's not an issue. Maureen scoffed. Please, you think you're rich? Who gave you that idea? I saw your scooter parked outside. Eric desperately wanted to intervene, but Mrs. Cohen held him back. Maureen pursed her lips. Honestly, I still can't fathom how my brother fell for someone like you. What did he see in you? Money can't buy love, and your career is nothing to write home about. If I had known this would happen, I would have gladly welcomed Mimi as my sister-in-law. Mr. Marquez smiled darkly. There might still be a chance for that to happen. Selena's face turned beet red. Mr. Marquez had said enough to reveal his true intentions. It was clear to anyone with half a brain what he was up to. Selena looked to Eric for support, but he was the root of all of her problems. Eric knew he had to tread carefully. Mr. Marquez, I'm afraid there won't be any chances in the future. He said, trying to sound as diplomatic as possible. You see, I have a good relationship with Selena and... But before he could finish his sentence, Mrs. Cohen quickly clarified, Mr. Marquez, please don't misunderstand. He didn't mean that. She said, hoping to smooth things over. Under the table, she gave Eric a hard kick, signaling to him to be quiet. She couldn't afford to offend Mr. Marquez, not when they held the fate of Eric's career in his hands. Mr. Marquez seemed to take the whole thing in stride. He's just a kid. It's normal for him to be impulsive. He said, patting his chest. But don't worry. If you follow my lead, you'll climb higher than you ever thought possible. This man held power to shape Eric's future, 
and it seemed like a mere promotion was all it would take to secure his success. But Eric wanted to fight back to stand up for himself. Unfortunately, the weight of Mr. Marquez's influence was too much to bear. Even if Eric tried to push forward, he knew he'd face insurmountable obstacles without Mr. Marquez's support. Selena watched with a heavy heart as Eric backed down, unable to withstand the pressure. But Damon saw an opportunity. He knew Eric still loved Selena, and he was willing to use his own strength to teach these arrogant people a lesson. With a cold smile, he lit a cigarette and spoke with confidence. You think you can manipulate my sister's husband? I don't think so. Are you seriously questioning me? Mr. Marquez was fuming. He had planned to show off his power to the Cohen family, but this random nobody dared to challenge him. His face twisted into an ugly expression as he hissed. Do you know who I am? How dare you speak to me like that? Damon shook his head, unfaced at Mr. Marquez's outburst. Enlighten me, please. I'm curious. Mimi tried to put Damon in his place. Listen up, country bumpkin. My father is the deputy director of the Public Security Bureau. What do you know about anything? Damon remained calm and collected. Money, for instance? Do you think you're confident in that matter at your level? Mr. Marquez lit a cigarette and took a puff, trying to regain his composure. You have a big mouth, young man. You know nothing about the real world. I'm the only person who can make decisions about Eric's future. Actually, I do have a say in the matter. Damon retorted. I know a thing or two about money. I also have connections with powerful people you couldn't even dream of. Mr. Marquez scoffed. You're just talking nonsense. Prove it to me, if you're so confident. Selena's eyes widened in shock as she looked at her brother. She had never seen Damon act so boastful before. She couldn't help but wonder if he had something up his sleeve. As if reading her thoughts, Damon pulled out his phone and made a call. Hey, Macduff, any personal transfers in your bureau lately? He asked. What? You don't know? Well, keep me posted. I heard Eric Cohen is on the observation list. I think we need to keep an eye on him. Selena's heart raced as she listened to her brother's conversation. What was he up to? When Damon hung up the phone, Mr. Marquez's face twisted. Are you done yet? Who do you think you're calling, using such a commanding tone? And you don't even know about the massive personnel transfer in the Bureau. I'd love to see if anyone will bother to reply to you. Wow, Selena, I never would have guessed that your brother was a swindler. He really pulled a fast one on everyone. Maureen exclaimed. He should be careful. Eric and Mr. Marquez are a cops, you know. They could bust him in a second. Damon turned to Maureen. I heard you bullied my sister every day for no reason. And now you work in a multinational group and have recently been promoted. He asked, his tone accusatory. Maureen crossed her arms defensively and challenged Damon. What, are you trying to take revenge on me? Selena is the criminal here, not me. Damon didn't flinch. You'll find out soon enough. He said, pulling out his phone and making a call to his friend Edgar. As he spoke to Edgar, Damon turned his gaze back to Maureen and asked for her full name. Maureen Elizabeth Cohen. She replied with the sneer, thinking she had the upper hand in this situation. But Damon had a plan. I don't think she's suitable for her job. He told Edgar, You guys go inside and check her name. Then do as you see fit. Maureen's expression quickly changed from smug to panicked as she realized the tables had turned. Damon had outsmarted her, and she was about to face the consequences of her actions. Is that all? Maureen rolled her eyes, but Damon remained unfazed confident that the call would come soon enough. Mr. Marquez lit a cigarette and waited for Damon to make a fool of himself. Selena suggested they forget about the whole thing. She was worried about what might happen if things didn't go as planned. But Damon was determined to intimidate the Cohen family and make things easier for Selena in the long run. Maureen giggled. What's wrong, Selena? Your brother can't keep up this act for much longer. You lied and cheated your way into marrying my brother. It looks like it runs in the family. Damon squeezed his sister's shoulder. Selena, don't waste your pity on them. Your kindness only makes them think they can treat you like garbage. But don't worry. I know how to handle them. I'll show them who they should I'll show them who they should and shouldn't mess with. The seasoned detective, Mr. Marquez, was taken aback by the young man's brashfulness. Brashness. He had seen his fair share of fraudsters, but this one was different. He had a clear conscience and a convincing demeanor that made Mr. Marquez doubt his own instincts. Just as he was about to confront the young man, his phone rang. It was Detective Callum from the District Public Security Bureau. Mr. Marquez answered the call, expecting the worst. 
Detective Callum's voice was low and serious as he asked, I recall you mentioning a young man with promise in the field. Do you think he's worth investing in? Absolutely, Mr. Marquez replied confidently. He's a model worker with our district and a shining example of what our community can achieve. Detective Callum's tone shifted as he revealed, I've been looking into his background and there are some... S and there seem to be some discrepancies. I think we need to investigate further before making any decisions about his future. Mr. Marquez's forehead began to sweat as he looked over at Damon. Did Damon have insider information? Who did you talk to? Mr. Marquez asked. Detective Callan hesitated for a moment. It was Inspector McDuff who called me. He whispered urgently. Look, I can't talk right now. Fix it. As he tried to process this information, Detective Callum hung up the phone, leaving him with more questions than answers. He looked at Damon as if he had seen a ghost. Did Damon know Inspector McDuff? What kind of power did he wield to be able to give him instructions? Dad, what's going on? Mimi asked, sensing that something was amiss. Mr. Marquez had lost all of his confidence and was struggling to find the right words. Finally, he spoke up. There's been a mistake with the promotion. Everyone turned to look at Damon. Could it be that he was the one responsible for this? Mimi couldn't believe it. She had always thought that her father was the most powerful person in the Bureau, but now it seemed like Damon had surpassed him. No way, she muttered under her breath. Mr. Marquez massaged his temples. Honey, Inspector McDuff is an extremely important figure in our department. I don't know why he wanted to get involved in this. As the tension in the room grew, Maureen's phone suddenly rang. She answered it with a mix of surprise and bewilderment, only to hear a deep voice on the other end. This is Maureen Cohen. What's the matter? The man on the other end seemed to be thinking about what to say next. It's like this, Maureen. I just received a call from the head office saying that you're not qualified for your current position. You don't need to come into work tomorrow. Maureen's voice rose half an octave as she exclaimed, What? How is that possible? The people in the main company don't know me, and they don't know my business acumen. How could they fire me? Not long ago, they said they wanted to promote me to be a director. I don't know either, but this was a call from headquarters. We can't ignore it. Even the general manager didn't understand what had happened. Maureen was considered a small manager in the company, and usually the higher-ups didn't meddle in her affairs. Maureen's heart pounded. Then, can we still remedy this? Who gave the order? She desperately hoped that there was still a chance to fix things and salvage her job. Maureen felt her stomach drop as she realized that her worst fears were coming true. As if sensing her distress, the general manager lowered his voice. Look, I received many phone calls about you. Did you offend someone? Even the highest boss called me. Think about it. If you offended someone, you have to think about it carefully. Maureen's mind raced as she tried to figure out who she could have possibly offended. The thought of losing her job over something she didn't even know she did was too much to bear. Mrs. Cohen's brow furrowed. What's wrong, Maureen? Mom, I... I was fired! She blurted out. What? Fired? Mrs. Cohen shrieked, her eyes bulging in disbelief. She turned to Damon, who remained eerily calm. If there was any doubt before, it was now crystal clear that Damon was the mastermind behind the recent events. He had made two phone calls and everything had fallen into place like clockwork. Everyone was terrified, and not just because of what had happened, but because of how efficient Damon was. Mrs. Cohen swallowed hard and asked, Who are you? Damon didn't bother to hide his pride as he stared coldly at Mrs. Cohen. Do you really think that you deserve to know who I am? He retorted. Damon had always been the epitome of cool and collected, but today was different. Mrs. Cohen had pushed him too far, and he was ready to show her who was boss. He wanted to prove to her that the small-town boy she looked down upon had the power to control her fate. As Mrs. Cohen stood there, humiliated by Damon's actions, she mustered up the courage to ask him a question. Maureen and her job, is it all because of you? Damon took a long drag from his cigarette, relishing the power he held over her. Who else? Maureen, emboldened by Mrs. Cohen's question, chimed in. And what about Edgar Gates? Did you call him? Damon's smile was cold and calculating. Do you really think that's any of your business? He asked, his eyes locking onto hers. Maureen was speechless, a feeling she was not accustomed to. There was something about Damon that terrified her, something that she couldn't quite put her finger on. Mr. Marquez's voice quivered. May I know, what is your relationship with Inspector McDuff? 
The shock of Damon's phone call had left him in a state of awe, and his words carried a respectful tone. Damon completely ignored him, but the more he ignored him, the more panicked Mr. Marquez became. Suddenly, Mrs. Conan's demeanor shifted. She gave in to Damon's power and apologized for her earlier offense. She even went as far as to ask Selena what drinks her brother preferred, eager to make amends. Selena stood up to help pour the drinks, but Mrs. Cohen shook her head. No, no, please sit and relax with your brother. Maureen will help me serve you. It was a complete 180 from her previous behavior. Why didn't you tell me about your powerful brother? Look at us causing all these silly misunderstandings. Mrs. Cohen cautiously glanced over at Damon, afraid to even breathe too loudly. Mrs. Cohen's heart was filled with anxiety as she thought about how harshly she had treated Selena in the past. Her sense of superiority as a native of Meyerson had vanished, leaving only fear in its place. She had basked in the small achievements of her child, but this young man in front of them had the power they could never hope to achieve. Selena shut her mouth and didn't speak. She was still shocked that her brother was alive, much less that he returned bigger and better than ever. Maureen ducked her head. Damon, can you make another call? I want you to call Edgar Gates. Please don't fire me, okay? She squeezed out a few tears and begged for forgiveness. I know I shouldn't have laughed at you earlier. Please don't hold it against me. Damon's cold smile grew wider. That's not how this is going to go down. Maureen was on the verge of tears, pleading with him to let her keep her job. I don't want a promotion. I just want to keep my position. Please? She had always been proud of her job and the great benefits that came with it. But now, all that was in jeopardy. She was terrified of losing her job and didn't know where she would go if she did. Damon's voice boomed through the room. You like to bully my sister, don't you? I, um... Maureen was speechless. She had never expected to be called out like this. But then, Damon demanded an apology. Maureen burst into tears. I'm sorry. I didn't do it on purpose. I used to look down on people. In the future, I won't do it again. Please just forgive me. Selena smiled wanly. I accept your apology. Damon had the power to fire Maureen, but he didn't want to fight to the death. He just wanted to make sure that Maureen knew her behavior was unacceptable. As long as he deterred her, it would be fine. He didn't want his sister's marriage to suffer because of his actions. Seeing that Maureen and Mrs. Cohen gave in, Damon called Edgar again. It had only been a short while. About 10 minutes later, Maureen's superior called. Maureen, Edgar Gates just called me and said that the matter was a complete misunderstanding. So the company decided not to fire you. Maureen thanked her supervisor profusely. She glanced at Damon, then swiftly looked away. She was both humbled and terrified by his power. Mr. Marquez gulped and stammered out an apology to Damon. It was clear that he had made a grave mistake and was desperate to make amends. As the apologies were made, Damon remained silent, his eyes fixated on the wall. It was clear that he was not interested in the petty squabbles or meaningless apologies. He was a man of action and he would not be swayed by empty words. Mr. Marquez was a seasoned pro, a master of reading people's expressions. He could spot a liar from a mile away and could tell when someone was hiding the truth. And right now, he had Damon pegged as the one person he should never have crossed paths with. But Damon didn't even give him the time of day. It was a power move that left Mr. Marquez feeling uneasy, but he knew better than to lose his cool. Though his daughter Mimi may have been a bit of a snob, she wasn't stupid. After a moment of reflection, she swallowed her pride and also apologized to Damon. Mr. Cohen's eyes darted nervously between Damon and Selena. She knew she had to be careful, and with a deep breath, she licked her lips and spoke up. Damon, I know you may have seemed a bit hasty earlier, but we only want what's best for Selena's future. And we know that you have the power to help us with this situation. Damon raised an eyebrow, intrigued. And what situation might that be? Mrs. Cohen hesitated for a moment. I just want what's best for my son. And I know you want what's best for your sister. Don't ruin Eric's career prospects. Damon leaned back in his chair. And why should I help you with that? Because he's still your brother-in-law, Mrs. Cohen reminded him. And if something were to go wrong, it could ruin Selena's future. We just want to protect her. Selena couldn't bear to see her brother upset, but she knew she had to speak up. Brother, she said, her voice trembling slightly. Why don't you call Inspector McDuff and let him know that Eric is doing a great job? He deserves some recognition, don't you think? Damon furrowed his brow. Selena, I know what I'm doing. This was a masterful move, one that can make or break Eric's future. 
If Eric was wise enough to protect Selena, he would be safe from Damon's wrath. But if he failed, Damon could easily crush them all. Mrs. Cohen was no fool. She knew her son's future was at stake. As long as he treated Selena well, the money would come eventually. She also understood that she couldn't bully Selena anymore. She had to treat her with respect, even if it made her unhappy. Her family's future depended on it. Mr. Marquez rose from his chair. Well, I won't disturb you guys any longer. Mr. Walker, may I save your contact details? He knew that building a relationship with Damon could be beneficial for him in the long run. However, Damon saw right through Mr. Marquez's intentions and declined his offer. No need. He said with a shake of his head. Since Mr. Marquez was leaving, Damon decided it was time to go as well. He had achieved his goal, and there was no point in staying any longer. Wait! Before Damon could leave the Cohen's house, Maureen stopped him. Would you mind asking Mr. Gates if he can transfer me to the headquarters? I've always wanted to work there, but no one would put in a good word for me. Damon rolled his eyes. The nerve of these people! Maureen, if you want a promotion, you need to work hard just like everyone else. I won't pull any strings for you behind the scenes. Mr. Marquez's daughter, Mimi, fluttered her eyelashes at Damon. Hey, can I get your contact details? She gave him a wink. Damon shook his head. Sorry, Mimi, but I'm married, and I'm not looking for anything else. With that, he and Selena hopped on the electric scooter and sped off. Selena leaned her head on Damon's shoulders as they drove. Brother, where have you been all these years? Previously, Selena believed the story he told their family, but after witnessing the scene at the Cohen family's house, she felt that her brother's words were full of loopholes. Didn't I tell you? I was floating on the sea and then I ended up stranded on a remote island. I explained everything to the family. Damon replied. He didn't want Selena to know too much. Since Damon seemed unwilling to reveal the truth, Selena didn't ask again. She figured he had his reasons and would tell her if and when he was ready. When they pulled up to the house, Fifi, Andrew, and Mrs. Walker were anxiously waiting for them outside. Well, how did it go? Mrs. Walker pressed. Did you have a falling out with Selena's in-laws? It was a little messy. Damon said nonchalantly. Mrs. Walker put her hand on her heart. Silly child, don't you know better than to stir up trouble with Selena's in-laws? Mrs. Cohen and Maureen are real pieces of work. It might feel good to talk back to them in the heat of the moment, but what if you negatively affect your sister's future? I don't want them to take their anger out on Selena. However, Selena shook her head and said, Mom, don't worry. Damon took care of everything. They won't dare mistreat me again. Seeing Selena so sure, everyone relaxed. Mrs. Walker said, Good! If you're confident about it, I trust you. At noon the next day, Damon and Fifi received a call from the kindergarten teacher. Junior had fainted in class and was running a high fever. Damon and Fifi rushed to the school. Junior had received the teacher and the doctor's meticulous care. However, from the doctor's serious expression, Junior's situation did not seem optimistic. But what exactly happened? Junior was awake, lying on a cot in the nurse's office. Mommy, Daddy! He cried weakly, stretching on his small hand. When the doctor gave me a shot, I didn't even cry. He smiled bravely. Fifi ran her hands through his sweat-matted hair. Honey, that's great. You're a superhero. Damon pulled the teacher aside. What led to this? The teacher explained that Junior had been playing with his classmates when he fell to the ground and passed out. The teacher immediately called the nurse. When the nurse realized Junior was running a fever, she called the doctor to give Junior special attention. Everyone at school had witnessed Damon's extraordinary power, and they didn't want to take their chances if his son fell ill. The doctor finished his examination and determined that Junior was a victim of food poisoning. Hearing this result, everyone was stunned. Could Junior have been poisoned by the food at the school cafeteria? If so, it would reflect negatively on their lunch program. They could face lawsuits. Fifi asked the doctor if he thought it was from the school cafeteria, but the doctor shook his head. No, I don't think so. If that were the case, all the other children would experience the same symptoms. My theory is that it was from some snacks or other food sources. I've never seen a case like this in a small child. It seems to be from something he's been consuming regularly. It's been slowly accumulating in his body, and it's only starting to take effect now. There's potential that it could get worse in the future. The doctor continued, lowering his voice to an urgent whisper. I don't want to worry you, but this is serious. The poison we're looking at isn't just Salamonella. It appears that someone has been deliberately sabotaging your little boy. Damon and Fifi's faces were ashen. 
Who was it that dared to poison Junior? How long has this poison been in Junior's body? Damon suspected that one of Junior's bullies had been tampering with his food. The doctor said, according to our analysis, the chronic poison has been in the child's body for three to four years. Damon and Fifi were both shocked. If it had happened three or four years ago when the child had yet to go to school, it couldn't have been a prank by his classmates. It meant that someone had poisoned him since he was a baby. The doctor pointed at a paper on his clipboard. Yes, with a close reading of this test result, this poison could be life-threatening. Fifi bit her lip, trying not to cry. She knew she needed to be strong. Then what should we do? We need to extract the poison from inside. Currently, there is only one person in the country who knows this method. He's an expert in the field of pediatrics. The doctor replied, Fortunately, he's been visiting a mentor in Meyerson this year. So you wouldn't have to travel far. I recommend you see him as quickly as possible. He's at the Lily of the Valley Hospital, and his name is Dr. Mora. Damon and Fifi wrapped Junior up in blankets and called a cab to take them to the hospital. Along the way, Fifi was restless. She had been thinking about who was poisoning Junior. Very soon, Fifi's face contorted. She could roughly guess who did it. Do you have a theory? Damon asked. Fifi shook her head. I'm not sure, but I think it might be Vlad. Damon's expression darkened. Vlad had been trying to marry Fifi in Damon's absence, and she always turned him down. He remembered when he met Vlad, and the man had wasted no time insulting Junior. Junior also told Damon that Vlad had been violent toward the two of them. Damon racked his brain. He suddenly remembered Junior babbling on about snacks that Vlad bought him. Vlad must have been trying to butter up the child so he wouldn't get in the way of Vlad's relationship with Fifi. Damon whipped out his phone and researched the Lily of the Valley Hospital. He frowned. It was a private hospital, and it was owned by a certain V. Popov. No, it couldn't be. Damon panicked internally. Was this all a part of Vlad's plan? If he owned the hospital, then all the employees, including the doctors, would have to be in his pocket. If Fifi wanted to save Junior, she would have no choice but to beg for help from Vlad. He would be the only person who could decide Junior's fate, since no other doctors knew how to extract the poison. Fifi couldn't believe she'd put her son in harm's way. When Damon was gone, Fifi had to rely on Vlad to get a firm foothold in the business world, and he'd lent her money in the past. She didn't like his personality, but she begrudgingly accepted that he was a good person at heart. Now she saw him for what he was, a wolf in sheep's clothing. But what choice did she have? If she wanted to save her son's life, she had to play along with Vlad's sadistic games. She would never forgive him. The car arrived at the hospital. Fifi rushed inside and demanded to see Dr. Mora. The doctor saw them right away. He did a cursory examination of Junior, then took off his glasses. I can treat his illness, but the fees will be high. We don't accept most forms of insurance in this hospital. How much? Damon asked. As long as it was a problem that money could solve, Damon could fix it. Dr. Morris spoke in a deep voice. Because your son is suffering from chronic poisoning, he needs to be slowly treated. In my estimate, the process will take a year or two, which will add up to be around $30 million. This was an exorbitant demand. However, Dr. Mora was the only person who could perform the necessary procedures. Damon didn't care about the price tag. As long as Junior was cured, money was nothing. That won't be an issue. We want the best care possible for our son. If that means emptying our bank accounts, then so be it. A long time ago, Vlad had sought out Dr. Mora and told him that if a child had this kind of illness and came to seek treatment, Dr. Mora was instructed to report to Vlad. Though it violated doctor-patient confidentiality, Vlad wielded an absurd amount of power over the hospital employees, and there was little they could do to fight back. Dr. Mora excused himself to make a phone call. He promised to call Vlad as soon as a poisoned child showed up at the hospital. Vlad met Fifi outside the hospital room while Damon stayed inside to watch Junior. Fifi, hello. It's nice to see you. So sorry to hear about Junior's condition. But don't you have questions? He's been fine all these years, but the second your useless husband returns, Junior falls ill. It's a little suspicious if you ask me. Fifi lowered her voice. Vlad, I know it was you. I have a gut instinct. Call it a mother's tuition. Vlad waved his hand dismissively. That's nonsense, Fifi. If you want to point fingers, why not start pointing at your precious Damon? Fifi was so angry that she trembled all over. If it wasn't you, how did you know that our junior was sick? Vlad, I used to think that you were a gentleman, but I didn't expect you to be so despicable. Vlad did not care about Fifi's angry scalding. He spread out his hands and said, 
Fifi, do you want to know who did it? Fifi said coldly, isn't it you? Vlad smiled. He quietly moved closer to Fifi and said, I can tell you privately. That's right, I did it. To be honest with you, I wish your son had died earlier. There were a few times when I almost succeeded, but in the end, your son ruined it. I hate him to the bone. I originally thought it would take some time for it to flare up, but I didn't expect it to be discovered so quickly. But you don't have any evidence. What can you do to me? After saying that, Flat started laughing wildly, as arrogantly as he could. Damon had been listening with his ear pressed against the door. At that moment, he opened the door and hissed at Vlad. There's no need for evidence. You already admitted your guilt. Vlad wasn't intimidated. I did. So what can you do about it? You are no longer the billionaire from before. You don't have room to act cocky. I have connections with people from the underworld who wouldn't hesitate to break your legs as soon as I snap my fingers. He then turned his gaze to Fifi. Fifi, you slut. To think that all these years... I helped you, but in the end it was all in vain. Your good days have also come to an end. I want all of the money I gave to you and your family returned to me, with interest. Fifi's eyes narrowed. I used to be grateful to you, but now that I know what you're capable of, I know that you're nothing but a lowlife scumbag. You will always be my enemy. So what if you are my enemy? I like to see you hate me, but you can't kill me. <laughs> Enjoy the good times with your useless husband. Your time is running out. Pow! Damon gave Vlad a fierce slap. Go! Beat him to death! Vlad roared. Several bodyguards rushed toward Damon, but Damon was too fast. None of the bodyguards were able to withstand a strike from Damon, and all of them fell to the ground with a single punch. Then Damon came in front of Vlad. Not only did you poison my son, I heard you even dare to touch my wife. Vlad was trying to remain strong-willed. So what if I did? He spat. Your wife is beautiful. I'm not the only man who wants to get close to her. You're such a pathetic person, Damon. You couldn't even drown yourself in the ocean properly. Your stupid wife has guarded her chastity for five years. She gave me nothing in return. But I bet you if you had showed up, I would have convinced her to give herself to me. I'll kill you! Damon yelled. He picked up a chair and threw it at Vlad, but to his surprise, Vlad dodged it. Then Vlad rushed at Damon like a cannonball, whipping on a knife and aiming for Damon's chest. Anyone else would have been stabbed, but Damon was no ordinary person. He jumped to the side, then swung up his leg and kicked Vlad in the stomach. Vlad quickly jumped to his feet. Vlad's tenacity once again exceeded Damon's expectations. You're a dead man! Vlad growled. He threw a punch at Damon, but Damon caught his fist in midair and twisted it with all of his might. Vlad cried out in pain as Damon kicked him once again. With a cracking sound, like metal breaking, Vlad stumbled backward and slid down against the wall. He glowered at Damon. Okay, I get it, you're a skilled fighter, but you're a shell of the person you once were. Just wait, and see what I have in store for you. He struggled to his feet. I'm done with you for today, but this isn't over. Damon, mark my words. Damon blocked his path. Where the hell do you think you're going? Get out of my way, Vlad snarled. I'm letting you off easy. Damon crossed his arms. I'm not going anywhere until my son is healthy. What motivations do I have to save your son? He's just like his father. I'd rather see him six feet in the ground. Vlad declared defiantly. Damon shook his head. It was one thing to mess with Damon, but if someone were to go after his family, they wouldn't live to see another day. Damon's grip on Vlad's collar was tight, his eyes blazing with fury. Tell me, are you going to save my son or not? Damon demanded, his voice low and menacing. Vlad's throat felt like it was closing up, his breaths coming in short gasp. He knew that if he said no again, he'd be in serious trouble. I'll... I'll ask the doctor to treat your son's illness. You... you just let me go. He stammered. Damon sent Vlad flying with a kick. Get lost. Vlad scurried away before Damon could beat him up any further. Damon turned to Dr. Mora with a proposition. Dr. Mora... Are you interested in going to work in another hospital? The income and benefits will be generous. Dr. Mora hesitated, his mind racing. On one hand, he was afraid of Vlad's influence on Meyerson, 
On the other hand, he was also worried about Damon's violent tendencies. After all, he had just witnessed the man beat up Vlad without a second thought. Damon scowled. I phrased it as a question, but it's more of a command, Doctor. We need your help. But if you continue working for Vlad, we won't be able to receive your assistance. Please aid us in saving our son's life. Dr. Mora watches Damon dial a number on his phone. Hello, I have a medical professional who needs to be transferred to a different hospital. Please arrange the paperwork with human resources at once. Damon hung up and turned to Dr. Mora. Well, doctor, Hutchins Hospital will be your new unit from now on. Dr. Mora's jaw dropped. Really? Isn't that in a different county? How will I manage to get out of my contract with Vlad and Lily of the Valley Hospital? Damon shrugged. I promise it'll be worth your while. Your income will be 10 times more than what you're making here. Don't worry about breaking your contract here. I'll take care of everything. Soon enough, this hospital will cease to exist. Damon smiled cruelly, eagerly anticipating the fruits of his vengeance. Vlad returned home and touched his swollen face. His body trembled with rage as he recalled the brutal beating he had received at the hands of Damon. It was the ultimate insult, worse than anything he had ever experienced before. Even his parents had never laid a hand on him like that, and to make matters worse, it had all happened in front of Fifi. The humiliation was unbearable. Vlad's mind raced with thoughts of revenge. He couldn't let Damon get away with this. He needed to strike back and strike back hard. His eyes burned with hatred as he plotted his next move. Find out what Damon is up to, he commanded his henchmen. And while you're at it, kidnap his entire family. I want them all dead. As his minions scurried off to carry out his orders, Vlad poured himself a glass of fine wine. He savored the taste, imagining the sweet satisfaction he would feel when Damon finally knelt before him, begging for mercy. Little did Vlad know that his happiness was about to be short-lived. Trouble had arrived at the doorstep before he could even bask in the joy of his recent success. A frantic lackey barged in, his body drenched in blood, to report the horrific incident that had taken place at the bar downtown. Vlad's heart sank as he listened to the devastating news of his henchman being injured and miserable. With a swift whoosh sound, Vlad stood up, ready to take charge. He demanded to know who had done this, but the lackey could only stammer in response. Vlad's anger boiled over and he smacked his lips in frustration before delivering a resounding slap to his lackey. What's the use of having you bastards if you can't even find out who did this? He bellowed. Another subordinate rushed in. The night market on the downtown pedestrian street was completely destroyed. Our guys were beaten up and injured. Vlad's eyes widened in shock and anger. How dare someone mess with his territory? He grabbed the nearest object, a teapot, and hurled it to the ground in frustration. But the bad news didn't stop there. Another subordinate rushed in with even worse news. Boss, we're in trouble. The government has shut down all of our entertainment venues. Vlad couldn't believe it. He thought he was untouchable, but now even the government was getting involved. That was a direct challenge to his authority. Why would they do that? Vlad asked. We're law-abiding citizens for the most part. They have no right to shut us down. The lackey sighed. The police raided our establishments. They claim to have found drugs and prostitutes. You're also being accused of tax evasion. Duh, seriously, what else could go wrong today? Vlad muttered to himself. He couldn't shake the feeling that someone was purposely messing with him. It was just his luck that he had been beaten up by Damon earlier, and before he could even think about getting revenge, more problems had already arisen. But Vlad wasn't one to sit around and wait for things to happen to him. He quickly got his subordinate to prepare a car for him, and headed to the nearest nightclub he owned to investigate the situation. Unfortunately, Vlad didn't have many bodyguards with him, only a car following behind. As he sat in the car, his face was dark with anger and frustration. Who could have attacked him so suddenly and without warning? He had made a lot of enemies over the years, so it could have been anyone. Vlad couldn't help but blame himself for his arrogance and the enemies he had made. He knew it was only a matter of time before someone sought revenge on him. As they drove, a garbage truck suddenly parked in front of them, blocking their way. Damn it! I can smell the scent of that garbage even with the windows rolled up! Vlad complained. Driver, go tell the owner of that truck to move. The driver obeyed. He got out of the car and knocked the driver's side window of the garbage truck. Hey, get a move on, he demanded. My boss is not in a mood to deal with this today. The truck driver was a muscular man with tattoos all over his body. He ignored Vlad's driver's request. 
the driver spat at the garbage truck before returning to Vlad's car. The back of the garbage truck slowly began to lift up, revealing a mountain of stinky trash that started to slide down. The driver was flabbergasted, and he quickly rolled down his window to shout, Are you blind? Can't you see we're driving a Rolls Royce behind you? You can't even afford to pay a fraction of this car! Vlad's face twisted in disgust as he rolled down the window and took a drag from his cigarette. Damn, tell him to be careful, he growled. Once the garbage truck driver heard Vlad's driver's threats, he decided to retaliate. The back cover of the garbage truck flipped open, and the garbage inside began to rain down. Vlad tried to escape, but the car door was locked. Frustrated, he cursed and screamed, but it was too late. The window was open, and the trash started pouring in, filling his mouth and blocking his speech. Meanwhile, his driver in front was buried under a pile of garbage. Thankfully, their Rolls Royce was built to last. The car withstood the weight of the garbage, but Vlad was left feeling sick and disoriented. He couldn't even identify what type of trash had been dumped on him. It was so foul that he almost lost his lunch. Run! His underling shouted urgently, and Vlad's heart raced as he turned to see a group of men charging toward him, with machetes in hand. Despite his fighting skills, Vlad was caught off guard, but his escape was far from easy. As he ran, he narrowly dodged the garbage truck hurtling toward him. When he turned around, he was horrified to see that the luxury car he had just been sitting in was now a pile of crushed metal. And to make matters worse, more attackers emerged from a dump truck, brandishing their machetes and hacking away at the wreckage. Vlad's fear was palpable as he realized this was no coincidence. Someone had set a trap for him, and he was the target. With no idea of who was behind the attack, Vlad could only flee in a desperate attempt to save his life. As soon as Vlad returned home, he wasted no time calling up his trusted subordinates to investigate who was behind the recent threats against him. He knew he couldn't take any chances with his safety, so he also brought in some extra muscle to protect him. Thanks to his years of experience and powerful connections in Meyerson, it didn't take long for Vlad to get to the bottom of things, but what he discovered left him feeling more than a little uneasy. As it turned out, a notorious gang leader had put a hit on him, and there was even rumors that it might be connected to Pitbull, one of the most feared and respected figures in the local underworld. Needless to say, Vlad was absolutely terrified. He couldn't understand how things had gone so wrong so quickly. Just a day ago, he had been on good terms with the local gangs. Now he was a marked man, a target for anyone looking to make a name for themselves on the streets. Who had he offended? There was Damon, of course, but that didn't make sense. He wasn't the boss of Astrobar anymore. He didn't have that kind of power, did he? Rumors started swirling around the city that Vlad's business was dirty. He was accused of everything under the sun, from fraud to sex trafficking to selling drugs. The worst accusations dealt with the Lily of the Valley Hospital. Former patients claimed their lives had been in danger, and they were forced into procedures that they hadn't consented to, and their medical bills were outrageous. When the news articles hit the scene, it was like a bomb went off in Vlad's world. His businesses, most under the banner of his company Fiesta Entertainment, were about to take a major hit. For the past two years, Vlad had been riding high on a wave of fake news and fake accounts, but now it seemed like his luck had finally run out. The question on everyone's mind was whether or not Fiesta Entertainment's stock could survive the onslaught. The attacks, both online and offline, had already taken their toll on the stock price, which had plummeted and showed no signs of stopping. Vlad was beside himself with frustration. Pitbull was a major player in Meyerson, but his influence was mostly limited to the underground dealings. If someone wanted to cripple the share price of Fiesta Entertainment in just a few days, they would need a big shot in the financial field to do it. Vlad was convinced that there was a financial tycoon out there who was trying to suppress the share price, and he was determined to find out who it was. The situation was dire. Was the suppression of Fiesta Entertainment international? Was someone out to destroy the company or seeking the revenge? The uncertainty was eating away at him. If the suppression was solely for profit, then perhaps the share price would eventually rise again. But if it was for revenge, it could mean the end of Fiesta Entertainment as he knew it. Vlad's recent actions suggested that he was after emptying the company's business for profits. With all the negative news surrounding the company, it was no surprise that the financial institutions were pulling out their money. What started as a few negative headlines quickly spiraled out of control. Vlad thought of his good friend, Carter Bostrich. Carter had always been there for Vlad, promising to stand by him through good times and bad. 
so when Vlad found himself in trouble, he knew he could count on his friend to come to his aid. Much to his surprise, when he called Carter, he was met with a cold and distant response. Hey, brother, how's it going? Vlad tried to keep his tone light and friendly, hoping to get a positive response from Carter. What's up? If you have something to say, say it quickly. I'm busy. Carter was harsh and impatient. Vlad swallowed his pride. Carter, I need your help. I'm in trouble, and I don't know what to do. Can you please help me? My company, Fiesta Entertainment, has recently encountered some trouble, and I want to ask you to lend me some money. Not much, just a few hundred million. When I have the money, I'll return it to you. Carter was less than thrilled. Screw you! You want to borrow money from me? I don't have money. Vlad couldn't believe it. He had helped Carter out in the past, and now when Vlad needed help, Carter was nowhere to be found. Carter, you worthless son of a witch! How could you do this to me? I thought we were brothers. Well, if you're going to be like that, don't expect me to be fair either. Vlad angrily ended the call. In reality, Carter was stuck in a sticky situation that made it impossible for him to lend a hand even if he wanted to. Carter had destroyed the Leahy company, but things didn't go as planned. The company didn't collapse, instead it rose to new heights thanks to the help of Edgar Gates, the financial tycoon. And that's when Carter's bad luck began. Recently, the men's basketball team in Meyerson had walked off the court, and they blamed the current captain for their misery. They demanded that Carter fire him and apologize to the entire team in public. When Carter refused, the basketball team pummeled him into a bloody pulp. Carter was a laughingstock of Meyerson. Before they boycotted the team, the players had been losing games left and right. If they kept playing like that, they might as well kiss their status as strong national professional basketball team goodbye. It's no wonder that all the basketball fans of the country are pointing fingers at Carter, blaming him for the team's failure. Some even said that Carter forced Xander to leave the team, and went as far as to injure his Achilles tendon out of revenge. But Xander was a fighter and managed to pull through. Now his team was their biggest rival. Carter had his own troubles to deal with. He didn't have time to listen to Vlad's petty concerns. All across the nation, the verbal abuse against Carter was like a raging river, threatening to drown him in a sea of hatred. The insults hurled at him were relentless, with people demanding that he apologize for his supposed crimes. It seemed like everyone had turned against him, with fans and even his own bodyguards selling him out. Everywhere he went, he was met with jeers and taunts. Carter was in a state of utter despair after the Meyerson professional basketball incident. But that was just the tip of the iceberg. His twisted plan involved using Scarlet as a pawn to take over the company's property, and even attempting to assault her at the Buena Vista Hotel. Scarlet's father, Don Leahy, had always been there to bail him out of countless crises. But never did he imagine that Carter would stoop so low. Carter's true nature was finally exposed, and the financial tycoons wasted no time selling off his company's shares. The once mighty empire crumbled before his very eyes. Carter was left scrambling for funds, begging his grandparents for help. But to add insult to injury, the conniving Vlad saw this as an opportunity to extort him. Carter thought that Vlad was his friend, how could Vlad even think about asking for money at a time like this? Who would have thought that Vlad was so persistent? Even after being rejected by Carter, he continued to call him. Carter's annoyance was evident as he answered the call, muttering insults under his breath. But Vlad was undeterred and shouted back with all of his might. Carter, impatient as ever, demanded that Vlad get to the point. And then out of nowhere, Vlad dropped a bombshell. He threatened to expose more of Carter's wrongdoings, but he stood his ground and refused to help Vlad. Vlad's response was cold and calculated. He warned Carter not to blame him for what was about to happen. Carter was furious. He dared Vlad to come and face him like a man. And with that, Vlad hung up. Carter was a little worried. After all, the two of them enjoyed drinking together and often shared secrets after one too many tequila shots. But then Carter remembered that Vlad wasn't exactly squeaky clean either. If Vlad dared to double cross him, Carter would not hesitate to retaliate. However, Vlad was the ruthless businessman who would stop at nothing for a quick buck. Carter underestimated him. His company's plummeting market value had already raised eyebrows among shareholders, but Vlad didn't care about his reputation as long as he had money in his pocket. Vlad was so desperate for cash, he was willing to take down anyone in his path, even if it meant dragging Carter down with him. Carter was in for a rude awakening. The next day, Vlad hired people to spread the word about Carter like wildfire across all major news websites. 
One juicy piece of gossip was that Carter had allegedly assaulted a B-less celebrity. There is even a video to prove it. But that wasn't all. The news also painted Carter as a complete and utter loser. Apparently, he had been a dimwit since he was a kid, and the only reason he was accepted to Meyerson University was because he cheated by buying the answers, and his parents greased the wheels with their cash. His parents had even bankrolled his entire startup company. But they were just lowly civil servants, so where did they get all their money? The only logical explanation was corruption. The video of Carter assaulting the celebrity was high definition. Vlad had access to the video because he was the one who recorded it. Carter thought Vlad had deleted the video, but Vlad never followed through. Now he didn't hesitate to leak it to the press. Netizens called for Carter to be investigated and prosecuted. Carter wasn't going to take this lying down. Carter also had quite a bit of information regarding Vlad's company. He knew how to fight fire with fire. Carter was furious and ready to expose everything about Vlad, including the financial fraud problem at Fiesta Entertainment. It turns out that Vlad had been living the high life for years, too busy partying to take care of business. But he made up for it by cooking the books and making false accounts, keeping the company's records looking pristine. Unfortunately for Vlad, his luck had run out when he lost over a billion at a casino. To cover his losses, he secretly used the company's funds. Carter had even revealed that the allegations that he assaulted a celebrity were true, but the reason why Vlad had the video was because he had also participated in it. Furthermore, Carter also had video as evidence. Vlad was despicable and Carter was just as sneaky. Back then, the two of them said they would delete the video, but they saved the video at the same time. The share prices of Carter and Vlad's companies took a nosedive so steep that it was almost too painful to watch. Vlad's company was now under investigation by the authorities, Carter's revelations were confirmed one by one, exposing financial fraud at the Fiesta Entertainment. Vlad's use of public funds for gambling and the company's cash flow drying up. Needless to say, both Carter and Vlad were feeling the heat. Fans of Carter's basketball team are digging up the dirt on him left and right. That paled in comparison to the bombshell that Carter and Vlad were accused of drugging women. However, what truly shook Carter's foundation was the series of dark secrets that Vlad revealed about his parents accepting bribes and sponsoring his company. Carter, you bastard. Let's see how long you could show off now. At most, my company will close down, but your whole family will have to go to jail. Vlad hissed under his breath. Vlad was holed up at home, smoking and drinking, feeling a twisted sense of satisfaction. But his peace was short-lived. Suddenly, there was a loud banging on the door, and Vlad's expression turned ugly. Vlad had been living in fear ever since he found out that gangsters from all over Meyerson were after him. He had been cooped up in his home, too scared to even step outside. But just when he thought he was safe, trouble came knocking at his door. Two burly bodyguards had just arrived to protect him when the door was kicked open. In stormed Carter, accompanied by a dozen or so henchmen. Vlad! Vlad, where is that bastard? Get the hell out of here! He bellowed. Vlad's eyes widened when he saw Carter. He knew he was in deep trouble. Carter pointed at Vlad's nose and scolded him. Vlad, you jerk! I thought we were friends! But I didn't expect you to stab me in the back! Screw you! Vlad shouted. We were supposed to support one another. I asked you for money and you declined. Even though I know you have it. If the situation was reversed, I would have lent you the money in a heartbeat. Carter was fuming. I wouldn't lend you a penny, even if I had a million bucks. Having a friend like you is a curse that will haunt me for eight lifetimes. He gestured wildly, his eyes blazing with fury. Get him! Kill him! A swarm of lackeys charged toward Vlad, but he was no pushover. With a flick of his wrist, a dozen burly security guards appeared out of nowhere, ready to defend him. The clash between the two groups is like a meteor strike, sending shockwaves through the entire house. Walls crumbled, furniture shattered, and glass broke into a million pieces. Carter had brought a dozen thugs with him, but Vlad's crew was no less formidable. The two sides were evenly matched, but with Vlad leading the charge, they quickly gained the upper hand. Whoa, this guy could fight! Carter sneered, his eyes glinting with malice. He had suspected that Vlad had a few tricks up his sleeve, so he had stationed a group of his men outside, waiting for the signal to strike. Plus, after getting roughed up by some basketball players, Carter had been working on his fighting skills. But Vlad was no easy target. Despite being outnumbered, he fought like a warrior, taking down his opponents with ease. Carter's men were caught off guard, stunned by Vlad's prowess. They had expected to take him down in a matter of minutes, but they had underestimated his strength and skill. The battle had come to an end. Vlad and Carter's faces were covered in bruises as they caught their breath. Carter couldn't help but wonder 
how they had ended up in such a mess. Vlad, on the other hand, was more concerned about the reason behind the chaos. Why did you cause such a ruckus? He asked Carter, puzzled. All I asked for was money. My money evaporated. It was taken away by a monster. Carter said through gritted teeth. His eyes were filled with hatred as he spoke of the culprit behind his financial woes. Edgar Gates, he spat out. But I've done some digging, and I know there's someone else pulling the strings. Vlad was shocked by the mention of Edgar Gates. Who do you think is behind him? He asked, intrigued. Carter's response was swift and certain. It's Damon Walker. Carter's intelligence network was top-notch. When Carter received the news, he was floored. He never imagined Damon to be this powerful. After all, he was like a phoenix that had been knocked down by Astromar's closure. But now it seemed like he had risen from the ashes even stronger than before. Damon! Vlad's face twisted in disbelief. Are you sure? Carter nodded gravely. I'm not 100% sure, but it's highly likely. Vlad couldn't believe it. I thought that guy had moved on from his grudges, but it looks like he's been playing possum all along. Carter's eyes widened. Wait, have you crossed paths with Damon too? Vlad's mind was racing as he realized his mistake. He had misunderstood Carter all along. It wasn't that Carter didn't want to help him, but rather that he was stuck in a quagmire of his own. Vlad couldn't help but blame himself for being too impulsive and starting a war with Carter. But it was too late for regrets now. They needed to find a solution to their problems. Damn it! It's all because of Damon! I'll bring him down even if it means sacrificing my own family! Vlad exclaimed, his anger boiling over. But Carter had a valid point. What about the company? Vlad thought about it. The company's a sinking ship. We'll have to sell it at a low price. But first, I need to take care of Damon. Money means nothing if he's still in power. Once he's out of the picture, we won't have to worry about anything else. Carter nodded in agreement. You're damn right, Vlad. That jerk made our lives a living hell. It's time for him to pay the price. Vlad's sinister laughter echoed through the room. I won't let Damon have the last laugh, even if it kills me. Despite their valiant efforts, Carter and Vlad's company found themselves trapped in a web of powerful adversaries. Damon, Pitbull, Edgar, and even the government's top dogs had them cornered, leaving them with no choice but to succumb to the inevitable fate of being bought out. To make matters worse, the bank was even threatening to auction off their companies due to their lack of funds. The market was abuzz with rumors that the two companies were on the brink of collapse, and no one was willing to take a chance on them. It seemed like a lost cause, a futile effort to invest in a sinking ship. But then, like a bolt from the blue, Damon and Edgar swooped in and seized the opportunity. They bought the shares of the struggling companies at a bargain price and took control of the market. It was a master stroke, a shrewd move that left everyone in awe. In the end, Carter and Vlad's companies may have been defeated, but Damon and Edgar emerged victorious, having secured a massive deal that would change the course of the market forever. As soon as he stepped through the door, Damon couldn't wait to tell Fifi about Vlad's company. Fifi's face lit up with joy at the news. She was always grateful for Vlad's help in the past, but she wasn't about to let anyone mess with her son. Join me in accepting the company tomorrow. You could be the boss of Fiesta Entertainment. Damon exclaimed, his eyes shining with excitement. But Fifi wasn't so sure. I don't know anything about entertainment. What if I run the company into the ground? Damon just grinned. Who cares if it fails? We have plenty of money to fall back on. But Fifi wasn't convinced. No way. We can't forget our tough times. Every penny must be spent wisely. Fifi knew the value of hard work and thriftiness. No matter how rich they were, they couldn't afford to be careless with their money. The next morning, Damon and Fifi hopped on the back of the scooter and made their way to Fiesta Entertainment offices. As he approached, he noticed a flurry of activity outside the gates. Employees were shuffling out with boxes in hand, a clear sign that the company was in dire straits. Negative news had taken its toll, and the once thriving business was now failing. Fifi couldn't help but feel a sense of sadness wash over her as she took in the scene. She remembered the days when Fiesta Entertainment was the talk of the town, and it was hard to believe that it had all come crashing down so quickly. It was a stark reminder that even the brightest stars could fall from the sky. But then she looked at Damon, and her heart swelled with gratitude. He was the one constant in her life, the one who would always be there to protect her from the storm. With him by her side, she knew that she would never have to worry about the dangers that lurked outside. He was her safe haven, her happy place, and the father of their future children. As she snuggled up to him, Fifi couldn't help but let her thoughts wander. Cupcake? She murmured. We, we... 
Damon looked down at her with a smile. What's on your mind, my love? Fifi blushed and giggled. When... When do you think we should have more babies? Damon's eyes widened in surprise as he turned to Fifi. You still want more babies? He asked incredulous. Fifi's cheeks flushed with embarrassment as she shushed him, afraid someone might overhear. Don't say it so loudly. But Damon was curious. How many do you want to give birth to? He asked. Fifi hesitated for a moment before answering. Five, okay? She felt a little embarrassed to admit it, but she couldn't help the longing in her heart. Damon chuckled. Do you want to open a kindergarten? He teased, amused by Fifi's sudden desire for a big family. Fifi's eyes lit up at that idea. Oh, I'm going to open a kindergarten, she exclaimed. I'll be the director and you'll be the teacher. You have to teach the babies well. If they complain to me, I, the director, will punish you. Do you hear me? She joked. Damon laughed, enjoying Fifi's playful spirit. What do you think? She asked, her eyes sparkling with mischief. Damon stroked her hair. We can try if that's what you want. Fifi ducked her head shyly. I'd like that very much. As Damon and Fifi made their way to the entrance of the Fiesta Entertainment building, they couldn't help but notice a familiar figure standing before them. It was none other than Damon's old classmate, Theo. But something was off. Theo's face was twisted in an ugly expression, and his hair had turned white. As they approached him, they noticed two women standing opposite of him. One was a younger woman, who Damon recognized as Theo's wife, Willow. The other woman was older, with white hair, and Damon couldn't quite place her. Just as Damon was about to greet his old friend, he overheard Theo pleading with the older woman. Give me another chance. Don't take Willow away, okay? I'm begging you. The older woman narrowed her eyes. Our Willow has followed you for so many years. What could she get from suffering every day? And what did you promise my daughter back then? You said you would give Willow a good life. What kind of good life did you give her? Willow was quick to defend Theo. Mom, he's been working hard. Can't you give him another chance? I believe he can do better. But her mother wasn't convinced. Willow, I gave him a chance five years ago. He hasn't made any progress and even lost his job. He can't even afford a house, and you had to rent one for him. What do you expect? The words hit Theo and Willow hard. It was true. Meyerson was a cutthroat city where money ruled all. Without it, one could easily fall to the bottom of the valley. And that's exactly where Theo found himself now. Theo had been grinding away for years, hustling and working his way up the ladder. His income had grown steadily, but despite his success, the exorbitant property prices in Meyerson made it feel like he was barely scraping by. To make matters worse, Theo suspected that his boss was threatened by his talent. His superior had been stealing credit and suppressing Theo's potential for years, but Theo's business acumen was too strong to ignore. His boss couldn't afford to let him go, but that didn't stop him from making Theo's life miserable. Recently, his superior made a mistake and blamed it on Theo, destroying Theo's hope for a promotion. Unfortunately, at the same time, Willow's father fell ill and needed dialysis treatment. Theo had planned to foot the medical bills, but his job was making it nearly impossible. Still, Theo gritted his teeth and endured. In the past two days, Theo's company had been hit hard. Their share prices had plummeted, and their business was in shambles. To make matters worse, their partners had pulled out, leaving them in a dire financial situation. The company was bleeding money, and they had no choice but to let go of some of their employees. Theo was the first head on the chopping block. Willow, please don't think I'm being cruel. Everything I've done has been for your own good. Her mother pleaded, tears streaming down her face. Willow was a stunning woman, with an education and culture that set her apart from the rest. Her beauty had caught the eye of many men in their small city, all vying for her attention. If she were to return home and marry a wealthy man, her future would be one of luxury and comfort. So why was she still suffering in Meyerson with Theo? Looking at her daughter, she continued, Just look at your life now. You can't even afford to pay rent. If only you had listened to me and married Benji when you had the chance, everything would be different. He lives in a mansion and has money to spare. Your father is sick. Theo can't provide for us. The mention of her father hit Willow like a ton of bricks. Seeing the pain in her daughter's eyes, Willow's mother softened her tone. If you still care for your father and me, can't you come home? Benji has been asking about you and even offered to pay for your father's treatment. He's recently divorced and still has feelings for you. Willow shook her head, her eyes filled with determination. 
Mom, you have to trust Theo. He won't let me down. Give him some time and he'll come up with a plan to pay for Dad's treatment. Theo nodded vigorously. I'll find a way to make things right. We'll get through this, I promise. But Willow's mother wasn't convinced. If you have any conscience left, you'll let Willow go with me. You're already fallen into the fire pit. Don't drag our daughter down with you. Willow struggled to break free from her mother's grip. Please let me make my own decisions. I love Theo and I believe in him. Her mother fell to her knees, tears streaming down her face. Theo, we only have one daughter. Let her come back to us. If you can't pay for her father's treatment, at least let her spend his last days with him. Theo's eyes were dull with defeat. He never imagined that Willow's mother would want her to leave him. I've let you down, and I've let Willow down. He said, his voice trembling. But I swear, I'll make things right. Willow can go back with you, and I'll figure out how to pay for the dialysis treatments. I just don't want a divorce. Willow's heart ached as she watched the man she loved plead with her mother. Willow's mother nodded. All right, all right. Just promise me that you'll let Willow go, and I'll make sure she doesn't marry anyone else. This was the only first step in her plan to bring her daughter back home. Once Willow was back in her grasp, she would do everything in her power to convince her to leave Theo. Theo turned to Willow with a solemn expression. Your father is seriously ill, Willow. It's only natural that you go back and take care of him. Willow was torn between her love for her husband and her duty to her family. Both were equally important to her, but Theo's words and her parents' expectations weighed heavily on her, and she could only nod and say, Okay, I'll go take care of him. Don't worry, everything else will be fine. Theo reassured her with a firm voice. As Willow and her mother left in a taxi, Theo couldn't help but feel a deep sense of sadness wash over him. He had lost his job and now his wife had been taken away by his mother-in-law. He didn't know if they would ever be reunited again. But what concerned him the most was that he still had to pay for his father-in-law's medical expenses. How was he going to come up with the money? Theo had promised Willow a bright future, and when he made that vow, his heart was bursting with ambition. But now reality had crushed his dreams, and he was just an ordinary guy. He couldn't even solve Willow's housing or family health problems. It was a helpless feeling, and Damon, who was watching from the car, felt the same sadness. Life was unpredictable. Money often tore couples apart, but Willow's love for Theo remained strong, even in their dire circumstances. Damon couldn't help but think of his own precious Fifi, who had stood by him through thick and thin, and even when she thought he was dead. She had sacrificed so much for his family and their son. Damon leaned in and kissed Fifi, and she knew exactly what he was thinking. Cupcake, do you want to help him? She asked. Damon nodded resolutely. It's the right thing to do. He stepped out of the car. Theo. As Theo sat in despair, he heard a soft voice calling out to him. He looked up to see Damon and Fifi. At first, Theo was stunned, but he soon laughed and greeted Damon with a warm embrace. A long time no see, brother. Sorry to let you see my embarrassing side. Damon didn't waste any time. What's going on? Theo nervously replied. You heard everything just now, right? I did. Damon said. Damon could feel the pain in his friend's heart and comforted him with a pat on the back. How about we grab a bite to eat? He suggested. My treat. Theo was touched by Damon's generosity, but he didn't want to waste money. He knew Damon was no longer the old boss of Astromar and was also struggling financially. However, Damon smiled and said, Don't worry about it. Let's just talk. Damon pulled Theo into the restaurant. The aroma of sizzling steaks and freshly baked bread filled the air but Theo couldn't bring himself to enjoy it. After the plates were in front of them, Damon leaned in and asked what was going on. Theo clenched his jaw, holding back the tears that threatened to spill over. Finally, he spoke, his voice barely above a whisper. The company I was working for, Fiesta Entertainment, collapsed. My boss had always been threatened by my skills, but this time he found an excuse to let me go. I begged him to reconsider, but he just laughed in my face and kicked me out. Theo grinned sheepishly. Remember when I was about to hop on that train after graduating from university? Willow chased after me, saying she believed in me and that I'd bring her a beautiful future. But look at me now, living like this. Talk about irony. Damon listened silently, feeling a twinge of helplessness. He never imagined that his actions against Vlad would have such a ripple effect on Theo's life. So, what's your plan? Damon asked, hoping to offer some guidance. Theo was at a loss. He stared blankly at Damon before admitting, I...
Don't know. I guess the first step is finding a job. Damon pressed further. And what about the money for your father-in-law's treatment? Theo bit his lip. He considered asking Damon for a loan, but he knew Damon was struggling too. Damon lowered his voice. You said that you worked for Fiesta Entertainment. Theo frowned. Yes, I've been working there for the past few years. I thought I was on track for a promotion, but the company was bought out, and everything is a mess. Damon raised an eyebrow at Theo. Listening to your confident tone, I don't doubt that you could handle the role of general manager with ease. He said, challenging Theo to prove him wrong. Not a problem, Theo replied. But what's the use of saying all this? The company is already bankrupt. I wouldn't be so quick to walk away. Damon said mysteriously. Theo scowled. It's not the time for jokes, man. Fifi chimed in. Theo, you're not going to believe this. Damon just bought Fiesta Entertainment, and he's planning on shaking things up with a major reconstructing. Damon grinned. And here's the best part, Theo. I want to promote you to general manager. That's right. I'll be handing over full control of Fiesta Entertainment to you. Theo's jaw dropped. Wait, what? You're the boss of Fiesta Entertainment? He stammered, struggling to process the news. Damon chuckled. Yep, that's right. When you're finished eating, I'd love to visit the office with you. Oh, and by the way, you mentioned that your old boss fired you. Well, now you can tell him to hit the road. Theo felt a twinge of guilt at the thought of getting revenge. But isn't that a bit low? He asked. Damon shook his head, his expression serious. No, my friend. Letting these vile people get away with their actions will only encourage them to keep messing with people. We need to stand up for ourselves and show them that we won't be pushed around. Damon was right. It was frustrating to repay kindness with kindness, but only to be seen as weak and bullied. Damon put down his fork and dragged Theo to the Fiesta Entertainment offices. As they approached the company, they saw that Edgar had already sent a team to take over. But to ensure a smooth transition, some of the higher-ups were staying on. Theo's boss was among them. As Damon strolled through the lobby, a few security guards eyed him suspiciously. Their electric batons were at the ready, daring anyone to cause trouble. But Damon wasn't phased. He knew he had nothing to fear. After all, he was the current boss of the company. When he announced his name to the receptionist, her face went through a series of emotions. Shock, disbelief, and finally, admiration. She couldn't believe that someone so young and handsome could be in charge. The bodyguards were equally stunned, taking a step back in awe. Just then, Edgar's team appeared, greeting Damon with respect. The receptionist couldn't help but steal a glance at him, and as she did, she realized that Damon was even more attractive than she had first thought. Fifi's eyes narrowed as she caught the receptionist winking at Damon. She had confidence in her man. However, her anger flared up when she saw Damon flirting with other girls. It wasn't his fault, but it still didn't sit right with her. As jealousy bubbled up inside her, Fifi couldn't resist giving Damon a sneaky pinch. Meanwhile, Theo watched on, his heart swelling with pride as he saw the respect the entire team had for Damon. At first, he had been skeptical of Damon's claims, but now he knew better. Damon had always possessed an incredible strength. After all, this man had created Astromar from nothing, and now he could easily buy out Fiesta Entertainment. Damon nudged Theo, a glint in his eye. Who's your superior? He asked. Let's go find them. Damon made his way upstairs to the department where Theo used to work. As he approached the door, he heard a roar from inside. Why are you so useless? Do you want to be fired like Theo? The tension in the air was palpable as the staff member whispered. Boss, this is your mistake. We helped you cover it up. You can't just turn on us like this, all right? But the boss wasn't having any of it. Ta! Do you want to challenge my authority? I have the right to fire anyone, and now I'm firing you. The employee begged the boss, Please, I have a family, I have bills to pay. Damon winced as he heard a miserable scream, and an employee was kicked out of the room. Damon hid behind a potted plant and continued to eavesdrop. He quickly realized that there was another employee still in the boss's office. The boss's tone turned lecherous. So, you're one of my top female employees. You saw what happened to your colleagues. If you sleep with me, maybe you can keep your job. I have a husband. The employee whimpered. The boss slammed a hand on his desk. Are you pretending to be pure? The economy is tough and everyone knows it. You can't afford to lose your job just because you're unwilling to do what I say. I won't do it. The woman said defiantly. 
Damn it, you witch! Get lost! And don't bother coming back to work tomorrow! The woman ran out of the office, covering her face and crying. Damon stormed into the office with a steely expression. A bald man with big ears stood near the window. He whirled around when he saw Damon. Who are you? You can't just barge into my office! He noticed Theo standing behind Damon. The man's ferocious smile sent shivers down Theo's spine. Ah, Theo, my old friend! The man sneered. Are you back because you can't find a job anywhere else? Damon clenched his hand into fists. Don't talk to Theo that way. I'm Theo Superior, the man replied, his voice dripping with disdain. And who are you? Are you here to support Theo? If you know what's good for you, you better leave now. Damon wasn't one for small talk. I'm the new CEO of Fiesta Entertainment, and you're fired. The man rolled his eyes, clearly not believing Damon's claim. You can't just waltz in here and make a false claim. I'll call security. Damon took a bold step forward and delivered a resounding slap. The sound echoed through the office as the man let out a blood-curdling scream and crumpled to the ground like a sack of potatoes. As the man stumbled out of the room, the silence was deafening. Theo, who had been watching the whole scene unfold, looked at Damon with gratitude in his eyes. In the future, you won't have to worry about that guy. Damon assured him, but before he could leave, the bald man and two security guards burst back into the room, accusing Damon of assault. The guards were fierce at first, but when they saw Damon, they straightened up and saluted him like he was king. The bald man was confused, but an older security guard quickly set him straight. This is our new boss, Mr. Damon Walker, he exclaimed. The bald man's expression changed from confusion to charm as he quickly apologized for his mistake. I'm sorry, I didn't know you were here. If I knew it was you, I wouldn't dare to be so arrogant. Damon was fed up with him. He turned to the two burly security guards and barked. Get rid of him. He's fired. The guards knew exactly what to do. They grabbed the man by the scruff of his neck and tried to haul him out, but he was putting up a hell of a fight. The guards were starting to worry that they looked bad in front of their new boss, so they resorted to using their electric batons to subdue the man. He screamed and writhed in agony before finally passing out. Congratulations, Theo. You're the new general manager of Fiesta Entertainment. The future of this company is in your hands, so don't screw up. Damon said, beaming with pride. Uh, okay. Okay. Theo was in shock. He couldn't believe what was happening. Damon had been worried about who would take over the company, and he was glad that Theo stepped up to the plate. It was a surprise to everyone, especially Theo himself. Just two hours ago, he was on the brink of collapse, but now he was on top of the world as the new boss of Fiesta Entertainment. Damon can see the determination in Theo's eyes, and he knew that he was up for the challenge. Work hard and make me proud, Damon said, patting Theo on the shoulder. I will, and I'll make sure Fiesta Entertainment returns to its peak. Theo was determined to repay Damon. He knew that he had to seize this opportunity with both hands. If he could succeed, his life would change drastically for the better. But if he failed, he would be lost forever. There was no room for error, and Theo was ready to give it his all. After saying goodbye to Theo, Damon brought Fifi back home. Along the way, Fifi snuggled in Damon's arms. A sense of pride arose in her. However, Fifi couldn't shake off the uncomfortable feeling she had when she saw the receptionist flirting with Damon. She hugged him tighter and said, Cupcake, you better not flirt with other women in the future. Do you hear me? Damon understood where Fifi was coming from. My good wife, I promise to be faithful to you. But what do you want me to do, never leave the house? Fifi pouted and said, But did you see that receptionist? She was winking at you. What if you get seduced away from me? Damon stopped the electric scooter and hugged Fifi tightly. Silly. In this life, I only belong to you. Fifi tried to believe him. She wrapped her arms around him, grateful that he was back in her life. Damon was initially worried about the future direction of Fiesta Entertainment's entertainment offerings. But little did he know, Theo had a powerful ally to take control of the situation and turn things around. Under Theo's leadership, Fiesta Entertainment underwent a drastic transformation. In just two short weeks, they reorganized all their business operations. Some of the previously struggling ventures even began to turn a profit. Despite opposition from some of the board members, Theo had Damon's unwavering support. Anyone who dared to challenge Theo's authority was swiftly dealt with by Damon. Fiesta Entertainment was back on track and had a huge chance of success. When Damon caught up with Theo, he saw the man hard at work with deep circles under his eyes. But even in his exhaustion, 
Theo was brimming with energy and passion for his career. Damon admired his dedication. There's no need to work so hard. Theo laughed. No way. I'm not even tired. Plus, the company is in shambles and there are so many issues that need to be addressed. But once we get through this busy period, everything will be smooth sailing. Damon smiled, knowing he couldn't argue with Theo's enthusiasm. Let's take a break and grab a bite to eat with Xander, he suggested. Damon's sleek Bentley took them to Meyerson University's campus. It had been six years since Damon had left the university, and returning felt like a trip down memory lane. As they drove onto campus, they noticed that it was a buzz of activity. It was the 110th anniversary of Meyerson University, and the celebrations were already in full swing. Damon couldn't help but reminisce about the 105th anniversary, where he had caused quite a stir as a guest. They passed by the Financial College and College of Music. Suddenly, Xander had an idea. Hey, why don't we call our old professor and ask him out for a meal? He suggested, pulling out his phone. Unfortunately, the call didn't go through. It looks like Mr. Joins is still busy, Xander said, disappointed. But I know he goes to the cafeteria for lunch every day at noon. Let's wait for him there. Suddenly, a group of students caught sight of Xander and started whispering excitedly, Wow, look at Xander! They exclaimed, pointing in his direction. A handsome boy ran over, clutching a pen and paper tightly in his hands. Excuse me, sir, he said, but are you Xander Burtonshaw? Xander flashed a faint smile. Yeah, that's me. Hello there. The group of young men standing nearby erupted into cheers upon hearing Xander's confirmation. The handsome boy stepped forward, his eyes filled with admiration. I'm a huge fan, he gushed. Could I please have your autograph? Xander graciously signed their autograph, basking in the glow of their adoration. Suddenly, another boy approached Theo with a cautious expression on his face. Excuse me, he said tentatively, but are you Mr. Theo Rand? Theo was taken aback. Yeah, that's me. Do I know you? The boy's face lit up with excitement. Wow, you are Theo. My father recently bought shares in your company and made a huge profit. You're amazing. Turning the tide and saving Fiesta Entertainment. Theo bashfully signed an autograph. He was unaccustomed of being in the spotlight. Excuse me, Mr. Rand. A timid voice spoke up. We're senior students for the financial college and we're graduating this year. We were wondering if we could come to your company for our internship. Theo and Damon exchanged a glance. Even though Theo was the boss, he respected Damon's opinion. Damon gave Theo an encouraging nod. Absolutely, he said. As long as you have a sharp eye for business, we'd love to have you apply. The students eagerly exchanged contact details with Theo. While Meyerson University had a good reputation for producing successful graduates, the current job market was tough. So landing a top-notch internship like this could be a game changer for their future careers. As the students walked away, their voices still carried on the wind, their conversation far from over. One of the girls piped up. Hey, did anyone notice the quiet guy standing next to Theo and Xander? Another girl nodded. Oh yeah, he's easy on the eyes. But the first girl shook her head. No, no, no. I mean, doesn't he look familiar to you guys? What are you talking about? Asked an innocent looking girl. Damon! The first girl exclaimed. The others looked at her blankly, prompting her to explain further. Okay, so like over 10 years ago, there was this super famous singer named Ryan Gold. He sang Time Flies, remember? Well, Damon Walker was also, like, the most legendary male broadcaster in the history of the campus radio station. And there were even rumors about him being a basketball god. Another boy chimed in. And if you're a fan of Xander, you should know that Damon was his mentor when it comes to basketball. Xander even admitted it himself. The girls were all in shock. Their eyes glued to Damon as they tried to process the information. The more they looked, the more they saw the resemblance. And when the sun hit him just right, he looked downright handsome. Could it be him? They whispered in disbelief. But of course, there was always one skeptic in the group. Doubtful, one of the boys scoffed. I heard he died like five years ago. As the students gawked at Damon, his old professor, Dr. Joins, strolled out of the financial college building. As usual, he sported a pair of glasses and wore a sharp suit. Xander quickly went up to greet him. Dr. Joins! He looked up to see Xander grinning from ear to ear. Xander! Why didn't you give me a heads up when you came to school? The professor asked, surprised. Xander chuckled. I came at the last minute. I didn't want to bother you, but since you didn't pick up my call, I figured you must be done with class by now. 
So here I am for a little reunion with some old classmates, and we're treating you to a meal. Doctor Joins furrowed his brow. Which classmates? Xander's cohort was one of the most successful ones that Dr. Jones had ever taught. He had a lot of pride in their achievements. Theo Rand, myself, and a mysterious guest. Xander replied, leading Dr. Joins toward the group. Xander walked over to Theo and said, Dr. Joins, look who it is. Dr. Joins nodded in recognition. The new boss of Fiesta Entertainment. It's been in all the papers. Impressive. He wasn't one to gush or grovel at the feet of successful people. To him, every student was equal, regardless of their background or status. Late at night, Dr. Joins would often reflect on his teaching career and feel a sense of pride knowing that he had helped shape the minds of so many brilliant students. He never wanted to hold on to his students too tightly or compromise his values, which is why he had been promoted to tenured professor in recent years. Despite this, he had earned the nickname Old Scholar, a title used by some to mock him for being pedantic and sarcastic. But for the most part, it was a term of endearment that affirmed his integrity as a teacher. However, as soon as Dr. Joins laid eyes on Damon, his jaw dropped and his face twisted in shock. It was as if he had seen a ghost, and in a way he had. Damon was once his most promising student, but after a devastating shipwreck, he disappeared from the academic world. Yet here he was, standing right in front of him. If it wasn't Damon, then the resemblance was uncanny. Without missing a beat, Damon greeted his former professor. Dr. Joins, don't tell me you've already forgotten me. The poor old man can barely get a word out. D damon But, but... Everyone knew what he was thinking. Xander spoke up. Damon's alive and well. He's back and better than ever. Dr. Joins is feeling a bit woozy. Damon's death had been the talk of the entire town. When the news reached Dr. Joins, he was in a funk for days. He never imagined that Damon could have survived such a disaster. But Damon was alive. Dr. Joins was over the moon with excitement. He eagerly agreed to accompany them to the cafeteria. Though he tried not to show favoritism, Dr. Joins was ecstatic to find out where Damon had been all these years. The cafeteria at Meyerson University had seen it all over the years. It was a hub of activity especially for students of the financial college who couldn't resist its delicious offerings. Damon, Theo, and Xander were among the many who frequented the place year after year. Dr. Joins turned to Xander, concerned about his foot. How's it doing now? Will it be all right? Xander grinned. It's been healed for a while now. He even jumped a few times to prove it. Dr. Joins was amazed. Xander's Achilles tendon rupture had healed beyond his expectations. Dr. Joins then looked at Theo. Theo, I heard you're the president of a listed company. Theo nodded, ready to speak, but Dr. Joins cut him off with a burst of enthusiasm. Good, good, good. You're all incredibly talented. Not only am I proud, but the school's proud of you too. Just as he was about to turn to Damon, Dr. Joins remembered that Damon had been away for years and that Astamar had already been dismantled. Damon, where have you been all this time? We heard you were in a shipwreck that made headlines around the world. It's a long story, Damon replied, and they all sat down to eat. As they chowed down, Damon regaled them with tales of his journey, careful not to give them too many secret details. Dr. Joins listened intently, his expression turning solemn. It's destiny, Damon, destiny. I know you'll get back on track in no time. Everyone knew Dr. Joins was trying to comfort Damon. After all, it was already impressive for a young man to create one successful business, let alone a second. Damon just smiled and didn't say anything. Dr. Joins face lit up with excitement as he chatted away about his recent career and the incredible achievements of his former students. Levi had skyrocketed his stardom in the music industry, while Xander had made a name for himself in the world of basketball. He was particularly pleased with Scarlett and Theo, who had both achieved incredible success in their own right. As they reminisced about old times, Dr. Joins couldn't help but bring up Quinn, the CEO of Astromar. However, both Theo and Xander quickly avoided the topic, as if it were some sort of taboo. After a delicious meal, the group took a stroll around campus, reliving old memories and sharing plenty of laughs. Before they said their goodbyes, Dr. Joins pulled Damon aside. Life is never smooth sailing, he said. True heroes are those who face adversity head on. Never give up and rise again from the ashes. Remember that, Damon. 
Damon shook Dr. Join's hand, then got in the car with his friends. Damon asked Theo, how are things with Willow? Theo said, I transferred a sum of money to her a few days ago as a medical fee for my father-in-law. I haven't been able to contact Willow recently. Speaking of this, Theo was a little worried. Why don't we pay her a visit? Damon suggested. Theo tapped his finger against his chin. Hmm, that's not a bad idea. Hey Damon, do you know where Quinn is? Damon shook his head. I haven't heard anything about him since before my disappearance. I thought about trying to find him to discuss what happened with Astromar, but I've had a lot on my plate recently. Theo nodded. Well, Willow's hometown is in New Portsmouth, and Quinn is also in New Portsmouth. Damon asked, what is Quinn doing in New Portsmouth? Xander chimed in. You don't know what Quinn is up to these days? Damon shook his head, and Theo couldn't believe it. Quinn is running Sea Home Holdings, LLC. It used to belong to Astromar, but now Quinn is in charge. Theo paused, looking like he wanted to say more. What's the matter? Damon asked. Theo hesitated before speaking. Damon, do you still have shares in Astromar? Because if you do, you may want to reconsider. Damon's eyes widen. What do you mean? Well, Quinn has changed. Xander said, his voice low. He's not the same person he used to be. Damon leaned in, intrigued. What do you mean? What's going on with Quinn? Theo and Xander exchanged a look, unsure if they should say more. But finally, Theo spoke up. Let's just say he's not exactly playing by the rules anymore. Hey, how about a trip up to New Portsmouth with me? Theo suggested. You can finally talk to Quinn face to face and get some answers about Astromar. Damon had been itching to confront Quinn about the division of the company for a while now. As the biggest shareholder, he had given Quinn some shares but he couldn't shake the feeling that something had gone awry. What role did he play in the company's fate? With a sense of urgency, Damon and Theo boarded the flight to New Portsmouth. Theo had been trying to reach Willow, but all his attempts had gone unanswered. Fearful that something might have happened to her, Theo was determined to find her. Damon had his agenda. He wanted to find Quinn to ask him in person about the split of Astromar. Unfortunately, they didn't have Quinn's contact information but Damon was not one to be deterred. Quinn was a public figure. They'd be able to track him down eventually. Damon asked Pitbull to book the plane tickets, but little did Damon know that Pitbull had a few tricks up his sleeve. He told Edgar about the trip, and before they knew it, they were flying in a private jet. As they landed in New Portsmouth, Damon wanted to keep a low profile, but Pitbull had already spilled the beans and sent a motorcade to greet them. These guys were no joke. Their cars were low-key, but their license plates commanded respect. If they stamped their feet, the whole city would shake. The important people of New Portsmouth bowed in unison, and Theo almost fell to the ground in shock. He couldn't believe what he was seeing. Damon was like a ruler, commanding respect and admiration from everyone around him. Theo knew that Damon was powerful, but this was a whole other level. Damon was surprised by the grand reception that awaited him. He couldn't believe that his father and grandfather had achieved such unimaginable success after years of hard work. He wondered how much more strength lay hidden behind them. But despite the overwhelming welcome, Damon preferred to stay humble. He simply asked the group to take him to the hotel he had booked beforehand. Little did he know that Pitbull had booked the presidential suite of the most luxurious hotel in New Portsmouth. Damon was impressed but not surprised. Pitbull always put an extra mile. After they settled into the hotel, Theo couldn't help but express his admiration for Damon. Damn, you never cease to amaze me. Damon chuckled and asked, What should we do next? Theo suggested they grab lunch and rest for a while before setting out to find Willow the next day. He was eager to see his wife, but didn't want to impose on Damon's busy schedule. However, Damon had other plans. He knew that time was of the essence and didn't want to delay their search for Willow any longer. No, we'll find Willow after lunch today, he declared. Theo thought for a moment. How about we go visit my father-in-law first? I know which hospital he's in. We can find him first before looking for Willow. Damon nodded in agreement, understanding the importance of family in times of crisis. Perhaps Willow would even be at the hospital. After a quick lunch, the duo rushed to the hospital. Damon, being the savvy businessman he was, saw an opportunity to boost Theo's image. He requested for the hotel's luxury cars to be transferred to the location, accompanied by a team of professionals. After all, Theo was now the boss of Fiesta Entertainment, 
and needed to maintain a certain level of prestige. Plus, it might impress Theo's mother-in-law. When Damon first arrived in New Portsmouth, Edgar Gates called the hotel, demanding that they treat him like royalty. The hotel manager pulled out all the stops, ensuring that Damon's stay was spectacular. Three luxury cars, accompanied by two more cars filled with bodyguards, made sure that Damon's arrival was nothing short of impressive. Damon was more than pleased with the arrangement, and he and Theo were whisked away to the First People's Hospital of New Portsmouth. Theo went straight to the nurse's station to inquire about Willow's father, but to his dismay, he found that the hospital bed was empty. But then a patient nearby chimed in. This old man seems to have gone home to attend an important day for his daughter. He'll probably be at the house. So Theo rushed to Willow's home and with Damon in a hurry. Willow's humble abode was nestled in an old charming neighborhood. Compared to the lavish homes of her childhood friends, Willow's home was not exactly a palace. Theo had only visited twice, not because he didn't want to, but because Willow's parents disapproved of him. They believed he had cheated on Willow and hadn't accomplished much in recent years. Speaking of childhood friends, they may have lacked Willow's stunning looks and academic achievements, but they all married well. Some were doctors and others were entrepreneurs, and a few even held high-ranking government positions. Their homes were massive, boasting thousands of square feet, multiple rooms, and even elevators. But what about Willow? Despite being a top student at Meyerson University, she was now working in an office building, struggling to make ends meet. To make matters worse, her once-talented husband had lost his job. Willow's family never seemed to be impressed when Theo came to visit. He would usually arrive in a taxi, which made them worry about what the neighbors might say about their shabby son-in-law. Willow's mother was especially embarrassed by his arrival, and would often tell him not to come if he had nothing else to do. Theo felt like it had been an eternity since he'd visited the Birch family. As the motorcade pulled up to the old residential area, they quickly realized that there was no place to park, so they decided to let a few bodyguards park the car instead, while Theo and Damon went in ahead of them. The neighbors couldn't help but stare in awe at the luxury cars that had just arrived. Wow, a Rolls Royce and a Bentley. Those are super luxury cars. One neighbor exclaimed, And who are those people? Another asked, I don't know, but I swear I've seen one of them before. Who could they be related to? The third neighbor wondered aloud. As Theo and Damon pulled up to Willow's house, they couldn't help but notice the flurry of activity. The once drab exterior was now a work of art, thanks to the ongoing renovations. But where was Willow and her family? As they looked around, they noticed a few curious neighbors peering over the fence. Theo approached one of the neighbors and asked, Excuse me, do you happen to know where Willow and her family are? The neighbor looked him up and down before gasping in surprise. Why, aren't you the Birch family's former son-in-law? Theo was taken aback. Former son-in-law? I'm Willow's husband. What do you mean former? The neighbor explained that Willow's mother had told everyone that Theo had divorced Willow. Theo's heart sank. No wonder he hadn't been able to contact Willow lately. But he quickly set the record straight. I didn't divorce Willow. And what about her family? What are they doing? The neighbor lowered her voice. I heard their new son-in-law is paying for a complete remodel. He wanted to buy them a new house, but they couldn't bear to give up their family home, so they're renovating it instead. She looked at Theo up and down. Not to be nosy, but I doubt you could pay for something like that. Perhaps that's why they're seeking greener pastures. Theo felt guilty when he heard this. Of course he can afford it. Damon said, his company is now listed on the market, and he's the president. He's even bought a villa in Meyerson. Just then, a Hummer pulled up and a group of handsome young men stepped out, smoking and chatting. One of them asked about the renovation project, and the contractor nervously replied that it would be done in two days. But before he could finish, the young man raised his hand and slapped him across the face. Damn it! He shouted. I told you it had to be done tomorrow! The contractor cowered in fear but tried to explain that it was a rush job, and he couldn't rush it any faster. The young man was having none of it. I don't care how you do it, he growled. If it's not done by tomorrow, I'll break one of your legs. The man caught sight of Damon and Theo. His expression soured. And what are you two gawking at? Beat it! Theo, taken aback by the man's hostility, asked, Excuse me, but who are you? The young man sneered. My name is Robbie. Have you not heard of me? Theo was at a loss for words, but the neighbor beside him chimed in. He's the younger brother of the new son-in-law. Suddenly, everything clicked for Theo. 
Ah, I see, but hold on a minute, Robbie. This is my wife's family home. Did you even ask permission before renovating it? Robbie's face twisted in confusion. Your wife's home? And who might that be? Theo replied firmly, Willow. Robbie rolled his eyes and looked at Theo up and down. My brother mentioned a delusional guy in Meyerson who was bothering his fiance. He was talking about you, wasn't he? Theo's voice was icy as he spoke. Willow is my wife. When did she become someone else's fiance? Robbie forced his way toward Theo. You're messing with the wrong person, he spat. If you dare to look for her again, see if I don't break your legs. But Theo was not one to back down. Willow and I did not divorce, he stated firmly. If you want to butt in, I can't do anything about it. However, this is a lawful society. I want to see how you break my legs. Robbie's arrogance was no match for Theo's unwavering resolve. He ran back to his Hummer, grabbed a basketball bat, and charged toward Theo with murderous intent. But just as he was about to strike, a shout rang out. What are you doing? It wasn't Damon who had come to Theo's rescue. It was the bodyguard who had parked the car earlier. He had seen everything. Stop right there! The bodyguard's voice boomed through the air as Robbie swung the baseball bat at Theo. The energy in his shout shocked Robbie into lowering the bat. Theo easily dodged the attack, but the tension in the air was still thick. Damon and Theo were under the protection of Edgar Gates, and the bodyguards had been instructed to keep them safe at all costs. If anything were to happen to them, the bodyguards wouldn't be able to explain to their boss. Robbie, however, seemed to have no idea who he was dealing with. Who the hell are you? How dare you ask me to stop? He spat. The leading bodyguard gave him a withering look, and a group of bodyguards moved to protect Damon and Theo. Then he spoke with authority. You don't deserve to know who I am. Now, kneel and apologize. Otherwise, don't blame me for being impolite. Despite his humble demeanor in front of Damon and Theo, the leading bodyguard was a big figure in New Portsmouth. He worked with Edgar and Pitbull, but preferred to remain behind the scenes. The appearance of the bodyguard sent a shockwave through the neighborhood. People whispered and gossiped, wondering who these imposing figures were. Luxury cars lined the street, and it was clear that these were not ordinary people. That's Willow's former husband. Someone whispered, I heard he's hit rock bottom. The idea that this down-and-out guy could drive a fancy car seemed preposterous to most. But as the truth slowly emerged, the neighbors were left stunned. These bodyguards were professionals, and they were there to protect none other than Theo. Could the man who'd been the butt of everyone's jokes have power? Of course, there were still skeptics. Don't forget who we're dealing with. One person warned. The Marston family is not to be trifled with. Robbie couldn't believe his ears when the bodyguard demanded that he kneel and apologize. It was like the world's biggest joke, and he couldn't help but burst out laughing. His laughter was so contagious that even the lackeys were bouncing back and forth with amusement. This is the funniest thing I've heard all year, exclaimed one of the lackeys. But Robbie wasn't going to take this lying down. He was the son of Elmer Marston, a famous tycoon in New Portsmouth. Listen up, you stupid pig, he said, addressing the lead bodyguard. My name is Robbie, and my father's Elmer Marston. You don't want to mess with me. The bodyguard was taken aback. He hadn't realized that the young man before him was Elmer's son. But Robbie wasn't done yet. If you're scared to admit your mistake, then get out of here. Otherwise, there will be consequences. The leading bodyguard stood tall and firm in front of Damon and Theo. With a voice that commanded respect, he spoke. I have a friendship with your father, Elmer. My advice to you is to scram. You don't want to mess with Theo Rand and Damon Walker. Robbie couldn't believe his ears. How could a mere bodyguard claim to have a relationship with his esteemed father? His eyes bulged with disbelief as he struggled to comprehend the situation. Feeling insulted by the bodyguard's words, Robbie's anger boiled over and he charged toward him. But the bodyguard was unfazed and quickly grabbed Robbie's collar, delivering a few swift slaps to teach him a lesson. As Robbie's lackeys watched in horror, they realized that they were no match for these experienced bodyguards. They may not have been able to bully others with their wealth and connections, but when it came to a real fight, they were sorely lacking. The bodyguard had originally planned to stop there after giving Robbie a scare. Elmer Marston was a well-respected figure in New Portsmouth, but the leading bodyguard was not intimidated. He and Elmer were friends, so he decided to give Robbie a few slaps and kicks and then let him go. 
but Robbie was ungrateful and foolish. He thought the bodyguard was afraid of his family's reputation and didn't dare to kill him. He even threatened to have him murdered. With a crazed look in his eyes, he lifted the baseball bat again and swung it in the air. The lead bodyguard shook his head in disappointment. Looks like you still haven't learned, he said before kicking Robbie. Robbie fell beside Theo, and the baseball bat in his hand thumped sharply against Theo's leg. Robbie whimpered, clutching his stomach. How could this be? Why did Theo have a bodyguard? Are you trying to get yourself killed? The leader stomped on his leg. With a cold tone, he sneered. You're Robbie, right? Today I'll teach you a lesson on behalf of your father. You should know that there's always someone better than you. He grabbed Robbie's hair and slapped him around like a rag doll. The neighbors were petrified, watching in horror as the scene unfolded in their small run-down neighborhood in New Portsmouth. Robbie's background was well known, and the head bodyguard should have been afraid of the Marston family's retaliation. Someone had already called the police. Despite being beaten to a pulp, Robbie still dared to say, My dad won't let you off the hook! The bodyguard was taken aback by Robbie's bravado. How could he still act tough at a time like this? He yanked Robbie's hair and growled, Listen up, kid. My name is Ivan Algor. Go back and tell your father that you misbehaved in front of me. Wait, did I hear that right? Is he the infamous Ivan Algor? The words echoed through the crowd, and even the neighbors couldn't believe it. Ivan was a well-known figure in New Portsmouth, and his reputation was on par with Robbie's father, Elmer. Why was he posing as a bodyguard? It isn't the real Ivan. The neighbors erupted into whispers, unable to believe what they were hearing. No, it can't be. The real Ivan wouldn't work as someone else's lackey. Robbie scowled. Damn, who the hell are you lying to? Just tell me your name honestly. If you don't tell me your real name, you'll be sorry. But Ivan stood his ground, emphasizing his identity. I said I'm Ivan Algor. What are your ears broken? Ivan was a top powerhouse in New Portsmouth. But even he knew when to lower his head in front of men like Edgar and Pitbull. They had called him and stressed the importance of Damon's safety and if Theo was with Damon, his safety was equally crucial. Therefore, Ivan had stepped up to defend them. As the argument continued, the sound of sirens pierced the air. Who called the police? Who's fighting? The police officers bellowed. The neighbors all spoke up at once, eager to share their side of the story. It didn't take long for them to point the finger at Robbie, who had started the fight with Ivan. But Ivan was no pushover, and Robbie quickly found himself on the losing end of the brawl. Robbie's eyes lit up when he saw the police officer. Officer Mulhern, it's me, Robbie Marston! He exclaimed, hoping for some sympathy. The leading policeman was shocked when he saw Robbie's battered face. Robbie, what's wrong with you? Who beat you up like this? He asked concerned. Robbie pointed at Ivan. It's him! Officer Mulhern frowned, unsure of what to do. He stood up and was about to speak when he saw Ivan's face. He was stunned for a moment before he stammered. Mr... Mr. Algor? Ivan nodded, his expression calm and collected. Hello, he said simply. Robbie's eyes widened in disbelief. Officer Mulhern, do you know this jerk? Officer Mulhern nodded slowly, his heart pounding in his chest. Ivan beating Robbie was like a god fighting a mortal. He couldn't help but feel a little intimidated. This, this is Mr. Ivan Algor, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. The same Ivan who had a reputation for being arrogant and ruthless? Here he was, daring to hit Robbie without a second thought. Robbie seethed with anger. Are you Ivan Algor? He demanded, his teeth clenched in fury. Ivan simply nodded, his expression unreadable. Robbie wasn't about to back down. Do you think that just because you have status you could hit me? He hissed. My father will make you pay for this. He dotes on me the most, and he won't let you get away with hurting me. Officer Mulhern could only shake his head in disbelief. This young man was hopeless, he thought to himself. With a swift kick, Ivan sent Robbie flying to the ground. Get lost, he barked. Call your father if you want. I'll be waiting to see how he deals with me. Robbie knew he couldn't win this fight, so he scrambled to his feet and ran away, his arms wrapped up protectively around his head. Officer Mulhern looked at Ivan warily. This, this has nothing to do with me, right? He asked, hoping to distance himself from the altercation. Ivan simply waved his hand dismissively. It's just normal civil dispute, he said. You can leave now. Once the officers and Robbie were gone, Ivan shook Damon's hand. Mr. Walker, I'm sorry to scare you. Hey, what do you know about them? Damon asked nonchalantly. Ivan took a deep breath before answering. 
The Marston family is a force to be reckoned with in New Portsmouth, and rumor has it that they have Mr. Marvel on their side. Damon's eyes widened in surprise. Mr. Marvel? As in Quinn Marvel? Ivan nodded, a hint of fear creeping into his eyes. Yeah, that's the one. He's not just powerful in New Portsmouth, but the entire state. Ordinary folks wouldn't dare to cross him. The mention of Quinn Marvel seemed to have rattled Ivan, and Damon couldn't help but wonder what had happened to his friend over the years. Had Quinn turned into some kind of evil overlord? As Damon pondered this, Ivan continued, Quinn is domineering, insolent, and practically a king around here. Damon's mind raced as he tried to process this information. Time had certainly changed a lot of things, and it made him feel a sense of melancholy. I guess I'll have to go and find him. Damon said, determination in his voice. Ivan looked worried. Mr. Walker, I wouldn't advise fighting Quinn head on until we gather our forces. Theo chimed in. You know, Quinn and Damon used to be friends. Ivan's jaw dropped. He never would have guessed that someone like Quinn would be acquainted with Damon. Despite his initial concerns, Ivan felt reassured by Damon's expression. Theo whipped around to face the noisy neighbors who were still lurking over the fence. Hey, you guys, what's the deal with Willow? He demanded. One of the neighbors piped up. Oh, honey, you won't believe it. Willow's mom is making her marry Benji Marston, Robbie's brother. Theo had suspected something fishy was going on, but he never imagined it would be so imminent. No way, he muttered. But the neighbor nodded vigorously. Yep, and they're trying to tie the knot in just two days. Theo was beside himself. But we haven't even finalized the divorce yet. How could they do this? The neighbor shrugged. The Marston family has connections. They know all the legal loopholes. Theo's face twisted in anger. And where's this wedding supposed to be? The neighbor shook her head. Sorry, sweetie, we don't know. The neighbors were much nicer to Theo after they realized he was associated with Ivan Algor. As the reality of the situation sank in, Theo felt sick to his stomach. Willow was going through this. Even though they weren't officially divorced, a wedding would make it look like they were. And with the Marston family's resources, they could easily forge a marriage certificate and undo everything Theo and Willow had worked on. Theo had always trusted Willow, believing that she would never betray him. But something had changed. It seemed that Willow's parents had threatened her and taken away all her communication devices, leaving her helpless and unable to reach out to Theo. Despite her feelings for Theo, Willow loved her parents and was also dealing with the fact that her father was terminally ill. In the end, she had no choice but to compromise. Theo didn't blame her. He knew he had been incompetent and couldn't offer her the future she deserved. But fate had other plans. It had brought Damon into his life, giving him the strength to say no to destiny. Damon could see the pressure Theo was under and offered his unwavering support. Don't worry, he said. I'll do whatever it takes to help you. If you want to fight for your love, I'll mobilize all the forces in New Portsmouth and the surrounding areas. I believe in you. Damon's promise had given him a newfound confidence that he never thought was possible. Damon's strength was beyond terrifying, and Theo knew that with Damon by his side, anything was possible. I've got a crazy plan. Theo said, I want to go to the wedding venue and snatch Willow back. The only problem was that they didn't know where Willow was, but Damon had a solution. No problem. I'll make a call now and find out which hotels are holding big weddings in the next few days. Then we can narrow it down from there. Damon's connections in New Portsmouth were impressive. In less than five minutes, he discovered that Willow and Benji's weddings were going to be held at a large wedding venue in New Portsmouth in just two days. It was going to be a grand affair with many of the city elite in attendance. Damon chuckled when he got off the phone. What are you laughing at? Theo asked. Damon shook his head. You're not going to believe this, but the venue is one of the properties under my corporate umbrella. Do you have any instructions for me? Ivan asked. With just a snap of Damon's fingers, he could bring Willow and Benji's dream wedding crashing down. After all, Damon owned almost all the top hotels in New Portsmouth, and even the ones he didn't, he had a stake in. If Damon wanted to, he could easily put an end to the happy couple's big day. And as for worrying about offending the Marston family, that was the last thing on Ivan's mind. He knew that anyone who dared to cross Damon would be playing with fire. Listen up, everybody. Damon declared with a steely glint in his eyes. I want all the forces in New Portsmouth to gather. We're going to ruin Benji's marriage, and we're going to do it right. It was Willow's wedding day. In the Grand Mansion, Willow sat in front of the dressing table, adorned in her wedding attire. 
The makeup artist was delicately applying makeup to her face, but her tears made it difficult to work. Despite her mother's pleas to stop crying, Willow couldn't help but feel a deep sadness inside. Mom, has Theo reached out to me? Does he know I'm getting married? Willow asked, her voice trembling with emotion. Her mother assured her that Theo knew and had even apologized, urging her to let go and be happy. But Willow refused to believe it. She knew Theo wouldn't give up on her. Her mother then reminded her of her father's medical expenses, which would be covered if she went through with the wedding. Willow's heart sank. Her father was her weakness and her mother knew it. She felt trapped. But deep down, Willow knew she couldn't go through with the wedding. She couldn't marry someone she didn't love. She had to find a way to escape. Suddenly, Robbie, Benji's brother, entered the room. His face was still bruised from Ivan beating him up, and he seemed to be in a hurry. He had a stunning woman by his side. Robbie was the kind of guy who would seek revenge for even the smallest slight, but instead of dwelling on his injuries, he impatiently asked, Are you not done yet? The motorcade has to pick up people and then go to the hotel. The makeup artist looked up, clearly flustered. I... I just finished applying the makeup. Then Miss Birch cried and ruined it again. She stammered. Robbie's girlfriend rolled her eyes. Damn it, all she had to do was go through the motions. She's such a crybaby, she exclaimed. Willow bit her lip when she heard the cruel words. Even her own mother's face twisted into an ugly expression. She wanted to fight back, but her mother's hand on her shoulder stopped her. She had to endure this for the sake of the family. The insults continued to pour out, but Willow remained silent. Bored with her lack of response, Robbie turned to the makeup artist. What's the big deal? Just slap some mascara and blush on her and be done with it. We don't have time for this. Willow could feel the tears swelling up in her eyes again, but she held them back. She walked out looking stunning in her dress, but Benji wasn't there to pick her up. She realized that no one from the Marston family was there to greet her. It was clear they didn't care about her, seeing her as nothing more than a secondhand good. If it weren't for their son's obsession with her, they would have kicked her to the curb a long time ago. The Marston family was prominent in New Portsmouth. Their wealth and status were the envy of many, especially the women who were practically lining up to marry into the family. The Marston family spared no expense when it came to their reputation, as the grand parade of luxury cars made its way through the streets. The citizens of New Portsmouth couldn't help but marvel at the power and influence of the Marston family. As the traffic police cleared the road for the motorcade, a reckless driver charged in and almost hit Robbie's Rolls Royce. Damn it! What happened? Robbie exclaimed, clearly annoyed. Robbie was fuming with anger. He checked his watch and realized he was already running late. With a quick command on his walkie-talkie, he instructed Willow's car to proceed to the hotel while he dealt with the situation at hand. Robbie then strode over to the offending car and kicked its hood in fury. Get out here, he demanded. To his surprise, a group of men emerged from the car covered in dirt and wearing safety helmets. They had just come down from a construction site and their imposing presence was quite intimidating. Robbie's expression changed. You bunch of scumbags dare to crash into my car? Disturb my brother's wedding day? You should be ashamed! He thundered, determined to make them pay for their recklessness. A burly man spoke up. Why should we be ashamed? He demanded. You're the ones who broke the law by running the red light. But the response from Robbie was swift and cutting. A bunch of country bumpkins dare to talk about the law with me? He spat. Didn't your idiot eye see that the road is blocked? What right do you have to block the road? The man asked. Who do you think you are? I'm from the Marston family, Robbie declared. So, can the Marston family just block the road? The man scoffed. You're not royalty. Others chimed in with sarcastic remarks, mocking the arrogance and entitlement of those who thought they could do whatever they pleased. That's right. Isn't it just getting married? What's so special about it? One person quipped. He can get married and divorced all day long, but he's still not entitled to shut down the whole town. Robbie flew into a rage when he saw the surrounding people mocking him. How could he have such bad luck on such a good day? His anger boiled over and he lashed out, kicking the burly man who had been taunting him. The burly man was taken aback. He didn't expect Robbie to resort to violence. The other men quickly surrounded him, ready to defend themselves. They didn't care that he was driving a fancy car. They were not going to let him get away with his outburst. In no time, Robbie was beaten black and blue. The other cars in the wedding motorcade slammed on the brakes. Groomsmen and bodyguards jumped out to try to defend Robbie, but they were no match for the construction workers. The Marston family's big day was turning into a nightmare. The traffic police cop tried to restore the order. He turned to the burly men. Sir, I'm gonna have to write you a ticket. 
The brawny man was furious. They ran a red light! He protested. Why am I the one being punished? Weddings aren't an excuse to redirect traffic! The traffic policeman stood there dumbfounded as the group of burly men approached him. He tried to speak, but the words were caught in his throat. Finally, he managed to stammer out a request. Please move the car away! But the brawny man leading the group wasn't having it. His voice was firm and commanding. As he barked to his friends, Don't move! The onlookers who had been watching the scene unfold were not pleased. A convoy of cars pulled up behind them and a group of angry youths emerged. Within minutes, more than a hundred people had gathered, and tensions were running high. Robbie, already angry from being beaten up, was now being scalded by a crowd of strangers. He was seething with rage. Shut up, all of you! Who do you think you are talking to me like that? I'll teach you a lesson! But just as things were about to get out of hand, a voice boomed out. Who the hell dares to touch my brother? And with that, a bulldozer charged forward, followed by two excavators and a mixer. The drivers of the luxury cars were terrified, and they scrambled out of their vehicles and ran away as fast as they could. The bulldozer and its companions rumbled forward, ready to take on anyone who dared to stand in their way. It was a scene straight out of an action movie, and the onlookers could hardly believe their eyes. Robbie's heart was pounding as he faced the intimidating construction workers. What's so great about driving a bulldozer? He scoffed, pulling a hammer from the trunk of his car and charging toward them. With a fierce shout, he threw the hammer to the ground. If you have the guts, then smash the Rolls Royce. You'll regret it. The workers remained silent, but Robbie's confidence only grew. What, you don't dare? He taunted. If you don't work for a week, you won't have any food to eat. If I don't work for a week, my dad will transfer the money to my card. What right does trash like you have to compete with me? But just as Robbie was getting too big for his britches, he heard a furious roar. Get the hell out of the way! Let me do it! The burly man driving the excavator had had enough of Robbie's arrogance and was ready to put him in his place. Robbie thought he could outsmart the burly man, but he was sorely mistaken. The excavator's arm came crashing down onto the car, leaving it a crumpled mess. The sound of metal crushing against metal echoed through the air as the massive Rolls Royce was obliterated. He was so terrified that he thought his eyeballs might pop out of their sockets. The excavator man seemed to be having the time of his life, smashing one luxury car after another without a care in the world. Robbie's heart beat rapidly as he realized this guy was serious. He might just destroy the entire wedding motorcade if he wasn't stopped. Robbie was terrified as he watched Big Brother wreck havoc with the excavator. The luxury cars, each fancier than the last, were being smashed to smithereens, and the owners were panicking, trying to escape the chaos. Robbie knew he had to act fast. He shouted at his team to stop the burly man before he could do any more damage. But it was too late. Big Brother had achieved his goal and jumped off the excavator, disappearing into the crowd. Robbie was determined to catch him, but the motorists who weren't at the wedding party had other plans. They were also annoyed that the Marston family had blocked the road. They formed a wall preventing Robbie and his team from pursuing the burly construction worker any further. Robbie's blood boiled with fury as he heard the thundering footsteps behind him. He turned around to face a horde of construction workers wielding hoes, iron rods, and hammers. Who the hell do you think you are? He bellowed. As it turned out, these workers were all from the nearby rural towns, here to work on the city's construction projects. They didn't give a damn about the Marston family and their penny squabbles. They were just trying to earn an honest living and go about their day. But Robbie wasn't about to back down. With his posse of lackeys at his side, he puffed out his chest and sneered. Try touching me if you dare! One of the workers didn't take too kindly to Robbie's arrogance and hurled a hammer at his head. Robbie's bravado crumpled as he narrowly dodged the attack. Robbie, buddy, it's almost noon. Let's go to the hotel before you ruin your brother's big day. A concerned groomsman urged, but it seemed like Robbie was in no mood to listen. The groomsmen knew that Robbie wanted to get revenge, but it didn't look like the situation would be resolved anytime soon. The groomsmen decided to take matters into their own hands and quickly whisked Robbie away to the hotel, where he could cool off and avoid any further trouble. Robbie was shaken up by the whole ordeal, and who could blame him? He was surrounded by a group of angry men who were ready to pounce at any moment. As he hopped into the car, he couldn't help but let out a few choice words, expressing his frustration and fear. Damn it! If I didn't have important business to attend to, I would have taken you all down. The group of burly men were hot on Robbie's tail, determined not to let him escape. With adrenaline pumping through his veins, Robbie jumped into a sleek Mercedes Benz and sped off into the distance. Although there was a small incident on the way, it didn't change the lively atmosphere in the hotel. 
As she stood at the entrance greeting guests with her mother, Willow's unhappy expression caught Theo's attention. He could feel the tension in the air, but before he could step forward, Damon stopped him with a reassuring hand on his shoulder. Don't worry, he said confidently. I've got everything under control. They won't be getting married today. Theo trusted Damon implicitly. With him around, he knew he had a solid ally. As the guests began to arrive, Damon's sharp eyes caught sight of a stunning figure making her way towards them. He couldn't resist taking a closer look. When the beauty turned around, Damon's heart skipped a beat. He couldn't believe his eyes. It was Jillian, the girl who had rejected him when they were in university. He couldn't forget how she had kissed him when they said their goodbyes after graduation. Damon's heart raced as he caught sight of her. He hadn't expected to see her here in New Portsmouth of all places. But as he watched her walk into the hotel, he knew fate had brought them together again for a reason. Memories flooded back as Damon tried to recall the last time he had seen Jillian. Hadn't she gone to the capital after graduating from university? Why was she here now? But as he stood there, he realized that things had changed. He was no longer the same person he was back then and neither was she. Damon's thoughts were interrupted by Theo, who had noticed his strange behavior. Who do you see? He asked. Damon hesitated for a moment before answering. An old classmate. Who is it? Theo Press. It's Jillian. Damon replied, his heart heavy with regret. He knew he needed to be careful since he had a wife and child waiting for him at home. Theo was stunned. It's her, he exclaimed. Of course Theo remembered Julian. Back in their university days, she and Willow were inseparable roommates. Theo always had a hunch that Jillian and Damon would end up together, but Jillian told Willow she wasn't interested. Sometimes, Theo would wonder if Jillian ever regretted not being with Damon. But as the years went by, he heard through the grapevine that Jillian had been busy building her career and improving herself and had never dated anyone else. All her hard work had paid off as she reportedly became a successful businesswoman and even rose to management level. But these were just rumors and Theo wasn't sure what to believe. As Damon excused himself to use the restroom, Theo waited patiently for him outside. Little did he know, Damon was in for a surprise. As he stood by the window smoking, he heard the sound of someone washing their hands. It was Jillian, looking as beautiful as ever. Once upon a time, at the Meyerson Railway Station, a girl stood clutching her suitcase with a look of reluctance etched in her face. A boy watched her quietly, his eyes betraying a hint of sadness. The train is leaving, he reminded her. Suddenly, the girl snapped out of her daze. Just as the train was about to pull away, she leaned in and planted a gentle kiss on his lips. We'll meet again if fate allows it, she whispered before boarding the train and heading north. In the present day, Damon couldn't shake the feeling that his story with Jillian wasn't over yet. When he unexpectedly ran to Jillian in New Portsmouth on Willow's wedding day, his heart careened against his ribcage. After all, many men would be drawn to a beautiful woman like her. But despite Theo's revelation that Jillian was still unmarried, Damon didn't approach her. He knew all too well the feelings she had for him in the past, and he believed it was better to forget than to rekindle old flames. Damon stood in a corner, finishing his cigarette. Jillian hadn't noticed him yet. Jillian finished washing her hands. Damon expected to hear the sound of her high heels clicking away, but there was nothing. He slowly turned around and caught Jillian staring at him with wide eyes. He was supposed to be dead. Jillian thought she was hallucinating. Could this be a doppelganger? If this person only looked like Damon, why would he smile at her like that? Damon broke the silence with a greeting. Jillian, long time no see. It had only been six or seven years, but for Jillian it felt like an eternity. The familiar smile and voice were like a stone thrown into a lake, rippling across her heart. It was a reunion that Jillian never thought would happen. The person she had longed for was standing right in front of her, alive and well. Jillian's heart was racing as she tried to keep her composure. The words had been swelling around in her mind, were now raging like a storm, threatening to consume her. Hey, she stammered. Why are you here? Damon asked. To attend a wedding. Jillian replied, her eyes never leaving his face. She had been invited by the Marston family, but she had no idea that the bride was her former classmate Willow. What about you? I'm here for Willow's wedding, Damon said casually. Willow? Jillian was stunned. Damon could tell something was bothering her, but he didn't press the issue. He had his agenda, after all. He was here to cause trouble and didn't want to get sidetracked. But then Jillian wiped away a tear and asked, Damon, is it you? Didn't you already, already, already die? 
Damon finished for her. The world is unpredictable. Jillian was still in shock, but she managed to compose herself. I also just arrived in New Portsmouth not long ago. I'm currently working as an executive assistant for a boss at a major company. As she gazed at Damon, Jillian couldn't help but wonder where he had been for all these years. She was worried sick about him, and she needed answers. Damon, she asked, what's been going on with you? We've all been so worried. Damon hesitated for a moment before responding. It's a long story, he said, but if you're interested, I'd be happy to tell you about my experience. Jillian's eyes lit up. Of course I'm interested, she exclaimed. Let's talk about it now. He was just as handsome as she remembered, with eyes that sparkled like the stars. She was afraid that he would disappear at any moment. Now? Damon frowned. We have a wedding to get to. It's all right, she assured him. I'm just here for someone else's wedding. I don't mind being a little late. As they continued to chat, Damon asked Jillian where she worked. When she mentioned C-Tech, Damon was shocked. He had heard that company before. In fact, he had attended a summit with Scarlet, where he had seen a booth for C-Tech. It was then that he realized that Veronica, the founder of C-Tech, was Jillian's boss. Could it be that Jillian was Veronica's assistant? So, I heard that Veronica is the founder of C-Tech. Are you her assistant? He asked Jillian, trying to sound nonchalant. But as soon as the words left his mouth, Jillian's expression changed. It was clear that she had accidentally let something slip. Damon could see the conflict in her eyes as she hesitated to answer. Before he could press her for more information, his phone rang. It was Theo, calling to remind him that the wedding was about to start. Damon quickly answered and promised to be there soon. As Damon hung up the phone, he turned to Jillian with a sense of urgency. My friend is pushing me to leave, but we'll talk again soon. And when we do, I'll treat you to a meal. He made a move to leave, but Jillian blocked his path, pleading with him not to go just yet. I want to tell you. I do. I just need to take care of some things first. Jillian knew that Damon was angry with her for not sharing the business secret, but she couldn't bring herself to spill the beans just yet. As for the meal offer, she knew it was just a polite jester. They hadn't even exchanged contact information, so why would he treat her to a meal? She followed him out, determined not to let him slip away. Damon was hesitant to let Jillian follow him, knowing that it could complicate things later. He was trying to break up the wedding. Jillian shouldn't be seen with him. Damon let out a helpless sigh. Jillian, we're not just here to attend the wedding. To be honest, we're here to snatch the bride right out from everyone's noses. Jillian's eyes widened in shock. Are you serious? Damon raised an eyebrow. I can't believe Willow hasn't talked to you about her situation. Jillian shrugged. I was just told to come and participate. We used to be close, but we've drifted apart over the years. Damon put a hand on her shoulder. Legally, Willow is married to Theo. She can't go through with this wedding to Benji. Jillian's eyes widened even further. What? I had no idea. Damon proceeded to fill her in with all the juicy details as they walked, and Jillian listened intently. Damon, you and Theo can't do this. The Marston family has too much influence in New Portsmouth, and, and... And what? Damon pressed. Jillian's voice dropped to a whisper. And the one standing behind the Marston family is Quinn. Damon's eyes widened in surprise. Quinn? As in Quinn Marvel? Jillian nodded gravely. The one and only. You don't want to mess with him, trust me. Jillian's eyes widened as she spoke. Quinn is not the same person anymore. He's so powerful that if he stomped his foot, the whole world would shake. Damon, who was lighting a cigarette, raised an eyebrow and asked, Are you scared of him, Jillian? Jillian's expression betrayed her fear as she pleaded with Damon. Please promise me that you won't cause any trouble for the Marston family. Quinn is too strong and I don't want anything bad to happen to them. Damon knew that Jillian was right. Quinn was a force to be reckoned with. And even he, the former boss of Astromar, couldn't match up to him. Quinn was a master manipulator who would stop at nothing to achieve his goals. Rumor had it that Quinn had even committed murder, but no one dared to pursue it. Damon knew that he couldn't take Quinn down with money or power. Quinn was too smart for that. As Damon pondered his next move, he realized that he was no longer the same person he used to be. Everbright was gone and Astromar had fallen apart. He needed to come up with a new strategy if he wanted to take on Quinn. Jillian couldn't bear the thought of anything happening to him. The only way to keep him safe was to avoid causing any trouble for Quinn. Damon promised to pay attention, but Jillian could tell from his expression that he wasn't listening. She begged him to stop messing around and stay out of trouble, for his own sake and Theo's. Theo had to accept his fate. Willow didn't belong to him, and Damon needed to understand that. He nodded in agreement, but before Jillian could say anything else, her phone rang. Her expression changed as she answered the call, and she quickly apologized to Damon before rushing off to take care of something. 
She asked for his number and promised to contact him later, but not before reminding him once again not to provoke Quinn. Taking a deep breath, he tried to shake off the melancholy and hurried back to meet up with Theo. Guests arrived one by one, and the Marston and Birch families welcomed them at the door. Suddenly, the atmosphere became lively as a group of sharply dressed individuals made their entrance. Leading the pack was a young man with a towering pompadour that oozed style and confidence. Damon's heart skipped a beat as he realized it was Quinn. In his memories, Quinn had always been a humble person, but his energy was different now. It was a stark reminder that time, power, and money and desire could change a person beyond recognition. As soon as Quinn arrived, all eyes were on him. People flocked to him, shaking his hand and showing their respect. Even Elmer, the powerful patriarch of the Marston family, rushed over to greet him with a flattering smile on his face. But what caught Damon and Theo off guard was the woman standing beside Quinn. It was Jillian. What was she doing with Quinn? Damon was curious, but he was too far away to hear their conversation. Quinn's shock was palpable when he saw that the bride was Willow. He was cozy with the Marstons, but he didn't realize he knew the bride. He remembered Willow from college. For a moment, he was puzzled. Didn't Willow marry Theo? Jillian seemed to be whispering something to Willow, and Damon couldn't help but worry that she might reveal his plan. But as he looked at Jillian's sincere expression, she realized that she wouldn't betray him. For now, he could only watch from afar and hope that nothing would go wrong. Damon's eyes lit up with excitement as he pulled out his phone to make a call. The opportunity has come. He exclaimed to Theo, let's go. As the Marston family and Willow made their way into the hotel, they were met with a group of people dressed in secondhand clothing. No one knew who they were, but they were carrying bulging envelopes and large gifts, which seemed to please the welcoming party. Curiosity got the better of one of the groomsmen, who asked, Who are these people? Another groomsman replied, I don't know them. They must be from Willow's side of the family. The Marston family was one of the wealthiest families in New Portsmouth, so it was a surprise to see such poor relatives. However, Willow's cousin shook their head. We don't know them, they're not our relatives. The groomsmen scratched their head, wondering if these uninvited guests were crashing the wedding. One of them suggested that they were just trying to suck up to the Marstons. The other best man gave a nod of agreement. Those envelopes were massive. Benji and Willow won't be running out of cash anytime soon. No one in their right mind would spend such a fortune on a single meal. They were just distant relatives after all. Suddenly, the wedding planner appeared. Who were those people earlier? There was a pile of toilet paper in their envelopes. The faces of the guests greeting the bride twisted in disgust. One of the groomsmen even wanted to hunt down these shameless beggars, but they had already vanished into the sea of attendees. Another relative of the Marston family shook his head. Forget it, they're just freeloaders. Let's not ruin this happy day. It was common for uninvited guests to sneak into wedding banquets. The Marston family had even prepared extra tables just in case. They saw it as a good deed to provide a meal for those in need. The Marston family was known for their wealth and power, and they had reserved the best seats for the relatives. The Birch family, on the other hand, was relegated to the corner with only 10 tables. Willow's parents didn't sit in the upper seats reserved for high-ranking officials and dignitaries. Instead, the main seat belonged to Quinn. As Benji and Willow made their way down the aisle, the air was thick with whispers and gossip. One of Benji's uncles couldn't help but comment on the bride's seemingly unhappy demeanor, but his wife quickly interjected. I heard she still has a husband. She isn't officially divorced from him. At another table, an aunt said, I heard that Benji is not a good person. He's a playboy. The scandalous news spread like wildfire, with others at the wedding chiming in with rumors about Benji's character and past relationships. But not everyone was willing to believe the hearsay. A relative from the Marston family, clearly fed up with the baseless accusations, demanded to know which family the gossipers belonged to. The aunt narrowed her eyes. I'm also from the Marston family. We're likely second cousins, but just because we're family doesn't mean I don't pay attention to the rumors. Elmer, Benji's father, sat below the stage at the wedding, his face turning pale as he listened to the gossip. Benji's brother, Robbie, wasn't going to let this slide. He ran over to investigate, determined to get to the bottom of things. As the wedding reached its climax, Elmer had to take the stage and say a few words. Someone suddenly said, Everyone look! Why do I feel like that gold necklace around the bride's neck is fake? It looks like it's made out of copper. Aren't the Marstons supposed to be wealthy? Why would their bride wear a fake? The crowd tittered. Could it be that the Marston family was just putting on airs? Were they as wealthy as they claimed? As the accusations flew, Robbie couldn't contain his anger. He demanded to know who was spreading these lies, but no one stepped forward. Elmer Marston, proud father of the groom, couldn't believe the chaos that had erupted at his son's wedding. It seemed that some unsavory characters were lurking in the shadows, determined to ruin the happy occasion. 
With a subtle nod, Elmer signaled to his team of trusted allies, stationed strategically throughout the venue. They may not have caught all the troublemakers, but they were determined to get to the bottom of things and capture the mastermind behind it all. Elmer smiled as he addressed the guest. Some of you may have questions of the authenticity of the golden necklace ad adorning my daughter-in-law's neck, but let me assure you I would never settle for second-rate materials for my son's wedding. The guests nodded in agreement, relieved the Marston family was still as wealthy and powerful as ever. But little did they know, a group of sneaky reporters had been eavesdropping on their conversations, scribbling down notes in their tiny booklets. They were already planning tomorrow's headlines. Marston family's golden necklace is a fake. Is bankruptcy looming? Just as Elmer thought he had calmed the storm, the waves began to rise again. Suddenly, a horn honked from outside. Robbie was livid and stomped his feet, demanding to know who was responsible for ruining their joyous day. A staff member explained that it was just a team of workers passing by, but Robbie knew that it was the construction workers he had offended earlier. Despite the Marston family's wealth and power, they couldn't deprive others of their right to cross the road. They had to suppress their anger in front of the reporters, but Benji the groom couldn't even fake a smile anymore. The situation was just too much to bear. The door slammed open. Benji, you sly dog! You went and messed with the wrong girl this time! You promised to marry my daughter and now you're off chasing after someone else?! An old woman appeared, leading a young girl to cry uncontrollably. Benji's heart sank as he realized it was a woman he had fooled around with and then callously discarded. But why was she here? They had agreed to stay away from each other. Who are you? Benji spat, trying to deny any connection to the girl. I'm Yolanda, Benji! Don't you remember me from the Red Rose Hotel? The girl pleaded, tears streaming down her face. Benji shook his head, trying to distance himself from the situation. I, I don't know you. Get out of here and stop ruining my reputation. Willow, who was standing beside him, remained cold and unmoved. She knew the truth about Benji, and no amount of denial or excuses could change that. Beneath the stage, a lively debate was taking place. Can you believe Benji was at the Red Rose? He may look like a gentleman, but clearly his private life is a bit wild. One voice chimed in. Another person added, Who knows how many women he's been with? It's practically common knowledge at this point. Benji's mother appeared and pointed an accusatory finger at Yolanda. What nonsense are you spewing, you little tramp? My son is a well-educated and respectable gentleman. He would never associate with someone like you. But Yolanda wasn't backing down. Oh, really? Well, Benji has a mole on his inner left thigh. And if I'm lying, he could prove it by taking off his pants. Everyone buzzed around with the scandalous revelation. Even if Benji didn't remove his pants, the damage had already been done. It was clear that Yolanda's claim wasn't just a baseless gossip. Elmer pondered for a moment. Listen, why don't you relax in the back while we sort this out? We'll bring in an expert to verify your claims. If you're telling the truth, I'll make it right. But Yolanda's mother wasn't having it. Oh no, your son messed around with my daughter, and we need to settle this score. Robbie, the groom's brother, was quick to act. Get these two out of here before I lose my cool. If anyone tries to ruin my brother's wedding again, I'll make him regret it. But one guest spoke up. What about free speech? We need to hear both sides of the story. As the tension mounted, someone snuck backstage and inserted a USB drive into a mysterious device before slipping away unnoticed. Two security guards approached Yolanda and her mother. The woman put up a fight, but the men were too strong and quickly dragged them away. Elmer wiped the sweat from his forehead. Just a small interlude, folks. Let's get back to the wedding festivities. Eat, drink, and be merry. The MC tried to salvage the situation and get the wedding back on track. Ahem. Let's continue with the main event, shall we? The groom has filmed a touching tribute to his bride. Get ready to be moved, folks. With the snap of his fingers, the giant screen lit up. But what the guests saw was not what they expected. It was a compilation of explicit videos featuring Benji, the groom, with over 20 different women. The guests were shocked and covered their eyes in disbelief. Is that Benji? I can't believe it. I thought he was a gentleman. Quick, cover the children's eyes! As the videos played, a few women in the crowd couldn't hide their guilt as they were caught having an affair at the groom. They quickly made a run for it, cursing Benji as they fled. The whole situation left everyone in shock. Wow, the people in the city sure know how to play. One guest exclaimed, i never seen such an explosive video, another added. The MC tried to pull out the USB drive, but to his dismay, the video continued to play on the screen. It was clear the computer had been hacked. Willow's face lit up with a mischievous smile as she pretended to be angry and dramatically threw her bouquet onto the ground. Her parents' faces contorted with disgust and disdain. 
The rumors about Benji's infidelity have been circulating for ages, but today's stunt was the ultimate humiliation. Elmer's anger boiled over as he demanded to know who was behind this cruel prank. He was convinced that someone had deliberately targeted the Marston family, but he had no idea who the culprit was. Benji tried to defend himself, inserting that he was innocent and that the images were AI deepfakes. But his feeble excuses fell on deaf ears. One of Willow's aunts sneered at him, accusing him of being a scumbag who couldn't even own up to his own mistakes. The guests whipped out their phones, eager to capture the drama unfold before them. This was the most lively wedding anyone had ever been to, and Willow couldn't help but feel a sense of satisfaction. She finally had exposed Benji for the fraud he was. Quinn's face twisted into an ugly expression as he realized that his enemies had targeted the Marston family's wedding. He had bankrolled most of it. This was a personal attack on him too. Jillian, who had been standing by his side, shared his astonishment. The fact that her former best friend Willow was involved in this mess twisted her mind to knots, and when Damon promised to stand up for Theo, she knew that this chaos was intentional. She was almost sure that Damon had something to do with it, but she prayed that he had done it flawlessly so that Quinn wouldn't notice. Theo and Damon stood at the back, taking in the scene before them. Theo was in awe. He had no idea how Damon had managed to get his hands on these videos, and to top it off, he had single-handedly ruined the marriage between Benji and Willow. Damon just smiled, not saying a word. He'd done this before. He had helped a friend out at a wedding in South Rivertown using the same tactics. He was a pro at this. With just two phone calls, Damon managed to get all the dirt on Benji. It turned out that Benji had been involved with many women, but that wasn't the only thing he was hiding. He had a few mysterious illnesses that required him to go abroad for treatment every year. Despite his indiscretions, Benji was careful. He never took a woman to the same hotel twice, but little did he know that Damon had stakes in nearly every hotel in New Portsmouth. With just a command, all incriminating evidence was in his hands. There were many videos, but they were all secretly filmed. Benji never showed his face in any of them, but Damon had a solution for that too. He had people use face-changing techniques to fake it and graft it onto other videos to play. Theo couldn't help but be impressed by Damon's efficiency. He had managed to bring down a man who he thought was untouchable. It was masterful stroke. The video had the crowd buzzing with excitement, people chatting away, claiming they had known all along that Benji was rotten to the core. Some were even singing and dancing, while others were making jokes about the whole situation. And of course, some had a little too much to drink and were acting like wild animals. The MC was trying his best to keep the crowd under control, but with thousands of people in attendance, it was a losing battle. I'm not getting married! Willow's voice rose through the melee as she ran for the door. The Marston family's people tried to stop her, but she was determined to leave. Her mother rushed over, begging her to reconsider. You can't leave our family in a lurch like this, she pleaded. But Willow was in tears, feeling like a joke in front of the whole city. Her mother wiped away her tears and tried to reason with her. This is your life, child. Are you going to follow that good-for-nothing trash back in Meyerson? Who are you calling trash? A thunderous voice boomed through the air, causing Willow and her mother to jump in surprise. Suddenly, Theo appeared before them, his presence commanding attention. Willow's heart leapt with joy at the sight of him, and she couldn't contain her excitement. She tossed aside her flowers and tiara and threw herself into Theo's arms, tears streaming down her face. He hugged her tightly, his tears falling like rain. But Willow's mother was less than pleased. Her face twisted into an ugly expression as she demanded to know how Theo had found them. She sneered at him, belittling him for his lack of wealth and status. But Theo stood tall, undeterred by her insults. As the commotion continued, Quinn watched from a distance, his expression unreadable. He couldn't deny the stark contrast between his privileged status and Theo's humble life. The wedding was ruined. Guests rushed toward the exit, but the hotel was surrounded by luxury cars. No one could get in or out. Elmer's face twisted with anger. Who dares to block my path? He growled. Get someone to clear the way for me. And if anyone tries to stop me, I want their car smashed to pieces. I'll take full responsibility for whatever happens. Robbie sprang into action, rallying the troops under the Marston family banner. Over 200 men, dressed in suits and leather shoes, marched out to clear the way. Their imposing presence was enough to make even the bravest competitors tremble in fear. The Marston family is a force to be reckoned with in New Portsmouth, and now they were making their power known. As they approached their destination, Robbie was taken aback by the sheer number of cars blocking their path. It wasn't just a few, as his lackeys had reported, but hundreds of luxury vehicles. Even compared to the wedding motorcade, these cars were top of the line. As Robbie and his men trudged back to Elmer, their faces were etched with defeat. But when Elmer heard the news, his face turned ashen. Didn't you tell them who we are? He demanded. 
Robbie's bitter response was like a punch to the gut. I said it, but the key is... Drake Carliso said that without his order, no one can leave the cars here. Elmer's mind raced. Drake Carlisi was the leader of the streets and districts of New Portsmouth, a man with a powerful force at his command. But who could mobilize such a force? The answer was beyond his imagination. As his subordinate explained that Drake had successfully blocked their path, Elmer's expression changed once again. Why did he block the road? He demanded. I don't know, his subordinate replied. He said that it was his boss who gave the order. His boss? Elmer's mind reeled. Drake was already a famous figure in New Portsmouth, with control over several large hotels in the area. But Elmer had never heard of another boss behind Drake. What kind of big shot would become Drake's boss? Despite his fear, Elmer had always been on good terms with Drake, but now he realized that he didn't know the depth of Drake's power. Quinn's face contorted. This guy Drake is so full of himself. I need to know who's pulling his strings. Elmer, trying to defuse the situation, quickly interjected. Mr. Marvel, please calm down. Let me go talk to Drake and see what he wants. But before he could even move, the man they were talking about walked in. And boy, did he make an entrance. A bald middle-aged man with a gold chain around his neck strutted in wearing a mink fur coat. He was followed by dozens of strong men. Everyone instinctively made way for him, and even Elmer, who was no pushover himself, couldn't help but feel intimidated. Drake, what are you doing here on my son's wedding day? Drake just laughed in his face. Mr. Marston, I know it's your son's big day, but I've got orders from higher up. I can't just ignore them. Elmer's face fell. Higher up? Who's calling the shots? Drake just smirked, clearly enjoying the power he held over them. I'm sorry, I'm not at liberty to say. Quinn slammed his hand on the table, his eyes blazing with intensity. Drake, are you out of your mind? Do you have a death wish or something? Drake's expression shifted as he faced Quinn. He may have been able to brush off Elmer, but Quinn was different. He instinctively lowered his voice. Quinn, I... I have no choice but to follow orders from higher-ups. Higher-ups? Who's pulling your strings today? Quinn demanded. Drake remained silent, instead of making his way over to the shadowy back corner where Theo was waiting. Damon had already given him his orders. Today, Theo was the top dog. All eyes turned to Theo in shock. As Drake Carlisle stood tall and proud next to Theo, the crowd was in awe. Everyone's jaws dropped in disbelief. What was Theo doing there? Damon lurked in the shadows, unnoticed by the rest of the group, but it was Quinn who was the most taken aback. He knew Theo all too well. They had been classmates for four years, and Quinn couldn't believe his eyes. His humble upbringing had led him to Damon's good graces, but now that Damon was gone, what right did Theo have to compete with him? Theo? Is that you? Quinn exclaimed. He couldn't believe that the person standing in front of him was his old friend from university. But now, Theo was no longer just a regular guy. He was Drake's boss. Theo nodded, a proud smile spreading across his face. He could see the shock in Quinn's expression, and it made him feel even more accomplished. Yeah, it's me, he replied, clapping his hands together. Looks like you're surprised to see me, huh? Quinn widened his eyes. Of course I am. You've come a long way since our university days. He said, shaking his head in disbelief. I never would have thought you'd become such a success. Theo nodded. And I never thought you would become so successful either. He said, back then you were struggling just to buy groceries. But now look at you. Quinn's expression soured. He was uncomfortable with the sudden exposure of his humble beginnings. Quinn had always been ashamed of his background, growing up in a rural area and losing his father at a young age. He had gone to great lengths to hide his past, even fabricating a more prestigious background. But now with Theo's words, his carefully constructed facade was crumbling. It was a reminder that no matter how hard he tried to hide his past, it would always be a part of him. And if people dug deeper, they would find even more secrets that he had been hiding. But for now, Quinn could only grit his teeth and try to maintain his composure in front of Theo. Quinn plastered on a fake smile. Theo, what's with the jabs? Are you trying to embarrass me? But Theo wasn't interested in Quinn's petty games. Instead, he turned his gaze to Willow, his eyes shining with determination. Willow, I'm here for you. Come with me. I promise to give you the future you deserve. Willow's heart swelled with emotion as she looked at Theo. With tears streaming down her face, she nodded her head. Yes, I'll go with you. Theo turned to Willow's parents. I can foot the bill for the medical treatment. It won't be a problem. All I ask is that you allow your daughter to come back with me where she belongs. We were wrong, 
Willow's father admitted, his voice heavy with regret. Despite Theo's lack of wealth, Willow's father had never disliked him. Unfortunately, not everyone felt the same way. Willow's mother had never warmed up to Theo, and her disapproval had caused a rift in the family. Benji suddenly spoke up, his voice filled with anger and frustration. Who do you think you are? He demanded, his fist clenched in fury. You can't just take Willow away from me. Benji had been looking forward to the wedding, only to have his dreams shattered. Now to add insult to injury, Theo was trying to steal his woman in front of everyone. But Theo was not one to back down from a fight. She's my wife, he said coolly, his eyes flashing with defiance. We haven't divorced yet. What, do you want to poach her? She's not property. Rumors had been circulating that Willow was still married, but no one knew for sure. Until now, the news was true, and it was causing quite the commotion. Benji, with his face twisted in anger, scoffed at the news. So what? He spat. She and I agreed. You're not fit to serve her coffee or shine her shoes. Before he could finish his sentence, a loud smack echoed through the room. Drake had landed a solid hit on Benji's cheek. You little brat, who are you? He shouted. How dare you talk to Theo Rand like that? Benji was livid. He screamed and thrashed like a wild animal. Elmer was seething. Drake, you dare to hit my son? He bellowed. What do you mean by that? Drake stood his ground. He insulted my boss first, he exclaimed calmly. I had no choice but to defend him. Elmer knew better than to mess with Drake. The two were evenly matched, and Elmer could only temporarily suppress his rage. Fine! Remember this, Drake. You'll regret it, he spat out. Drake didn't back down. I don't know if I'll regret it or not, but anyone who messes with my boss is going against me. Jillian looked back and forth between them. It wasn't until she spotted Damon lurking in an inconspicuous corner behind Theo that everything clicked into place. Damon was behind all of this, and Jillian's heart raced with fear. But then, Quinn stepped forward and started applauding. Bravo, Drake! You've got guts! But what if I go against your boss? Will you still be so brave? The entire hotel lobby fell silent as everyone turned to look at Quinn. He was a big shot, a world-shaking overlord. People trembled in fear at the mere mention of his name. Even Drake, who had been so cocky moments before, showed a hint of fear when faced with Quinn's powers. Quinn approached Theo. Theo, my old friend. You're not fit to challenge me, Quinn sneered. I'll let you off the hook for causing a scene at the wedding, but you must apologize to Elmer and send these people packing. Otherwise, I won't hesitate to get rough with you. But Benji wasn't having any of it. No way, Mr. Marvel! He protested. He ruined my wedding. He can't just walk away scot-free. Robbie chimed in. And let's not forget the time he sicked Ivan Algor on me when I came to check out the renovations at the Birch family home. Quinn's lip curled into a sly smile as he addressed Theo. Did you hear that, my dear friend? You've managed to upset me and my crew today. His eyes glinted with malice. Theo returned Quinn's cold gaze with one of his own. And what if I say no? He challenged. Quinn's expression darkened and Willow's face mirrored his unease. She knew all too well the power of both Quinn and the Marston family, and thought of crossing them made her blood run cold. Jillian tried to defuse the situation. Theo, why don't you just give in? She suggested. It's not worth risking reputation. Jillian knew better than anyone the extent of Quinn's influence. Since the downfall of Astromar, he had brought in nearly half of the company's profits to New Portsmouth. His power was undeniable, and crossing him was not a wise move. Theo said, Quinn, why are you pretending to be so tough in front of me? Do you think you're the king here? Do you think I can't deal with you? Quinn laughed wildly. Suddenly, he gave a signal with his eyes. A bodyguard behind Quinn dashed down and charged at Theo. But just as Theo was about to be hit, Drake came to the rescue. With lightning-fast reflexes, he blocked the attack and saved Theo from harm. Quinn was furious that his attack had failed, and he lashed out at Theo with a vicious kick. Theo was caught off guard, but withstood the blow and stayed on his feet. Drake was shocked by the sudden attack, but he didn't let his guard down. Theo panted. Quinn, show me some respect. What about our friendship? Our history? Quinn rolled his eyes. Well, aren't you sentimental? Quinn's laughter echoed through the room as he ignored Theo and slowly made his way towards Drake. His eyes were fixed on his opponent, daring him to make a move. Look at you, he taunted. Do you still want to attack me? Do you have the guts? Do you have the ability? Drake took a step back, then another, sweat beating down his forehead. But Quinn wasn't about to let him off the hook that easily. Come on, he barked, pressing forward. Don't be a wimp. Drake retreated again, but it was no use. 
Quinn's leg shot out, connecting with Drake's stomach with a sickening thud. Drake stumbled backwards, struggling to regain his footing. He looked up at Quinn with fear in his eyes, unable to muster the courage to fight back, and the others in the room were no better. They watched in horror as Quinn asserted his dominance over Drake, a once mighty figure reduced to a quivering mass. Theo, who had known Quinn for years, was horrified by his friend's sudden transformation. This was no longer the Quinn he knew. This was something else entirely. Quinn was once known for his cautious, honest, and kind nature, but now he looked down on everyone with murderous aura emanating from his body. When Quinn approached him, Theo unconsciously took a step back. Quinn couldn't help but revel in the power he held over Theo. <laughs> What's this? Theo's afraid of me. You're Drake's boss. Aren't you going to protect him? Jillian couldn't stand to see Theo being bullied. Theo, I'm begging you. Apologize to Quinn and we can put this behind us. Willow was visibly worried and scared, clutching her hands tightly. Theo shook his head, revealing that Damon was watching his every move from the shadow corner. He couldn't afford to show any sign of weakness in front of him. Quinn, don't be arrogant, I- Oh, shut up! Quinn growled. You're digging yourself deeper into a hole! Quinn's eyes narrowed as he stared down at Theo. Everyone held their breath, waiting to see what would happen next. With his commanding presence, Quinn was the one to charge in. Theo, on the other hand, looked like a deer caught in the headlights. Kneel and apologize, Quinn demanded, his voice cold and unwavering. Theo's response was equally firm, but it paled in comparison to Quinn's imposing manner. Don't even think about it, he said, his voice tinged with defiance. Suddenly, a boisterous laugh echoed through the room, causing everyone to turn their heads in surprise. <laughs> Quinn, my old friend, how long has it been? Five? Six years? My, how you've changed. You've become more powerful, more, dare I say, evil? The voice belonged to none other than Damon. Jillian's face went pale at the sight of Damon, while Theo breathed a sigh of relief. As the boss of Fiesta Entertainment, Theo was still new to the position and felt like he was walking on ice. Facing a cunning villain like Quinn, he was at a disadvantage. But it was Quinn's reaction that was the most shocking. His eyes bulged out of his head as he stared at Damon in disbelief. How could this be happening? Quinn had become so arrogant and unbridled over the years because he thought Damon was dead. If Damon were still alive, Quinn might have had a shred of respect left in for his mentor. But alas, Damon had passed away. As soon as Quinn took over as the boss of Astabar and tasted the sweet nectar of power, his desire for more began to bubble up and eventually explode into an insatiable thirst. Quinn was terrified of returning to a life of poverty. He was determined to change his fate and ensure that his descendants never had to suffer the same pain he had to endure. So he began to weave a web of lies, fabricating his background and even claiming that his parents were esteemed professors. He wouldn't even allow his mother to visit him in New Portsmouth without his permission. But Quinn's betrayal was the ultimate downfall of Lastermar. Damon had gifted Quinn shares and helped him ascend to the throne of CEO, believing in his talent and potential. However, Quinn colluded with both internal and external forces, causing Astromar to crumble. He exploited loopholes to seize property and set up countless shell corporations, ultimately becoming the leader of the most powerful business empire of the state. Quinn had always thought he was untouchable. He had built his empire in shady deals and backroom negotiations, and he was convinced that he would never be caught. He had even convinced himself that he would never see Damon again, the one person that knew all of his secrets, but fate had other plans. When Damon appeared in front of him, Quinn's heart sank. Quinn's expression turned ugly. For a moment, Quinn was transported back to their school days. Damon's voice, his movements, everything was so familiar. But then reality set in, and Quinn realized that Damon was a threat to everything he had built. He gritted his teeth and tried to push Damon away, but it was no use. Damon's eyes were like a torch, piercing through Quinn's facade. He knew exactly what Quinn was thinking, but he didn't care. He had come back to settle the score. Don't tell me you don't recognize your old classmate. Damon said with a mischievous grin. Quinn was worried that his secrets would soon be out. He had betrayed Damon for the sake of wealth and glory, and eventually sold the fruits of Astomar's victory. Suddenly, Quinn let out a furious roar and said, No! No! Damon died a long time ago! He fell into the sea and drowned. The whole world saw the news. How could he still be alive? How could he still be alive? So you can't be Damon. Tell me, who are you? 
With a cold smile on his face, Damon strode forward and raised his hand, delivering a hard slap to Quinn's cheek. The force was just enough to make Quinn stagger and fall to the ground, but not enough to kill him. The onlookers are stunned. Even Quinn's henchmen forgot to retaliate. Quinn, I never thought you'd stoop so low. Damon said in a chilling tone. The tension in the air was palpable as everyone thought Quinn would retaliate and cut Damon into pieces. But to their surprise, Quinn remained silent. Jillian's face turned pale as she realized that Damon was the reason Quinn was still alive today. She had always thought that Damon and Quinn were partners, but now she knew the truth. Damon had fallen from grace while Quinn was like the sun in the sky. How could Damon lay a hand on him? Only Theo remained calm. He knew that Quinn owed everything to Damon, and no matter how powerful Quinn was in the outside world, he was no match for Damon. Quinn's minions were in shock when they saw their boss, the big bad Quinn, getting his butt kicked. A bodyguard charged toward Damon. They thought this was it, the moment they had been waiting for, but they were wrong. The bodyguard who claimed to be the king of the special forces and unbeatable in New Portsmouth didn't stand chance against Damon. With one swift blow, Damon hit the bodyguard so hard that his face changed shape right before their very eyes. It was over before Quinn's minions could even react. Drake, who had promised Edgar and Pitbull that he would protect Damon, was fuming. Drake was ready to go to war, and he didn't care who Quinn was or what his motivations were. All he knew was that he had to protect Damon at all costs. Drake ordered his men to surround Quinn and the Marston family. Both sides were at a stalemate, and everyone was holding their breath, waiting for the situation to erupt. If Quinn dared to make another move, Drake wouldn't hesitate to take him down. The higher-ups would have to understand that he was just doing his job. But for now, all he could do is wait and see what Quinn would do next. Quinn slowly rose from the ground, his hand instinctively reaching up to touch his burning hot face. He knew without a doubt that the man standing before him was the real Damon. Panic flickered in his eyes for the first time, but his lackeys behind him were still itching for the fight. They were ready to rush over and tear Damon apart at Quinn's command. Some even started calling for reinforcements from all over the surrounding areas of New Portsmouth. But Damon stood his ground, daring Quinn to call in his forces. I'd like to see how strong you are, he taunted. Quinn was short of breath, enveloped by Damon's power. He was speechless, unable to come up with a response for a moment. Quinn had come a long way in the past five years. His influence had surpassed the business world, and everyone was worried that Damon would suffer a great loss when facing the powerful Quinn. But then, Quinn spat the words out that no one expected. From the moment you hit me, all the grudges between us have been written off. From now on, I don't owe you any more. The crowd was in an uproar as these words left Quinn's lips. Was Quinn going to submit to Damon? Who is that man? How did he defeat Quinn? I don't know. I've never seen him before. He must have power beyond our wildest dreams. Jillian looked at Damon with a complicated expression unsure of what to make of him. Theo and Willow's hearts were racing as they watched the scene unfold. Damon couldn't help but laugh at the situation. If Quinn wanted to submit to him, he was happy to accept. However, Damon wasn't done yet. As Quinn tried to leave, Damon called out to him, demanding an explanation for the collapse of Astromar and the disappearance of his shares. Quinn's expression changed as he realized that he wasn't going to get away so easily. Quinn knew the inevitable question about Astromar was coming but he couldn't avoid it forever. There were too many secrets that he couldn't reveal to anyone. As he looked around at the sea of onlookers, he made a bold move. If you want to know, let's grab a drink. I'll spill everything the day after tomorrow when I'm free. Quinn said, his expression now confident and daring. Damon wasted no time in booking and time and place. Quinn hesitated for a moment, but ultimately agreed with a silent nod. But Mr. Marvel, my wedding! Quinn's smile turned cold. Willow doesn't even have a divorce certificate, and you want to marry her? Shut up! Quinn was about to leave when he was stopped by Drake's people. Quinn blew his whistle, and a large group of people rushed over to surround Drake's crew. It seemed like another war was about to break out. Damon nodded, and Drake understood what to do. Release Quinn Marvel and let him leave. Drake commanded. As Quinn walked further and further away, the Marston family was left to face Drake's powerful team without his support. And to make matters worse, Quinn had even dared to beat up Damon. The Marston family was left feeling helpless and unsure of what to do next. But finally, the farce came to an end. Elmer's relatives and friends quietly left. It was clear that after this incident, the Marston family and the Birch family would become enemies. 
However, the Marston family had lost face today. They had let the citizens of New Portsmouth know that they were not invincible. There were other powerful people out there who could challenge them. Damon was also willing to retreat behind the scenes after handling the crisis. All eyes were now on Theo and Willow. Willow's father stammered, Theo, you... how did you... Everyone was amazed at how powerful Theo had become. He had exceeded everyone's expectations. Finally, you're here! Willow interjected. Tears streamed down her face as she hugged Theo tightly. I thought you wouldn't come! Theo wiped away her tears and explained. I couldn't contact you in Meyerson. I was worried about your safety, so I came to find you. Willow's fears melted away as she clung to Theo. But her mother looked embarrassed, knowing that she was the reason for Theo's absence. She had confiscated Willow's phone and laptop, hoping to prevent any contact between the two. But even Willow's mother could see that Theo was different now. He was no longer the same person he was before. In less than a month, he had undergone a huge transformation. And if Mrs. Birch knew what was good for her, she would back off. Damon suggested they move the guest to another hotel, where he had prepared lunch and drinks. Damon had many businesses in New Portsmouth, and he knew how to get things done. So when it came to preparing a banquet for Willow's family and friends, he had no trouble convincing nearby hotels to lend a hand. Theo was grateful for Damon's careful planning, but he was concerned about how to move almost 100 people to another location. But Damon was not one to back down from a challenge. He called a team of chauffeurs, who showed up immediately with a fleet of luxury cars to transport the guest. When the Birch family tried to thank him, he demurred and gave all the credit to Theo. Willow's family was thrilled. They never experienced such luxury before. As the cars pulled up, the relatives gave Willow's mother a thumbs up. You found yourself a gem of a son-in-law, exclaimed one of the relatives. Another chimed in. You said he was useless, but now look at him. He's too awesome. One of the guests breathed a sigh of relief. Thank goodness Willow didn't marry that jerk earlier. Who was he anyway? The group nodded in agreement. The universe must have intervened to protect Willow. No matter what challenges come her way, she'll always find a way out. Turning to Willow, another relative asked, Your husband was your classmate in college, right? Do you know if any of his friends are still single? Your cousin needs a boyfriend and you have to help her out. Willow's mother couldn't believe her ears as she heard the envy in her relative's voices. Damon waved goodbye to the relatives. Just when he thought he was alone, he turned around and saw Jillian standing there. She had been following him all along. Feeling stunned, Damon followed Jillian to a nearby coffee shop where they could catch up on old times. As they sat down, Damon couldn't help but ask the question that was on his mind. Why didn't you leave with Gwen? Jillian hesitated for a moment before answering. I have nothing to do with him. Damon was taken aback. Jillian had always been by Gwen's side, so why was she suddenly distancing herself from him? You suspect me of something? Jillian asked, sensing Damon's confusion. Damon didn't know what to think. He remembered Jillian telling him she worked at SeaTac, but that was Veronica's business. Quinn couldn't possibly be a shareholder, so why was Jillian following him? The only explanation was that Jillian was lying. Jillian could see the doubt in Damon's eyes and bit her lip tightly. She didn't want him to misunderstand her, but it seemed like he already had. Finally, Jillian decided to reveal something. Damon, you remember Veronica Matthew, don't you? Jillian wouldn't believe if he had said the two were not familiar with each other. Sure enough, Damon nodded his head. Jillian, who was Veronica's assistant, had a secret reason for being by Quinn's side, and she wasn't about to spill the beans to just anyone. Damon, promise me you won't tell anyone what I'm about to tell you. She said, and Damon nodded eagerly. Jillian revealed that she had recently joined SeaTech and was undercover, pretending to work with Quinn. It was all thanks to Quinn's dirty thoughts that she was able to blend in so easily. Quinn had been trying to take Jillian down ever since she rejected him, hoping to prove himself to be better than Damon and overcome his inferiority complex. Damon was stunned by the revelation, but Jillian wasn't done yet. She went on to explain how Quinn had acquired a large portion of Astomar's intellectual property and built a company called Rothschild Limited. Jillian lowered her voice. You won't believe what's been happening with Rothschild Limited and Astromar. Quinn has been using his influence to do some shady things, and their global market share is shrinking faster than a melting ice cream cone on a hot summer day. But all hope was not lost, as Veronica had stepped up to the plate with her own company, SeaTech. Veronica is a force. Jillian gushed. 
she saw what Quinn was doing to Astromar and decided to take matters into her own hands. Jillian had been hesitant to speak out against Quinn, but with Damon by her side, she felt emboldened. After all, Damon had been the boss of Astromar before Quinn came along and divided the company. Veronica used to work for you, right? Jillian asked Damon. I heard she had some shares in Astromar. Damon's mind suddenly sparked with a memory buried deep within his subconscious. He remembered the early days of Astromar when Veronica had owned a few shares in the company, but how had she acquired them? It all came flooding back to him. He gave her the shares as a thank you for when Damon and Will had started a business together, but they were struggling for funds. That's when Veronica secretly handed over tens of thousands of dollars to Damon, which had been a huge help at the time. Now, Damon looked back on the sum of money and saw it was insignificant, but back then, it had been a lifeline. As Jillian continued to speak, Damon's mind was racing. C-Tech, social media, and various other businesses were now overlapping with Rothschild Limited. It all made sense now. That's why Jillian had become an undercover agent, and Damon couldn't help but feel a sense of admiration for her. But then Jillian's tone changed, and she bit her lip nervously. She explained that she had only recently joined Quinn's side, and that there was nothing between them. It was clear that she didn't want Damon to misunderstand her intentions. Damon smiled. It's fine. By the way, aren't you afraid? Why did you choose to be an undercover agent? Jillian hesitated for a moment before admitting the truth. She had a personal vendetta against Rothschild Limited and wanted to take them down. Rumors have been circulating that Quinn was responsible for the downfall of Astromar, and now under Quinn's leadership, Rothschild Limited was spiraling out of control, involved in illegal activities and drugs. Jillian couldn't stand by and watch as Quinn destroyed everything Damon had built. She wanted to put a stop to it and hoped that Veronica could take over and restore Astomar to its former glory. So despite her fear, she agreed to become a spy. Jillian had every reason to be afraid. Quinn was notorious for his ruthless tactics and willingness to do anything for power and money. But Jillian's sense of responsibility and desire for justice outweighed her fear, and she took the brave step to infiltrate Quinn's organization. Little did Jillian know that her journey to New Portsmouth would lead her to Damon, the man she thought was lost forever. It was as if fate had intervened and brought them together. As she looked into Damon's eyes and saw his smile, Jillian's heart skipped a beat. Tears welled up in her eyes, and she quickly wiped them away with a tissue. She was eager to hear about Damon's life for the past five years, a time when she thought he was no longer alive. As they sat down to eat, Damon recounted his incredible story about being lost at sea and surviving on a deserted island. He had long memorized the fabricated details. Jillian was captivated by his tale, hanging on every word. She felt a range of emotions as Damon described his struggles, triumphs, from fear to excitement. When Damon finished the story, Jillian asked the burning question on her mind. Does your wife know about your return? Jillian knew that Damon had married Fifi. With a vast network of friends and classmates, it was no surprise that Jillian had heard all about Damon's life. Yeah, she knows. We're living together, and we have a son. Damon replied. For a moment, Jillian was at a loss for words, but then Damon asked her a question that caught her off guard. What about you? Are you married? Jillian's heart skipped a beat. N no, not yet. She felt embarrassed. Damon chuckled. If you find someone you like, marry him. What are you waiting for? He said with a smile. Jillian's eyes blood up with tears. She tried to hold them back, but they spilled over. Are you okay? Damon asked concern. It's nothing. Jillian tried to laugh it off, but she couldn't stop crying. Damon knew exactly why Jillian was upset. He was aware of her feelings for him. And it was because of those feelings she had gone undercover to help Veronica take down Quinn's company. Has it been good with Fifi since you got back? She inquired. Pretty good. Damon replied. Their conversation fell into a long silence. After dinner with Jillian, Damon offered to call a car to take her back. But Jillian refused, explaining that it would raise suspicion if Quinn found out. Suddenly, Damon reached out and grabbed her hand. You shouldn't mess with Quinn anymore. Jillian was taken aback. Why? Damon's response was serious and protective, assuring her that with him around, Quinn could not touch her. Jillian had been hoping to gather evidence to take Quinn down, but with Damon by her side, she didn't need to take any more risk. Damon was strong enough to crush Quinn on his own. Jillian's eyes lit up with excitement. Are you concerned about me? Of course I am, Damon replied. Then, Jillian ducked her head shyly. 
Are you worried that Quinn and I will sleep together? What? No. Damon said a little too quickly. Jillian moved closer, her body almost touching his. Do you still like me, Damon? Just as a friend. Damon said firmly. Jillian smirked. You're lying. She batted her eyelashes at Damon. All right, since you told me not to go to Quinn's, then I won't go. I'll tell Veronica later, okay? Damon's eyes widened in panic. No, 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 please don't tell Veronica that I'm back. He pleaded. He wasn't ready to face her, especially now that she was the boss of SeaTac. Jillian's eyes softened as she looked at Damon. Hey, do you remember when you graduated and you sent me to the train station? She asked with a hint of nostalgia in her voice. Of course he remembered. It was a bittersweet memory. The last time he had seen Jillian, she had surprised him with a kiss. Damon wondered what his life would have been like if Jillian had given him a chance all those years ago before he met Fifi. Sometimes I think about what could have been. He admitted. You know what? I thought I'd never see you again after I got on that train. I cried for hours and everyone on the train thought something terrible had happened to me. She confessed. Damon's heart skipped a beat as he looked at Jillian. I didn't expect to see you again either. He said, but here we are. We can't change the past. Things are different now. After that moment, a taxi stopped in front of them. Jillian turned around and said, I have to go. She looked at Damon with eyes full of expectation. Unfortunately, Damon didn't do anything. Jillian couldn't hide the disappointment in her eyes. If you don't want me to get close to Quinn, then I won't get close to him. But I'll wait for you. After saying that, she smiled at Damon and finally left. Damon, Theo, and Quinn made their way to a luxurious hotel at 3 in the afternoon. Damon had already informed Drake that he would be meeting with Quinn today, so the hotel had prepared a private room for them. From the room's vantage point, one could see the entire city, with the river's waves shimmering in the distance. It was the perfect setting, even if Quinn wasn't on the best terms with Damon and Theo. After nearly seven years of being apart, Damon, Theo, and Quinn were finally together again. Hey, Quinn, do you remember the first time you met in college? Damon asked, perched on the windowsill. Quinn's brow furrowed. It was a time when he felt inferior to the roommate Hector. But then he met Damon, a kindred spirit from a similar background, and they became best of friends for their four years at university. Time flew by before they knew it ten years had passed. Of course I remember. Quinn replied, those were better days, weren't they? We were so innocent back then, and university was the best time of our lives. They reminisced about various clubs they joined, the basketball games, and the gatherings they had with the lovely ladies from the College of Music. The friend groups mingled and formed romantic relations. Xander and Riley overcame countless obstacles to be together, while Theo and Willow faced challenges and emerged victorious. Damon wound up with Fifi, though everyone thought he'd be with Veronica or Jillian. After that time, Quinn was head over heels for a girl named Sammy. But unfortunately, Sammy didn't take their relationship seriously, leaving Quinn with a heart full of unforgettable memories. He even sacrificed his dignity for her, appearing humble in front of her. Years later, Quinn still couldn't forget about Sammy. He sent people to look for her, only to discover that she was struggling to make ends meet. She had married a poor man and was living in a small house, caring for a child with developmental disabilities, while her husband played games all day. Quinn was disgusted by her situation and felt she was no longer worthy of him. He only wanted to regain the dignity he had lost in her. But as Theo and Damon listened to Quinn's story, they couldn't help but feel sad for him. Time had changed him, and money and power had taken over his once simple and kind personality. Quinn couldn't deny that he was afraid of poverty, and his greed for money and influence had led him down a dangerous path. But now, faced with Damon's serious gaze, he knew he had to confront his past mistakes. Damon didn't mince words. Quinn, I've heard about the things you've done. You've caused a lot of harm. Quinn didn't try to defend himself. I did what I had to do to get ahead. It wasn't always pretty, but I had to look out for myself. Damon nodded slowly. I understand, but you have to realize that your actions have consequences. You can't just do whatever you want without thinking about the impact on others. Quinn took a sip of coffee. I know that now, and I want to make things right. But I also want to be clear, I don't owe you anything, and you don't owe me, or even. Before Damon could respond, Theo chimed in. Quinn, are you going to let things go just because Damon slapped you? Quinn shot Theo a withering look. You don't know what you're talking about. I'm not the same person I was before. I've worked hard to get where I am, and I won't let anyone disrespect me. Theo raised an eyebrow. And what if I speak arrogantly in front of you? What will you do? Quinn's lips curled into a sneer. 
Try me. I'm not afraid of anyone anymore. With a cold stare, Quinn looked at Damon. Damon, my friend, it's time to face the truth. Your glory days are over. Astamar has crumbled and you're no longer the big shot you once were. It's time to move on. Damon, however, remained unfazed. He calmly stirred cream into his coffee and smiled, knowing that there was more to the story. Quinn, I appreciate your concern, but I didn't come here to reminisce. I came here to find out what happened to Astromar. Quinn's expression changed, and he knew that he could no longer hide the truth. Damon, I'll be honest with you. Your shares were sold at a rock-bottom price. There's barely anything left. Damon shook his head in disbelief. That can't be right. When I left, Astromar was worth nearly a billion dollars. What happened? Quinn hesitated for a moment before finally revealing the truth. Astomar withdrew from the market and the value plummeted. It's a long story, Damon. Trust me, you don't want to know. But Damon was determined to find out. I have a right to know what happened to my money, Quinn. Don't try to stop me. Damon had been digging for information to no avail. It was like an invisible force was blocking him from uncovering the truth. That was until Quinn dropped a bombshell on him. You've crossed the wrong person. They've divided all your shares. Quinn said. Damon's face contorted with shock as he thought of the Martinelli family. Who did this to me? He asked, desperate for answers. Quinn's eyes widened with fear. I can't tell you. It's for your safety. This person is too powerful for you to mess with, even if you are the old boss of Astromar. You need to run for your life. Damon was taken aback. Who is he? He asked, his heart racing. Quinn hesitated before answering. Fernando Martinelli. He said, his voice cold and calculated. Damon's worst fears were confirmed. He had suspected it all along, but hearing it from Quinn made it all too real. It meant that Quinn was in contact with the Martinellis. Can you tell me where he is? Damon asked. Quinn seemed to be in no mood to help. He narrowed his eyes and retorted, Why should I help you? Fernando is my partner now and you're my enemy. Why should I help my enemy? Unless, of course, you have something of value to offer. Something that can make it worth my while to send you to your doom. Theo, who had been silently observing the exchange, couldn't take it anymore. He spoke up. Quinn, you're taking this too far. Don't forget that Damon is the reason you're standing here today. Without him, your mother would have struggled to send you to school, and you wouldn't have been able to afford your father's funeral. Quinn was taken aback by Theo's words. His face contorted with anger as he spat out, That's bullcrap! Damon only helped me because he wanted to use my talent. And who are you to interrupt your conversation? Do you think you're qualified to speak when the two of us are talking? Quinn had always felt a deep sense of shame when it came to his parents. His father had passed away, leaving him with a constant ache in his heart. And his mother worked tirelessly as a blue-collar worker. He couldn't bear the thought of being associated with their poverty-stricken lifestyle, so he avoided them at all cost. He even went as far to fabricate a story that his parents being wealthy intellectuals, just to hide his humble beginnings. But now, as he stood there listening to Theo's cruel words, all of Quinn's hard work to erase his roots felt like it was for nothing. Theo's insults were like daggers piercing through his chest, reminding him of the shame he had tried so hard to bury. What do you have that's worth Damon using? Theo taunted. Is it your so-called talent? Or maybe it's your simple character from growing up in the mountains? Quinn's anger boiled over and he flew into a rage. All the pain and frustration he had been bottling up for years came pouring out. He refused to let Theo belittle him any longer. Quinn's eyes were locked on Theo's, his expression darkening with each passing second. Theo, if you even think about spewing more nonsense, I'll forget about our years of friendship at a heartbeat. His voice was low and menacing, leaving no room for argument. Theo crossed his arms defiantly. Seems like you've already forgotten, Quinn. Quinn's tone grew even more dangerous. You better watch your back, Theo. I'm not just talking here. I'm ready to take you down. Damon knocked gently on the table, his voice calm but firm. Quinn, how could you threaten Theo like that in front of me? Quinn looked at Damon with disdain, his words dripping with contempt. You're not the Damon I used to know. And likewise, I'm not the Quinn you used to know. You need to understand that. With that, Quinn stood up, ready to leave. He turned back to Damon with a sly grin. Oh, and Damon, if you want to know where Fernando is, you'll have to defeat me first. And with that, he left the room, his laughter echoing in his wake. As soon as Quinn made his exit, Theo turned to Damon with a look of desperation. What should I do? Damon simply shrugged. Don't worry about it. He replied with a nonchalant wave of his hand. Just focus on managing Fiesta Entertainment like a boss. But be careful. Quinn's got a mean streak, and he might try to pull something. 
Damon's words were punctuated by the intense glare of Quinn's resentful eyes, which seemed to be burning a hole through the wall. But Damon wasn't afraid. He was a seasoned pro who had seen it all. And Theo, on the other hand, was just a mere mortal, so he needed to be extra cautious. Damon was so confident in his abilities that he even considered teaching Theo some defensive skills, just in case things got hairy. With Quinn out of the picture, Damon and Theo didn't see any reason to stick around, despite the bad blood between them and Quinn. At least they had a clear understanding of what was going on. Theo went off to find Willow, while Damon made his way back to the hotel. Damon settled in to eat at the restaurant. The restaurant manager approached Damon with a polite smile, eager to take his order, but Damon simply shrugged and said he'd be happy with whatever they could whip up. The poor manager had no idea what to serve him. The thought of disappointing his most important customer with the wrong dish made him break out in a cold sweat. The hotel's five-star chef was summoned to prepare a feast fit for a king. When Damon saw the spread laid out before him, he couldn't help but chuckle at the manager's desperation to please him. After all, he held the power of life and death over the restaurant's reputation. But he appreciated the effort nonetheless. He sampled a few dishes, taking his time to savor each one. As he left the restaurant, his phone rang. It was Fifi, wondering when he'd be back home. Damon told her he'd be back the next day. He wondered if he should buy some souvenirs for Fifi and Junior before he returned. As Damon reminisced about his hasty marriage to Fifi, he felt guilty for not showering her with lavish gifts. He hadn't even given her a diamond ring, and their promised honeymoon had been postponed indefinitely. I need to make it up to her. He muttered to himself, determined to find the perfect ring. Leaving the hotel, Damon was greeted with the utmost respect from the staff. The manager offered to provide him with a car and bodyguards, but Damon declined, opting to take a stroll instead. The manager was beside himself with worry, but Damon knew he could handle himself. After all, he had made enemies with Quinn and his gang, and knew Portsmouth was no longer safe for him. But he was confident in his abilities, and knew that he could take care of himself. After a long few days in New Portsmouth, Theo, Damon, and Willow went back to Meyerson. Damon told Fifi what day he was coming back, but he didn't tell her the exact time. He was touched when she showed up to greet him. As soon as Fifi arrived, Theo greeted her with a warm, Hey sis! And Willow flashed her a friendly smile. Damon was curious to ask how Fifi knew he was coming back. Fifi rolled her eyes at Damon and replied, Yesterday you said he would come back today. Today there is only one flight from New Portsmouth to Meyerson. It wasn't rocket science. Damon couldn't argue with the logic and simply shrugged in agreement. What if I took a private plane? Wouldn't you have missed it? You could have waited at home. Fifi blushed at Damon's words and retorted. Junior said that he missed you, or else I wouldn't be willing to come. Fifi was a little resentful. She knew Damon was busy, but she just couldn't handle it when he left for a few days. He hadn't been back from the dead for that long. Even though it was just for a day, it felt like an eternity to her. Junior tugged on his father's sleeve. Yesterday, my mom said she wanted to pick you up, and this morning after we had breakfast, she brought me here. Fifi quickly covered her mouth, realizing how ridiculous she sounded. She wanted to downplay how much she missed Damon by using Junior as an excuse, but Fifi was too embarrassed to admit it in front of her friends. Damon's heart swelled with tenderness as he put his arm around Fifi's shoulder. Let's go home, he said, his voice soft and gentle. Theo and Willow tactfully excused themselves, saying they'd catch up with the couple later over a meal. After Willow and Theo left, Fifi pouted. You've been away for so long, did you forget about us? Without wasting a moment, Damon pulled Fifi close and whispered in her ear. Never. I had some business to attend to in New Portsmouth, but I missed you both every single day. Fifi's heart melted as Damon's warm breath tickled her ear. Please don't leave us again for so long, okay? I, I get scared when you're not around, she confessed. Damon had just returned from a near-death experience and the thought of losing him again made Fifi's emotions run wild. Damon gently stroked her hair and comforted her with his soothing words. Fifi's heart swelled with love, and she couldn't resist pressing her lips against Damon's. Their intimate moment was interrupted by Junior, who frowned and asked, Mom, what are you and Dad doing? Caught off guard, Fifi quickly pulled away from Damon's embrace and stuttered, Um, I, I think Daddy has a toothache, and I was just trying to fix it. Junior looked puzzled and said, But Daddy's mouth is fine. Why do you have to look with your mouth? Fifi's face turned red with embarrassment, realizing that she had gone a bit too far in front of their son. She made a mental note to keep their affectionate moments private from now on. Hey, what do you think this is? Damon asked with a mischievous grin as he pulled out a small box from his pocket. Fifi's curiosity was piqued as she eagerly asked, 
What is it? Damon opened the box to reveal a stunning diamond ring. Fifi's eyes widened with excitement. For me? She gasped. Damon nodded with a smile. Of course. My beautiful wife deserves nothing but the best. Fifi couldn't contain her tears of joy. As they returned home, Selena was waiting for them, and she couldn't help but cheer when she saw the ring on Fifi's finger. Fifi looked at Damon with eyes so soft and tender they can melt even the hardest of hearts. Brother, you're back! Eric, Selena's husband, exclaimed. Damon nodded. How have you been treating my sister lately? We're doing fine, Selena said with a grin. Ever since Damon had shown his true power, Selena's in-laws had started treating her like royalty. Damon had pulled the strings to help the Cohen family, and now they were on their best behavior around Selena. Selena hugged her brother. Damon, do you think you can put in a good word for Eric? I'd love it if he received a promotion. Damon nodded. All right, Eric, if you impress me, I'll do my best to speak up for you. But let's not get ahead of ourselves. I can't guarantee a promotion. Eric agreed to do his best, not let Damon down. After a delightful family dinner, Eric and Selena headed back to their house. Andrew was busy washing dishes while Mrs. Walker swept the floor. As the clock struck half past six, Fifi and Damon strolled through a park with Junior, surrounded by the breathtaking beauty of Autumn. The maple leaves danced around them, painting the ground with a golden hue. Suddenly, Junior's voice broke the peaceful atmosphere. Dad, I want to fly kites too, he exclaimed. Damon looked around and saw the park was filled with fathers and sons flying kites, while mothers watched from the sidelines. Damon spread his hands, but we didn't bring any kites. But Dad, I want to play. Junior whined. Fifi gave Damon a stern look. Hmm, now you know how hard it is to take care of children, right? She said, shaking her head. Damon nodded, feeling guilty. Fifi pointed to a toy store in the distance. They have a wide variety of kites. You two go take a look. Damon led Junior to buy kites, but soon Damon walked back with Junior with her heads hung low. Fifi opened her eyes wide and asked, What's wrong? Junior said, Dad didn't bring any money. Seeing Damon's embarrassed face, Fifi found it funny. She took out money from her pocket and handed it to Damon. You goof, you can't even take out money to buy toys for your own son. Junior took the money and said, Dad, we have money to buy toys, kites, and robots, okay? Damon took the money from Junior and said seriously, What's so fun about robots? I saw a cool miniature excavator toy back there. Dad'll teach you how to dig sand later. Damon was a man of many talents, but when it came to flying kites, he was as clumsy as a newborn giraffe. To make matters worse, the wind was still, leaving Damon to fiddle with his kite to no avail. Junior playfully criticized his dad's kite-flying skills, calling him stupid from the sidelines. But Damon wasn't going to let his son's insult get to him. He knew that it wasn't his lack of skill that was the problem, but it was the wind. So instead of wasting his time with a kite that refused to fly, Damon pulled out his brand new excavator toy. This little machine was a marvel of engineering, with all the functions of a real excavator packed to a small size. Damon was thrilled to finally have a chance to play with it. But Junior wasn't going to let his dad have all the fun. He begged and pleaded to play with the excavator too, but Damon didn't want to share. Fifi had to step in and remind him that he was acting like a child. Damon begrudgingly handed over the controls. Fifi chuckled to herself. She knew that no matter how tough a man may seem, there is always a little boy inside him. Who would have thought that even Damon couldn't resist the allure of a good old-fashioned remote control? Every few minutes, Damon would try to coax Junior into letting him take over, but the little boy was having too much fun with his excavator. Dad, you don't even know how to play with this thing. Junior teased, giggling as he expertly maneuvered the toy. Damon scowled, trying to hide his frustration. Well, I can teach you how to play better. You're doing it all wrong. But Junior wasn't having it. No way! And besides, you're not very good at this. Fifi watched the exchange with a warm feeling in her heart. This was the kind of scene she had been dreaming of for years. A happy family. Despite the occasional bickering and teasing, they were all having a great time. Fifi looked down at her hand, admiring the sparkling diamond ring that Damon had just given her. It glimmered in the sunlight, a symbol of their love and commitment. At that moment, Fifi knew she had found true happiness. She leapt up from her spot and ran towards her family, joining in on the fun and flying a kite with her two favorite guys. After two days of rest at home, Damon was ready to take on Quinn. Little did he know, someone had already beaten him to the punch. SeaTech had made a move against Rothschild Limited, Quinn's company. Damon wasn't sure if Jillian had given Veronica any useful information, but he was surprised by the sudden attack. SeaTech and Rothschild Limited were fierce rivals. 
They competed in many overlapping fields, and it was no secret that they had faced off against each other many times. When Astramar was divided, Rothschild Limited inherited most of the business, making it a supergiant in the industry. SeaTech had only inherited a small amount of business and a pitiful share of Astramar. Many believed they would be crushed under the enormous wheels of Rothschild Limited in any battle. But SeaTech proved to have tenacious vitality. They not only survived but grew stronger in their struggle against Rothschild Limited. Slowly but surely, they ate away at the rival's business. It was a David and Goliath story. And SeaTech was proving to be a formidable opponent. Rothschild Limited's social media and networking software was solely losing their grip on the market, and their share was dwindling. But it wasn't until SeaTech entered the scene that the decline was accelerated. Quinn refused to take responsibility for the company's downfall. For years, Rothschild Limited had been using its power to suppress SeaTech, but Veronica and her team refused to back down. They called evidence of illegal activities from Rothschild Limited and were determined to expose them. Quinn's thirst for power had grown out of control, and he was willing to break the law to achieve his goals. But SeaTech had the upper hand, with concrete evidence of Rothschild Limited's illegal sale of user information. When SeaTech revealed this information to the public, it caused a tsunami of outrage. The share price of Rothschild Limited plummeted, and the public began to question the company's ethics. The internet was buzzing with negative news about Rothschild Limited. It seemed like everyone was talking about it. SeaTech saw this as an opportunity to strike. They revealed the Rothschild Limited had been using social media to collude with the international darknet and engage in criminal activities. They were making huge profits and transferring them through special channels to avoid paying taxes. There was even evidence that they were involved in espionage and stealing confidential information. Quinn had always been ruthless, but he had a vast network of connections that spanned the globe. People like Fernando were just a small part of it. Many others wanted to get rich quickly, and they saw Quinn as their ticket to success. At Rothschild Limited's office in New Portsmouth, Quinn was so angry that he felt like he could kill someone. Even though he had managed to put a stop to SeaTech's operations against Rothschild Limited, he had paid a heavy price. He had a gut feeling that if he didn't act soon, Rothschild Limited would be destroyed. Why is SeaTech always looking for trouble with us? Are we going to give them a taste of their own medicine? His assistant trembled. Our people have been keeping an eye on them, but SeaTech is operating within the law. We haven't found any evidence against them. What about financial reports? There must be something fishy there, Quinn demanded. No, their financial reports are impeccable, and their turnover is about to surpass ours, the assistant replied. Another assistant barged in, announcing that there were a few people downstairs claiming to be his relatives. Quinn's eyebrows furrowed in confusion. The secretary's description of the visitors didn't help either. They were dirty and smelly, and they looked like farmers. She said that she chased them out. After the secretary left, Quinn rubbed his temples, feeling a headache coming on. He knew he had to focus on the task at hand, but the thought of unexpected visitors was distracting him. He decided to make a phone call. Hello, is this Fernando? It's Quinn. Recently, SeaTech has been looking for trouble with us. You see... Okay, okay. After the matter is settled, the yacht that I just bought... Good, good, good. Yes, I just sold a private jet. How would you like to play with it? Just play with it however you want. Alright, when the time comes, it'll be transferred to your overseas account. As he hung up the phone, Quinn's expression was sour. He couldn't believe he had to resort to such measures just to protect his business. Quinn was ready for some relaxation after taking care of business, so he decided to call his driver and get a car ready. He was in the mood for a vacation. As he made his way downstairs, he heard a sudden shout that caught his attention. Looking over, he saw four farmers standing at the entrance of the company building. They were all covered in dirt and grime, and the smell was overwhelming. Hey, Quinn! It's me, your uncle! Bart! Quinn didn't know what to say. The secretary's words dripped into the state and she spat out. And who might you be? Our CEO comes from a family of highly educated individuals. Uncle Bart's bearded face fell as he pleaded. It's me, Quinn! Your uncle! How could you deny us? The secretary waved her hand dismissively and retorted, Our CEO is a successful man, with people clamoring to get close to him every day. You're lying. Uncle Bart's expression turned cold. Quinn, do you think we're here to ask you for your money? Ha! Huh. We don't care about that. We couldn't get through to you on the phone, so we came here to tell you something important. Your mother's sick, and she doesn't have the money for her treatment. You need to come home as soon as possible. The mention of his mother gave Quinn pause. 
Then, turning to his family members, he said, Follow me upstairs. As soon as they were inside, Quinn closed the door and faced them. You jerks, he growled. Who told you to come here uninvited? Quinn slammed the door and faced his relatives. Quinn's family members exchanged glances, their faces filled with uncertainty and fear. Something had changed within Quinn since the last time they saw him. With no one daring to utter a word in response, Quinn's frustration grew. He had no intention of asking these elders to take a seat. After all, there had to be a clear distinction between superiority and inferiority, right? If he treated them like equals, they would continue to see him as the same old Quinn from before, and that was simply unacceptable. Uncle Bart finally spoke up. Quinn, we mean no harm. We came to find you because your mother's gravely ill and is in need of financial assistance. We can save her, but we need your help. Quinn's lips curled into a cold smile. What, now that you see I'm well off, you suddenly change your tune and ask for money? Uncle Bart's face contorted with a mix of surprise and desperation. Quinn, why are you so fixated on money? Don't you care about your own mother's well-being? Quinn smoked a cigar and said, My mother is sick, not you. Besides, why didn't she call me? Instead, she asked you to find me. What kind of nonsense is this? Uncle Bart let out a heavy sigh, his frustration evident in his voice. She said she didn't want to disrupt your business. Quinn's emotions were running high. My mom is on the verge of death, and she still didn't bother to call me. And what about the money I sent her for food expenses? I heard she gave it to you to build new houses. Are you trying to make a profit off me? Uncle Bart's anger flared up. Quinn, what are you talking about? We're doing this out of goodwill, aren't we? Yes, I did borrow money for your mother, but we're helping you with your family's business. You're honest taking care of your mother's illness. We fully intend to repay the money you, we borrowed from you. Quinn's smile turned cold, his skepticism evident. Repay? What do you have left to repay? Can you even afford it? I'm not naive, you know. I can see right through your intentions. Another uncle chimed in, expressing his disappointment. Quinn, I never expected you to be so ungrateful. We pulled our money together to support your education, and now you're acting like this- Ah! Before he could finish his sentence, Quinn abruptly stood up and delivered a resounding slap to his uncle's face, seeing the middle-aged man crashing to the ground. Uncle Bart was furious. Quinn! How dare you hit your Uncle Billy! Oh, shut up. Quinn snarled. You need to get out of my office. Uncle Bart helped Uncle Billy off the floor as he glared at Quinn. You're a monster! What happened to you? Quinn was too lazy to waste time with them. He pressed a button on the intercom. Hello, security, come to my office. Some farmers are harassing me. Uncle Bart pursed his lips. You don't have to chase us away. We'll go by ourselves. After forcefully ejecting those troublesome individuals, Quinn let out a sigh of relief and massaged his temples, contemplating the imminent downfall of SeaTac. Quinn was owed his current position to a web of deceit and manipulation. He had gone to great lengths to forge various documents to seize control of Damon's shares. Without his cunning move, he would never have assumed such a massive fortune. But now, with Damon back in the picture, everything was at stake. No matter how meticulous Quinn had planned, if Damon were to track him down again, his carefully constructed empire would crumble like a house of cards. It wouldn't just be a matter of protecting Rothschild Limited anymore. Quinn could find himself behind bars. Damon followed the charges against Rothschild Limited by SeaTac. He was expecting a heavy blow to the company, but to his surprise, the share price of Rothschild Limited rose steadily after just two days. Meanwhile, the share price of SeaTac, which had provided the evidence, started to plummet. Rumors were flying that SeaTac had provoked somebody they couldn't afford to offend. Damon found out that they had their headquarters in Meyerson. Suddenly, he had the urge to see Veronica, even if it was just from afar. It was just a fleeting thought, but once it entered his mind, it was hard to shake off. Damon, filled with a mix of anticipation and curiosity, easily located SeaTac headquarters. Standing at the entrance, he gazed at the impressive building before him. Thoughts of Veronica, whom he already held in high regard, swirled in his mind. Before Damon could catch a glimpse of Veronica, he unexpectedly encountered another familiar face. It was Wendy. He had been searching for her since his return. However, Wendy's former home had vanished amidst the rapid real estate development in South Rivertown. The irony of fate brought them together once again, this time within the confines of the SeaTac office. She was working as a receptionist. As if scripted for a movie, 
a sleek black Mercedes Benz suddenly pulled up to the entrance. A handsome man emerged from the vehicle and warmly greeted Wendy. A radiant smile graced his face. Damon couldn't help but feel a twinge of jealousy. It seemed like Wendy had a boyfriend, and he didn't want to interfere with her happiness. He silently wished her all the best in finding the person she would love for the rest of her life. Suddenly, the sound of a roaring motorcycle shattered Damon's thoughts. More than a dozen of them thundered toward the entrance of SeaTac, causing a commotion. But these weren't your average run-of-the-mill bikes. These were imported, high-end motorcycles that only the wealthy could afford. Two security guards ran over. Sir, you can't park here! A bold man stepped forward. Move aside. A woman smoking a cigarette chimed in. You don't want to mess with Brock. The guards were taken aback, fear creeping into their eyes. They had no idea who this Brock was, but the woman's words had struck a nerve. They glanced at the bald man before silently retreating. Brock peered inside and noticed Wendy standing at the front desk. He let out a wolf whistle and called out, Hey, beauty, come out and play with Brock. Wendy stared back at him, her gaze icy cold. Another man sneered, his expression changing as he noticed Wendy standing her ground against Brock. He flicked his cigarette to the ground and strode into SeaTac, determined to get his hands on Wendy. What do you think you're doing? Let go of me! Security! Security! Wendy shouted, but the two men ignored her pleas, pretending not to hear. Damon's heart raced as he helplessly watched Wendy being whisked away by the hooligan and his accomplice. His gaze then shifted to Wendy's boyfriend, anticipating his reaction. And sure enough, the boyfriend descended from the car and mustered the courage to speak. Please, let her go! The hooligan tilted his head. He hadn't expected anyone to challenge his authority. Wendy's boyfriend felt a twinge of fright, but with his girlfriend in danger, he had no choice but to swallow his apprehension and stammer. I, I, I'm... Her boyfriend? The man sneered, a cold smile on his lips. Very well, I understand. But from this moment on, she's no longer yours. Go away! Brock snapped his fingers, and suddenly, the expensive motorcycles roared to life, their engines echoing through the air. The sound sent shivers down Wendy's boyfriend's spine, causing him to collapse onto the ground in sheer terror. Ha <laughs> ha! Look at you! Trembling like a pathetic coward! The hooligan taunted, his voice dripping with contempt. Who would even want to be with someone like you? Wendy's boyfriend's face flushed with embarrassment, but he dared not to utter a word in response. The hooligan towered over Wendy's boyfriend. Why aren't you leaving? Without waiting for a response, he punched him in the face. The boyfriend no longer cared about Wendy's safety. Fearing for his life, he fled. The ruffian's eyes locked onto Wendy, a mischievous grin spreading across his face. Wendy's heart raced with fear, causing her to instinctively take a step back. What do you want? She stammered, her voice trembling. If you dare to cause more trouble, I'll call the police. The man's eyes narrowed. Call the police? He scoffed. Do you think I'm afraid? I could call the bureau chief right now and he'd treat us to a meal. Wendy's fear intensified as she realized these people had no qualms about their actions. They had the police in their pockets. Enough fooling around! Brock's commanding voice echoed through the air. We have important matters to attend to. It was clear that Brock was the leader of the group, his authority undeniable. Wendy's heart pounded in her chest, feeling trapped and helpless. Suddenly, a voice cut through the fray. Take your hands off of her. Damon knew he had to step in before Wendy found herself in even greater danger. Who the hell are you? Damon lazily dismissed the hooligan, his attention solely focused on Wendy. With a reassuring smile, he approached her and exclaimed, Wendy, it's been ages. Are you okay? Wendy's jaw dropped, unable to find the words to respond. The person standing before her seemed like the very embodiment of the Damon she had dreamed of. But she knew Damon was gone, dead and buried. How could he possibly be standing here alive and well? It's me, Damon. He declared, his voice filled with affection as he tenderly ran his fingers through Wendy's long hair. His eyes overflowed with a love that couldn't be concealed. Wendy's tears streamed down her face, her voice trembled as she asked, Are... are you Damon? It's only been a few years since we last saw each other, don't you remember me? Damon chuckled, his smile widening. But in her dreams, he would secretly come to find her, talking to her more often than her brother Will. But each time she woke up, the impetus would wash over her reminding her that it was all just a figment of her imagination. But now in this very moment, Damon stood before her, so real that she could almost touch him. It didn't feel like a dream at all. Big brother, I've missed you so much! She cried. Her tears flowed freely, disregarding the curious gazes of the surrounding audience. 
She didn't care anymore. All that mattered was Damon's presence. However, not everyone shared Wendy's sentiment. A hooligan named Lars, witnessing Damon's interaction with Wendy, scoffed and dismissed him without a second thought. But Damon, his voice dripping with coldness, had no patience for such disrespect. Get lost! He retorted, his words laced with a steely determination. The hooligan's face twisted with anger, his intentions turning violent. He revved his motorcycle and brandished a baseball bat, pointing it menacingly at Damon. Damon's eyes glowed with an eerie green light. In a sudden burst, the baseball bat in Lars' hand exploded into pieces, leaving him in a state of shock. What the hell just happened? What's going on? Lars exclaimed, desperately seeking answers from the stunned onlookers. No one could believe that Damon had shattered the bat. It seemed impossible, considering the immense strength it would require. Lars, unable to contain his anger, pointed an accusing finger at Damon and unleashed his fury. The situation quickly escalated, drawing the attention of the young masters who were previously engrossed in their smoking and boasting. They swiftly closed in on Damon, ready to confront him. Even Brock, who had parked his sleek Dodge motorcycle nearby, approached Damon with a dark and brooding expression. Just as the tension reached its peak and a full-blown confrontation seemed inevitable, Brock's phone unexpectedly rang, interrupting the impending chaos. His face transformed, revealing a mix of surprise and urgency. What? The target has appeared! All right, I'll head there immediately! He muttered into the phone. Putting away his phone, Brock addressed the group. The target isn't here! He entered through the other entrance! We need to block him off! Are you all willing to risk delaying our orders? Who will take responsibility if our boss blames us? As for this insignificant troublemaker, we can deal with him later when the time is right. If you have any ounce of courage, tell me your name. Lars challenged. Damon, came the swift reply. Lars nodded, a sinister smile playing on his lips. Damon, huh? Well, just you wait. When the time comes, I'll dig into your past. And as long as you dare to stay in Meyerson, I'll make you regret ever crossing paths with me. With those words hanging in the air, he reluctantly mounted his motorcycle and revved the engine, the sound echoing through the empty street. Once the gangsters had finally left, Damon turned his attention to Wendy, concern etched on his face. Are you alright? Wendy shook her head, tears streaming down her cheeks. Brother, I'm fine, but... but you're not dead! Her voice cracked with a mix of relief and anguish. Since you're alive, why didn't you come find me? Damon's heart ached as he witnessed Wendy's raw emotions. He felt a pang of guilt for letting her down, for failing to fulfill his promise to Will. He had disappeared for five long years, leaving Wendy to face the world alone. It's a long story, Damon said. Wendy's boyfriend, who had just made a swift exit, suddenly popped his head out of his car once again. With a mix of concern and frustration, he called out to her, Wendy, are you okay? If those idiots hadn't been so fast, I would have cut them off. Do you want me to give you a ride home? Wendy, however, responded with a frosty tone, Go away! Don't bother me anymore! We're done from today onward! With those words, she completely dismissed the Mercedes-Benz guy from her mind. As it was time to leave work, Wendy turned to Damon and asked, Damon, if you're free, could you accompany me home? It's been so long since we've seen each other, and I want to catch up. Although Damon had been hoping to see Veronica, he couldn't refuse Wendy's request, so he simply nodded in agreement. Damon, where have you been all these years? Why didn't you come find me? Wendy questioned, her voice filled with curiosity and longing. Damon, feeling somewhat trapped, resorted to his usual cliche story about being lost at sea before admitting. After I returned, I went to South Rivertown to search for you, but our old town has changed so much, I had no idea where you were. Wendy had no words to respond, but deep down, a sense of happiness began to bloom. Wendy led Damon through the winding streets of an old neighborhood. As they walked, Damon noticed the decrepit conditions of the house. He had always imagined that Wendy, with the generous sum of money he and her brother had left for her, would be living a life of comfort and luxury. They arrived at Wendy's humble abode, a studio that served as her living space, kitchen, and bathroom. Despite Wendy's efforts to tidy up, the cramped and awkward layout couldn't be disguised. Damon realized that Wendy's life was far from the ideal he had envisioned. Embarrassed by her modest living conditions, Wendy's cheek flushed. I'm sorry you have to see this, Damon. I know it's not much. Damon shook his head, his concern evident in his eyes. But didn't your brother and I leave you a substantial sum of money? And weren't you supposed to receive a monthly transfer as well? Wendy hesitated before responding. I don't know what happened. 
The money you left me, I used it to go to school. And then my mother fell ill. We had to use the money for her treatment, and there was nothing left. And after that, the money you and my brother left for me never made it to my account. Damon raised his eyebrows. The money didn't even reach your account? Wendy nodded sadly. She had tried to investigate, but all she heard was that the money had been intercepted. She had no idea who was behind it, and her attempts to seek help had been in vain. The matter remained unresolved, leaving Wendy and her mother in a dire situation. Damon was concerned. What about your mother? Is she okay? Wendy's eyes filled with tears as she replied. She's still struggling with her illness. We can't afford the treatment anymore, and it breaks my heart to see her suffer. Her mother, once vibrant and full of life, was now confined to her bed, battling an illness that seemed to drain her spirit. Wendy had no choice but to hire a home health aide and continue working as a receptionist to support her family. The weight of responsibility pressed down on Wendy's shoulders. She had exhausted her savings and sacrificing her dreams and desires for the sake of her mother's well-being. Giving up her job was simply not an option and would plunge her family into financial turmoil. Damon never imagined that Wendy would face such hardships in the past few years. He had promised Will that he would protect her at all costs. But Damon was determined to make things right. It wasn't too late to turn the tide in Wendy's favor. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a bank card. There should be almost a million in this account. Take it. Wendy, use it for emergencies. Wendy's eyes widened in disbelief. A million dollars? To her, that was an unimaginable sum of money. However, her sense of pride and gratitude prevented her from taking Damon's generous offer. She knew that Damon had just returned from a long journey and that starting a business would require a significant amount of capital. How could she possibly burden him with her own financial troubles? Besides, the doctor had already given her the grim prognosis that her mother's chances of recovery were very slim. Before she could voice her refusal, Damon interrupted her thoughts. Silly girl, do you think I still need the money? Just take it, it's yours. Damon, have a seat and get comfortable. I'll whip up something delicious for you. Wendy said with a warm smile. As she spoke, Wendy's eyes scanned the kitchen, already envisioning the culinary masterpiece she was about to create. However, when she opened up the fridge, she was dismayed to see that it was almost empty. Realizing the predicament, Wendy turned to Damon and said, Hold on a moment, Damon. I'll go grab some groceries from the store. Damon decided to go with her. They strolled around the corner to a quaint little grocery store. As they entered, the cashier's eyes lit up upon seeing Wendy. Wendy, is that your boyfriend? He's quite the catch. Embarrassed, Wendy's cheeks turned a shade of crimson. She glanced at Damon, lost for words. Oh! She didn't deny it, leaving Damon unsure of how to respond. Sensing the awkwardness, the cashier laughed. Young man, take good care of Wendy. She's a wonderful girl. When they arrived home, Wendy sprang into action in the kitchen. With a flourish, she carried the dishes to the table. Damon, try it. Does it taste good? She asked eagerly. Damon took a bite and nodded in approval. It tastes amazing, he said, grinning. Wendy's face lit up. I'll cook for you any time. But Damon hesitated. I'm not sure if I can come over very often. He said, feeling guilty. Wendy's face fell. Oh, I see. You'd rather spend time with your wife. She said, her voice tinged with sadness. Damon's heart ached at the sight of her tears. No, no, that's not it at all. I promise I'll come see you whenever I can. He said, trying to reassure her. Wendy's eyes brightened again. Really? Really. Damon replied, smiling. As they ate, Wendy opened up to Damon about her struggles. She had dropped out of school to take care of her sick mother and couldn't pay for her education. It's okay, Wendy. Everything will be fine. He said, reaching out to touch her hair. He wrapped his arms around her, holding her close as she looked up at him with hopeful eyes. But Damon's embrace was more like that of an older brother than a lover. Wendy was disappointed, but she didn't let it show. As they finished dinner and the night grew darker, Damon suddenly suggested that they go somewhere. Wendy had been expecting an evening of indulgence with Damon, maybe some shopping or ice cream, but instead he led her to a real estate office. Damon took her hand and whispered, I want to buy you a house. Wendy's mind was racing as she tried to process what Damon had just said. Buy me a house? She repeated, her voice filled with disbelief. She couldn't fathom the idea of someone spending so much money on her. The housing prices in the area were exorbitant, and she knew it was a luxury they couldn't afford. But Damon was dead serious. I have the money, he insisted, his tone unwavering. 
Wendy couldn't help but wonder where this sudden wealth had come from. After all, Damon had been absent from their lives for so long, and even their once thriving company, Astromar, had crumbled. How much money could they possibly have? Wendy's mind raced with conflicting thoughts. If Damon was willing to buy her a house, maybe she should accept it. But a part of her couldn't shake the feeling that it was too good to be true. Maybe she should just keep the money and try to make a comeback on her own. Damon, keep the money, she pleaded, her voice filled with concern. I don't need it. You need money too. You should use it wisely and invest in something that will benefit us both. But Damon's expression remained serious, unwavering. Trust me, he said, his voice filled with conviction. I'm richer than ever. I'm even richer than when I was the boss of Astromar. As they entered the real estate office, Wendy couldn't help but feel a sense of unease. The bright lights and open layout made her feel out of place, like she didn't belong in this world of luxury. But the sales lady approached them with a warm smile, ready to assist. Sir, may I ask what type of house you are looking for? She asked politely. We have some beautiful riverfront properties available. There are excellent schools and shops within walking distance. Wendy's eyes sparkled with excitement as she hung on to every word of the sales lady's introduction. But just as quickly as her eyes lit up, they dimmed again as reality set in. Doubt crept into Wendy's mind, making her question whether Damon really had the means to buy a house. Unable to contain her curiosity any longer, Wendy mustered up the courage to ask the dreaded question. How much does a house here cost? The saleswoman's gaze shifted back and forth between Wendy and Damon, assessing their financial status. While Damon appeared calm and collected, Wendy's expression betrayed her. It was clear to the saleswoman that they were the kind of couple who needed to rely on loans and help from their parents to make a down payment. The saleswoman responded, Sir, the prices of apartments in this area are currently discounted. They may not be grand, but they are cozy and nice enough. She narrowed her eyes, trying to gauge the reaction. However, if you're looking for a larger house, the pricing starts at $1.5 million. Wendy's face turned pale at the mention of such a hefty price tag. The reality of her financial limitations hit her hard. The sales lady, sensing Wendy's disappointment, quickly interjected, But wait, let me tell you about the amazing location. There are hospitals, schools, and public transportation all around. It's truly a convenient and desirable area to live in. The price tag still loomed over her like a dark cloud. She knew deep down that her salary would never be enough to afford even a modest home in this area. The thought of sacrificing necessities for decades to scrap together enough money for a small house was disheartening. Wendy discreetly tugged on Damon's sleeve, silently urging him to leave. Damon didn't move. Will you show us your best house? The sales lady was taken aback, but her sharp eyes had already noticed Wendy's shyness about the money. In a split second, the sales lady had classified them as poor. But the sales lady was a professional, and she knew how to handle the situation. She guessed that Damon wanted to impress Wendy with his experience and generosity. And with his handsome looks, the sales lady couldn't help but enjoy serving him. She recommended a gorgeous home with a balcony that overlooked the river, but the price was steep, nearly $3 million. Wendy sighed when she heard the hefty price tag. In the past when Damon was still wealthy and powerful figure he once was, this amount of money would have been a mere drop in the bucket for him, but now things were different. Wendy wondered why he would consider spending such a large sum of money on something like this. Surely there was more pressing matters that required his attention and investment. She didn't want Damon to drain his resources because of her. Why don't we explore other options? Deep down, Wendy was embarrassed to admit that she simply couldn't afford it, so she resorted to finding an excuse. The sales lady smiled knowingly, as Wendy's reaction was exactly what she had anticipated. After all, how many ordinary people could afford such a luxurious house? Meanwhile, another saleswoman, feeling impatient, whispered to Molly, the saleswoman attending to Damon and Wendy. Molly, these people aren't serious. Hurry up and send them away. Molly ignored her colleagues. She needed to maintain a professional attitude. Huh? Wendy? Damon and Wendy turned their heads to see a pot-bellied man barging in through the door. Wendy's expression immediately changed upon seeing him. Her greeting hesitant and forced. Oh, hello, Greg. Wendy managed to say, clearly uncomfortable with his presence. You looking at a house too? Greg asked, his eyes shifting toward Damon with a fake smile plastered on his face. Who are you? Before he could respond, Wendy intervened, introducing Damon as her brother. Damon, this is my supervisor, Greg. Damon nodded curtly at Greg and didn't let Greg's hostility affect him. Turning to Molly, the sales lady, he confidently said, Continue to introduce these houses to me. Molly had initially assumed that Damon was merely playing along, 
not generally interested in the houses, but she quickly acquiesced. Tiffany, Molly's co-worker, dashed over to greet Greg. She had been assisting him in closing the deal on a property. It had been quite some time since Greg had set his sights on a magnificent house. However, due to his various obstacles, he didn't make a move. Days turned into weeks as he deliberated, until finally he found himself in the capable hands of a real estate agent extraordinaire, Tiffany. And today, Greg arrived to seal the deal and confirm the purchase. As Tiffany witnessed the customer she had been tirelessly guiding finally ready to leave, she knew that her commission was just within reach. Greg scoffed, Wendy, why on earth is your brother pretending to be wealthy? I mean, come on, he's just a receptionist. Eager to expedite the signing of the contract, Tiffany quickly nodded in agreement. Absolutely. Some people just love putting on a show, don't they? Greg nodded in agreement. Look at this guy. Thankfully, he's not exactly rolling in the dough, or else my property value would plummet if I had to be neighbors with someone like him. His eyes were filled with disdain. You need to be more selective with whom you sell properties to. Many important people of status live in the neighborhood. Imagine a small receptionist living here. It just wouldn't fit. We need to keep exclusivity intact. If you can find a reason to kick them out, then I'll sign the contract right now. Tiffany sighed. Selling houses in this market was no easy feat. She sidled up to Molly, who was busy showcasing the various benefits of the house to Damon. Molly, why are you still greeting these two people? Look, another customer has come in. Go and greet those customers with the desire to make a deal. Tiffany said bluntly, Tiffany, why are you being so rude? Molly furrowed her brows, displeased with her colleague's behavior. These are our customers. We need to treat them with respect. But Tiffany was unapologetic. We need to focus on making deals, Molly. Our customers are waiting. Let's not waste our time. Molly's face turned pale, shocked by Tiffany's audacity. Tiffany, that's going too far, she exclaimed. Are you seriously suggesting that we chase away potential buyers just to secure a deal? Tiffany crossed her arms over her chest and replied matter-of-factly, Oh, come on, Molly. Do you honestly think these people are going to buy a house? Snap out of your daydreams. Molly's anger boiled over. Tiffany, enough. My customers don't need to hear your nonsense. Realizing that Molly was not easily swayed, Tiffany turned her attention to Damon. Do you honestly think someone in your position can afford a house like this? She sneered. Save yourself the embarrassment and leave immediately. Your status is nowhere near worthy of a place like this. In the real estate office, Molly was in a heated confrontation with her colleague, Tiffany. Molly's clients had become the unfortunate victim of Tiffany's disrespectful behavior, and Molly was not about to let it slide. Enough, Tiffany! Your nonsense ends here! How dare you treat my clients like this? I'm taking this straight to the manager! With a fearless smirk, Tiffany retorted, Go ahead and complain. Let's see if the manager will side with you or me. Rumors have been circulating about the manager's scandalous affair with Tiffany, and it was clear that his loyalty would lie with her. Molly's decision to complain would potentially backfire. Despite the whispers of their affair, Molly's anger toward Tiffany's audacious behavior burned brighter than ever. Determined to seek justice, she stormed upstairs to confront the manager head on. Why are you still here? Tiffany's face twisted into a scowl as she addressed Damon and Wendy. Wendy shot back. Is this how you treat your guest? Tiffany's response was cold as ice. I welcome those who generally want to buy a house. But in this high-end community, we can't be dragged down by the riffraff. Greg swaggered over. Wendy, my dear, I must implore you not to make a grave mistake of purchasing a house in my neighborhood. Should you disregard my advice, I'm afraid I'll have no choice but to take drastic measures at the company. His threats held no weight. He was merely trying to intimidate Wendy, fueled by his bitterness. Wendy had rejected his advances a few months prior, and he was still annoyed. Suddenly, the sound of footsteps echoed from upstairs. Molly emerged, accompanied by the manager. Molly's voice was filled with righteous indignation as she addressed the manager. Manager, I can't tolerate Tiffany's behavior any longer. She insulted my clients. Tiffany crossed her arms. Molly is wasting precious time on these insignificant people. She has disrupted my client's peace. My client had every intention of closing on a house today, but I'm afraid he won't proceed if these two individuals are present. The manager turned to Molly. Tiffany's right, Molly. We have to prioritize our wealthy clients. Molly's eyes widened in disbelief. But didn't you promise to protect every customer? She exclaimed. The manager sighed. Some clients simply do not require our protection. 
Molly was at a loss for words. She couldn't believe how absurd the situation had become. Damon, too, found the whole thing ridiculous. He had always tried to avoid getting caught up in the drama of dealing with people like this, but their actions had pushed him too far. That's when a brilliant idea struck him. He remembered Pitbull and Egger mentioning their thriving real estate business in Meyerson. With a newfound determination, Damon wasted no time calling Edgar. And what a stroke of luck it was. It turned out that the property in question was indeed Eggers. In other words, it belonged to Damon's own company since they were new business partners. The matter suddenly became much more simple. Damon urgently requested Edgar to come to the real estate office. After Damon hung up the phone, he grinned. You guys better stick around because the one and only Edgar Gates is about to make his grand entrance. He exclaimed. Tiffany was clueless about who Edgar Gates was. She had no idea he was a big shot in the company, someone who held immense power and authority. Meanwhile, the manager of the sales department furrowed his brow. He had heard the whispers about Edgar Gates, but their paths had never crossed. The distant sound of car engines grew louder, and suddenly, the legendary Edgar Gates stormed into the real estate office with purposeful strides. Where is Damon Walker? Right here, Damon said. In an instant, Edgar's dignified expression transformed into one of pure delight. Apologies for the delay, Damon. Please tell me what we can do to make things right. We'll make any necessary changes. Damon frowned. I'm not satisfied with the service at the real estate office. Who are you recruiting? Other than this lady named Molly, the rest are rude and incompetent. Edgar's expression turned cold. Who is the manager? The manager, sensing trouble, approached with his head lowered, his voice barely above a whisper. Mr. Gates, I'm I'm the manager, he confessed. Edgar's anger flared, his voice dripping with disdain. Are you blind? Do you even know whose this is? Every single property, every apartment, every house, they all belong to Mr. Walker. And you, a mere speck of dust, dare to oppose him like this? The room fell silent, everyone stunned by Edgar's outburst. Was it true that Damon's company owned the properties? Edgar's fury turned towards Tiffany. And you, get the hell out of here right now, and take your useless manager with you. He bellowed. Tiffany trembled, her voice quivering with fear. Mr. Gates, I, I didn't do it on purpose. It's none of my business whether you did it on purpose or not. You're fired. Edgar's tone left no room for argument. He turned to Molly. It's Molly, right? You can take the manager's place. How about a promotion? Molly's jaw dropped, unable to comprehend the sudden turn of events. Happiness washed over her, but it almost felt too good to be true. She had only recently obtained her real estate license. Thank you for the offer, Mr. Gates, but I'm, I'm afraid I can't do it. Molly said fearfully. The manager, desperate to keep his job, begged. Please give me another chance. I promise I won't make the same mistake again. Molly's too inexperienced to be the manager. Please don't give my job to her. Edgar raised his hand and delivered a resounding slap to the manager's face. Turning his attention to Greg, Edgar snarled. Who are you? Damon chimed in. That's Wendy's supervisor at work. He's a real jerk. Greg stammered. I, I took a liking to a house here. I'm here to pay the deposit today. Before he could finish his sentence, Edgar mercilessly slapped Greg and sneered. Get lost. Someone like you doesn't deserve to live in one of our houses. Stunned by the slap, Greg mustered the courage to remind Edgar. But... But I'm your customer! Suddenly, two imposing bodyguards emerged and swiftly picked up Greg. You... you can't do this to me! I'll sue you if you dare lay another hand on me! Greg was forcefully dragged away by the security guards. It wasn't long before the sound of Greg's agonizing screams filled the air. Wendy's brow furrowed. Damon, do you think Greg will be okay? Damon shrugged. I'm not sure, but it doesn't look good for him. Noticing Wendy's worried expression, Damon reassured her. Don't worry, he won't dare to bully you again. If he ever tries anything, just let me know. Damon, may I ask which house you're interested in? I can arrange for someone to take you there right away. Edgar offered. Damon pointed confidently at the brochure. This one, take us to see it. Edgar quickly nodded, springing into action. Within moments, the finest Bentley from the sales department arrived. Not only that, but Edgar also mobilized nearby security forces to ensure Damon and Wendy's safety. Damon dismissed the fuss. There's no need for all this. We can just take a taxi. He turned to Molly and said, You take care of it. Edgar, you're free to go. But, 
But what about the security guards? Edgar asked. Damon shook his head. No need. With a helpless sigh, Edgar reluctantly left, trusting Damon to handle things. The taxi whisked Damon, Wendy, and Molly away to the house. As they drove, Wendy gazed out the window, her mind swirling with thoughts. She was still reeling from the shocking revelation that Damon was still alive. Despite her mother's illness, the sudden turn of events had injected a fresh dope of hope into Wendy's life. Meanwhile, Molly, sitting in the front passenger seat, couldn't resist stealing glances at Damon through the rearview mirror. From the moment Damon had arrived, Molly had felt at ease in his presence. Little did she know that he was the secret boss of the company. And to think, all these magnificent houses belonged to him. The way Edgar had treated Damon only added to the mystery. Could it be that Damon's background was even more impressive than Edgar's? As they pulled up to the house that Damon had his eyes on, Wendy gasped. The house was grand and spacious. As soon as Molly flicked on the lights, the house came to life, revealing its stunning decor and exquisite renovations. Every detail had been carefully considered, from the materials used to the placement of each piece of furniture. It was clear that this house was a statement of wealth and status. Damon turned to Wendy and asked, What do you think of this house? If you like it, I'll give it to you. Wendy was speechless. She wandered through the three-story home, taking in every inch of its grandeur. The house had a sprawling yard and sprawling swimming pool. The landscaping was meticulous and dozens of exotic plants peppered the ground. As she explored the house, Wendy's lost count of how many rooms there were. Each one was more beautiful than the last. The balcony was enormous, with beautiful plants and rocking chair nestled among the flowers. In the distance, she could see the river glimmering in the sunlight. In Wendy's wildest dreams, she had never imagined a house so breathtakingly beautiful. Molly, standing beside Damon, chimed in eagerly. Our house here is an absolute marvel, and there's even a park nearby. Every amenity you can imagine is at your fingertips. Damon nodded in agreement, his eyes filled with warmth. Wendy, this will be your home from now on. I'll make sure your name is written on the deed. I'll take care of the mortgage. Overwhelmed with gratitude, tears streamed down Wendy's face. Damon, thank you, she exclaimed, her voice filled with emotion. After thoroughly exploring the house, Wendy and Damon are escorted back by a car arranged by the real estate company. As they sat in the car, Damon revealed, Starting tomorrow, you can move into the house. It's all yours. You can make it your own just the way you've always dreamed. Remember the bank card I gave you? Feel free to use it without limits. Call tomorrow and arrange for your mother to receive treatment at Meyerson. Money is no object as long as she gets better. Wendy lightly embraced Damon, tears of happiness streaming down her face. The car arrived at a red light, in the darkness ahead, Damon spotted a group of motorcyclists parked haphazardly, and a group of young people loitering and smoking. His heart sank as he realized that it was the same group he'd had trouble with before. They seemed to be waiting for someone to come out of the nearby restaurant. Oh my god, it's them! Wendy exclaimed, her face instantly draining of color. But with Damon by her side, she managed to keep her panic at bay. Just then, the restaurant's door swung open and now came a man and a woman. They were laughing and joking, clearly having a great time. The man was tall and undeniably handsome, but Damon didn't recognize him. However, when his eyes fell upon the woman, his entire body trembled, and he couldn't tear his gaze away. She was tall and stunning, just like he remembered. Her hair was pulled back into a ponytail, the moonlight dappling her face. Even standing still, she seemed like a work of art. Could it be Veronica? Damon's mind raced. He had imagined countless scenarios for their long-awaited reunion but he never expected to see her in this unexpected situation. Damon's eyes lit up with pure ecstasy, unable to contain his excitement. But as his gaze fell upon the handsome man standing beside Veronica, a wave of gloom washed over his heart. Brother, do you know her? Wendy had been observing Damon closely. The sudden change in Damon's eyes sent Wendy's heart into a frenzy, a sour taste creeping up her throat. Of course, Wendy knew Veronica, she was the formidable boss of SeaTech, while Wendy worked at the front desk. Intuition whispered to Wendy that there was something special between Veronica and Damon. After all, Veronica had once worked at Astromar. Damon struggled to find the right words to respond. Wendy bit her lip, her mind racing. She wasn't naive. She had a hunch that Damon might have feelings for Veronica. Suddenly, the group of young people who had been hiding in a corner, smoking, rose to their feet. The leader of a group, Brock, declared, the target has made an appearance. It's time to get to work. Lars, the man who Damon had beaten up earlier, was frustrated. He threw his cigarette butt to the ground and complained about his bad luck. 
he had been rejected by the SeaTech receptionist and then insulted by some random guy. He was in no mood to hit his target. Meanwhile, Veronica and her companion got into a BMW. Follow that car, Damon instructed his driver. The group of young men on motorcycles also followed the BMW, but they didn't notice Damon's car. Wendy was scared and asked him what the young men wanted. Damon didn't know, but he was worried that it would be detrimental to Veronica. Molly trembled in the front seat. Wendy said with a trembling voice, What do you think they want with her? Damon frowned. I don't know, but we need to help. Veronica was in the midst of a lively conversation with the man in the BMW when her heart skipped a beat. The sound of revving motorcycles grew louder and louder until they were surrounded. Suddenly, a loud crash shattered the window and sent Veronica's companion reeling from a blow to the head. Blood spattered across the car, causing Veronica to scream in terror. But her handsome companion was quick to react. He knew trouble was brewing and wasted no time in jumping into the driver's seat. With a fierce determination, he slammed the car door shut and floored the accelerator, sending the car hurtling forward at breakneck speed. The hooligans were relentless. Brock, Lars, and their cohorts took an iron rod and began to smash violently into the BMW. Despite its sturdy build, the car couldn't withstand the relentless assault and it was soon riddled with holes. Veronica's companion knew he had to act fast to protect her. With a fierce determination, he drove the car to its maximum potential. But Lars wasn't about to give up. He jumped on his motorcycle and rammed into the BMW with a resounding boom. The car caved in, causing the engine to sputter and die. The sound of metal meeting glass echoed through the air as Lars forcefully swung his iron hammer against the window of Veronica's BMW. He swung open the car door, his eyes fixed on Veronica. Get out of the car, he demanded. Instead of succumbing to panic, Veronica calmly stepped out of the car. As Lars looked at Veronica up close, he realized just how breathtakingly beautiful she was. It wasn't just him who was stunned. Even Brock and the group of young men standing nearby were captivated by her presence. Veronica's tone was frosty. What do you want? Grizella, one of the women in the gang, didn't like the attention she was receiving. I heard you're the CEO of SeaTac. She said, her tone laced with annoyance. Veronica confirmed the truth with a nod. That's right, what's the matter? Grizella crossed her arms. We heard that you messed with Quinn Marvel. Veronica's brows furrowed. You're working for Quinn? Grizella narrowed her eyes. I'm not at liberty to say, she replied cryptically. But if you keep questioning us, I won't hesitate to throw acid on your face. Veronica fumbled for her phone. Stop threatening me. I'll call the cops. Grizella smirked. Do whatever you want. I think you'll be surprised where their loyalties lie. Brock stepped in. Grizel, hold your horses. We can't throw acid on her just yet. Grizella pouted. Brock, are you so bewitched with her that you've forgotten our mission to take her down? Ah, why are all men the same? Although she said that, she didn't dare to disobey Brock's words. Veronica's face drained of color. What exactly do you want? Brock sized her up. We have orders to kill you, but not before getting some information. What? Veronica cried. Lars brandished a knife. Veronica's heart raced as she realized they weren't joking around. Despite being intelligent and powerful in the business world, Veronica felt completely out of her depth in the situation. Brock stepped forward. Beauty, I don't think you're a bad person, but why did you cross Quinn Marvel? I think there must have been some kind of misunderstanding. Why don't we find a place to drink a few shots and talk? Lars chimed in, laughing lewdly. That's a great idea. Veronica knew better than to trust these men. They were all drooling over her beauty, and she knew that if she got drunk, she would be in even more danger. With a cold, steely gaze, Veronica refused their offer. Don't even think about it. Grizella, who had been simmering with anger, spoke up. Brock, don't talk nonsense with this slut. I'll pour acid on her. Who cares if she's dead or alive? Grizella's impatience was reaching its peak. She couldn't believe that Brock was falling under the spell of the seductive vixen, forgetting all about their boss's warning. Frustration etched on across her face, she grabbed a bottle of acid and twisted off the lid, ready to unleash it on Veronica. However, Veronica was quick on her feet, dodging the attack just in time. The acid missed her face, but it splattered onto her clothes, releasing a pungent smell that filled the air. And then to her horror, Veronica's clothes began to burn. Stop! A voice rang out through the night. All heads turned simultaneously toward the source of the voice their eyes straining to make out a tall man in a clown mask lurking in the darkness. 
Who do you think you are? Brock spat, playing at being mysterious, meddling in my affairs. With a swift wave of his hand, Brock signaled for his brothers to encircle the masked man. The masked man's voice cut through the darkness once more. You have five seconds to leave. He declared, his words laced with a chilling finality. Brock refused to yield. You're asking for it! He bellowed, his anger reverberating through the night. Lars swung his baseball bat with all of his might, aiming for the masked man's head. Yet to his astonishment, the blow yielded no blood. Instead, a metallic clang filled the air. The masked man, unscathed and undeterred, extended his hand and seized Lars by the neck. With a powerful force, Lars let out a piercing scream, his arm snapping under the masked man's relentless strength. Witnessing Lars being mercilessly attacked, Brock's anger erupted like a volcano. Get him! The mysterious figure in the mask swiftly seized Brock by the throat, delivering a devastating blow that sent him crashing to the ground. The remaining lackeys, realizing the gravity of the situation, scrambled forward to intervene, yet their efforts were futile against the sheer power and skill of the masked man. Call the police! If anyone calls the police, I'll break your hand. The masked man growled. The air was filled with piercing screams, in what seemed like mere moments. The gangsters found themselves sprawled on the ground, defeated and broken. The few remaining delinquents were left trembling in terror. Brock, now on his knees, pleaded desperately for his life, but the masked man showed no mercy. With a swift and brutal motion, he shattered Brock's other hand, leaving him writhing in agony. Lars, desperate to escape the clutches of his assailant, attempted to flee. The masked man snatched Lars up in one swift motion. With a fierce blow to Lars's teeth, the masked man sent him crashing to the ground unconscious. A geyser of blood spewed from his mouth. The whole attack was executed with the fluidity and precision that left Veronica in awe. The other thugs were quick to flee, leaving Veronica alone with her savior. Breathless and trembling, Veronica hardly could believe what had just happened. Just as the masked man was about to slip away into the shadows, Veronica called out to him. Wait! She cried. Who are you? How can I repay you? The masked man paused, turning to face her. His voice was low and steady as he spoke. There's no need for repayment, he said. Veronica was baffled. Please don't leave yet. Veronica suddenly found herself stuttering, unable to form words that she wanted to say. But as she looked at the figure before her, her heart skipped a beat. It was too similar to Damon, the man she had loved and lost so many years ago. If she hadn't known Damon was dead, she would have thought the person standing before her was him. But there was still a glimmer of hope in her heart. Maybe Damon was still alive, living a peaceful life somewhere. Veronica had worked tirelessly to build SeaTac, hoping to rebuild the glory of Astromar that Damon had worked so hard to establish. She had poured her heart and soul into the company, hoping that one day, Damon would return and be proud of what she had accomplished. She shook her head. That was just a fantasy. She needed to face reality. Damon was gone. Veronica's heart raced as she watched the masked man disappear into the darkness. Veronica, are you alright? A concerned voice called out, breaking the silence that enveloped her. Startled, Veronica swiftly turned her head. It was her companion from the luxurious BMW, and to her relief, he seemed to have recovered from the ordeal unscathed. I'm fine. She replied vaguely. She fell silent, her gaze fixated on the horizon as if searching for solace or answers. Tears filled her eyes. On the top floor of the Rothschild Limited office building in New Portsmouth, Quinn's face turned ashen as he received the call from Fernando. The mission had failed, and anger surged through Quinn's veins. The consequences of defying Fernando were far more ruthless than anything Veronica could conjure within the legal framework. Fernando had possessed a hundred ways to bring Quinn and his Rothschild Limited down. The door swung open and a secretary entered the room. Mr. Marvel, what's wrong? You look so unhappy. Who dared to disturb you again? She asked, concern etched in her face. Quinn remained silent, his gaze fixated on the secretary without any restraint. A blush crept up her cheeks under his intense scrutiny. We can tackle this problem together. I'll help you put out the fire. She declared, her voice filled with determination. Suddenly, a smile spread across Quinn's face. He relished to this moment, basking in the admiration that shone in the beautiful secretary's eyes. It was a feeling that brought him immense satisfaction. Every time his subordinates gazed at him like that, it gave him a much-needed ego boost. Quinn's phone rang. With a sigh, he retrieved his phone from his pocket, only to see his mother's number flashing on the screen. An impatient glint flickered in Quinn's eyes, but he couldn't ignore the call. To his surprise, it wasn't his mother's voice that greeted him, but his uncle's. The urgency in his uncle's tone sent a shiver down Quinn's spine. Quinn, 
Your mother's at the hospital. She needs surgery. If you don't get enough funds, she may not make it. Please, hurry and transfer some money. Quinn rolled his eyes in exasperation. These people were like vampires, constantly trying to drain him of his hard-earned money. If he fell for their tricks, he would be nothing short of a fool. Determined not to be taken advantage of, Quinn abruptly ended the call. Sinking into the plush sofa, Quinn lit a cigarette and let the smoke swirl around him. His mind was clouded with thoughts. His brow furrowed in deep contemplation. The memory of not eliminating Veronica still haunted him, a constant thorn in his side. c -Tech had always been a source of anguish for Quinn, and he couldn't bear to let Veronica harm Rothschild Limited any further. With a newfound resolve, Quinn knew that he had to take matters into his own hands. No longer would he stand idly by, allowing others to dictate his fate. It was time for him to rise and protect what was rightfully his. Quinn was an efficient person. That's why Damon had recruited him to Astromar all those years ago. He had decided to book a flight to Meyerson. After he finished booking the flight, he tried to relax. Standing on the rooftop, a wine glass in hand, Quinn observed the bustling traffic below and contemplated the recent turn of events. His lackey may not have succeeded, but that didn't mean Quinn himself had failed. His collaboration with Fernando had come at a great cost. However, it had also bestowed upon him an unimaginable power, one that remained hidden until the need arose. And when that moment arrived, Quinn would astonish the world. Quinn. Startled, Quinn spun around at the sound of his name. His eyes fell upon a young man leisurely smoking, his gaze fixed upon him. Instantly, Quinn's face contorted with displeasure. Damon, what are you doing here? Unfazed, Damon responded nonchalantly. What's the matter? Am I not welcome? After all, we were best friends and business partners for four long years. Quinn's face contorted with emotion, shifting from sadness to anger and back again. Finally, he plastered on a fake grin and said, Let's head to my office, shall we? Quinn set a pot of coffee to brew. The silence between them was palpable, heavy with unspoken memories. Do you ever think about the past? Damon ventured. Quinn's nod was slow and deliberate. I remember it all too well, he admitted. But I try to forget. It's not something I'm proud of, you know? But it's part of me, and I can't just erase it. Late at night, when the world was quiet and still, Quinn's mind would wander back to those dilapidated brick houses of his youth. The rain in the summer, the leaks in the winter, the taunts of his peers, it all came flooding back. And then there was Sammy, his ex-girlfriend, always lurking at the edge of his thoughts. Damon nodded thoughtfully. You know, Quinn, it's interesting how our perception of others can shape our lives. Some people let their insecurities drive them to work harder, to prove themselves. But for others, those insecurities become a destructive force, eating away at their self-worth. Quinn's voice rose with frustration. You just don't get it, Damon. Ever since we started university, you've been the shining star. All the girls were head over heels for you. Fifi, Avery, and even Veronica. You had them all. You were a winner, and I couldn't help but feel jealous. I've always lived in your shadow, always striving to be as great as you. And you know what? It's because of you that I am the way I am today. Your pity only makes me sick. When you promoted me at Astromar, it only fueled my determination to surpass you. From the very beginning, I hated you. We were never real friends. A wild laughter escaped Gwen's lips, a mix of relief and newfound courage. But you know what? I finally have the guts to face you. Quinn's words were harsh, digging deep into Damon's heart, yet amidst the pain, he couldn't help but feel a sense of clarity. At least now he knew the truth, the image he held in Quinn's heart. Damon had always suspected that there was deep-rooted reason behind Quinn's transformation, but he never could imagine just how significant it was. Curiosity burning within him, Damon couldn't help but ask again, Why do you want to kill Veronica? Quinn's expression shifted, a mix of surprise and suspicion. How do you know about that? Damon casually lit a cigarette, his eyes fixed on Quinn. Quinn, you may despise me, but wanting to kill Veronica over a petty business dispute. Have you completely lost your sense of right and wrong? A dark, bitter laugh escaped Quinn's lips. Morals? Don't lecture me about morals. Veronica deserves to die. Any woman associated with you deserves the same fate. In my eyes, you're the one who deserves to be eliminated the most. Damon's gaze turned icy as he stared at Quinn. Quinn. You've transformed into a devil. Gritting his teeth, Quinn retorted, So what if I'm possessed? I've been possessed ever since I killed the first person who defied me. Anyone who stands in my way will become my stepping stone. Damon's curiosity got the better of him. How many people have you killed? A chilling smile crept across Quinn's face. I've lost count. I've committed heinous acts for longer than I can remember. 
adding you to the list won't make much difference, but removing you will certainly lighten the load. Damon remained calm and composed. Is that so? Don't tell me you dare to kill me. Quinn's hideous smile widened. In my eyes, no one is untouchable. And you, Damon, are the person I desire to kill the most in this lifetime. By eliminating you, I will conquer the inner demon that haunts me. And I believe I will rise above it all. Damon's grip tightened around the coffee cup, his knuckles turning white. Quinn, this is your last chance. He said, his voice low and intense. If you can find a way to make up for your sins, maybe, just maybe, I'll consider letting you walk away from this. Quinn's laughter echoed through the room, wild and unhinged. Oh, Damon, you've got it all wrong, he sneered. This is my turf. A sly smile crept across Damon's face. You seem to have forgotten something, my friend. I know how to fight. Quinn scoffed, his arrogance oozing from every pore. And how do you know I'm still the same person you once knew? He challenged. With a swift motion, he tore off his shirt, revealing a body sculpted like steel. His voice dropped to a deep, menacing tone. Damon, I have endured years of hardship, and what I've gained in return is immeasurable wealth and unparalleled combat power. Your fighting skills are nothing more than child's play in my eyes. Before I end you, I'll show you what true strength looks like. Damon's brow furrowed. He could feel a surge of energy emanating from Quinn's body, like a lightning bolt coursing through his veins. Damon had a realization. Quinn was a genetically modified biochemical warrior. Memories flooded Damon's mind of a battle fought with every ounce of his being. He had faced a warrior like Quinn before. It had been a fight for survival that had nearly cost Damon his life. Only through Will's self-detonation had Damon managed to escape the clutches of death. Had Quinn undergone the same transformation, if he was in cahoots with the Martinellis, it made sense. Damon used to feel nervous in situations like this, but not anymore. He had mastered the hidden mind method, passed down from his father and his grandfather, and his strength had reached an unprecedented peak. Quinn lunged at Damon. With lightning-fast reflexes, Damon dodged Quinn's attack. Quinn was shocked. He had never seen anyone move that fast. He tried again, this time with a reverse kick that would have sent an ordinary person flying, but Damon didn't budge. Quinn couldn't believe it. He was a biochemical warrior, and Damon was just a regular guy. How could he resist his attacks? Quinn attacked Damon like a madman, but it was no use. Damon was too quick, too strong, too skilled. The office shook with force of their blows. Quinn unleashed a barrage of iron fists, each strike aimed at Damon. But no matter how relentless his assault, Quinn couldn't land a single blow on his elusive adversary. It was as if Damon possessed an otherworldly agility effortlessly evading every attack. Damon struck Quinn. Suddenly, Quinn felt a wave of numbness wash over him, his body growing feeble. Quinn sank to his knees. He had been so confident, so sure that his strength surpassed Damon's, that he could finally erase the shame of his past. Yet Damon had shattered his illusions with a single blow. Damon had not only defeated Quinn, but he had also trampled upon his dignity. I have stripped you of your powers so that you can no longer perpetrate evil. Damon said quietly, no! Damon, you can't do this! But no matter how fervently Quinn pleaded, he had already become a mere shadow of his former self. Damon looked down his nose at Quinn. Your mother's running out of time. You better go and see her before it's too late. Damon remembered Quinn's mother. She was a woman of simplicity and kindness, even in the face of her illness. She didn't want to burden her son with her troubles and chose to suffer in silence. Before Damon left, he couldn't resist searching Quinn's office. Little did he know that his actions would lead to uncovering some damning evidence that Damon could use in his favor. The new Portsmouth police had attempted to investigate these cases before, but their efforts were in vain due to a lack of evidence. Who would have thought that a seemingly law-abiding taxpayer like Rothschild Limited could be involved in such heinous acts? As new Portsmouth swiftly assembled a special task force to delve into the depths of Rothschild Limited, more troubling revelations were bound to come to light. For Quinn, none of that mattered anymore. He had reached a point where he couldn't care less about the company's downfall. Instead, he found himself driving toward a secluded manor, his mind consumed by one person he desperately needed to see. And there he was, in all of his ostentious glory, Fernando lounging on a sofa draped with zebra skin. He looked at Quinn with a contemptuous sneer. Fernardo! Quinn's voice trembled with a mix of fear and desperation. Fernardo sipped his martini. What's happened? Why is the company falling apart? And why do you look so beaten? Quinn's voice quivered as he replied. He, 
he's back. The one who crippled me and exposed all the evidence against me. I implore you, please help me get rid of him. Who? Fernando's expression darkened. Damon! Quinn's voice was filled with terror. The name alone sent shivers down his spine. Damon! Fernando's voice contorted. He'd been trying to find Damon for years. Quinn nodded vigorously, his eyes wide with fear. Yes, he's returned, and he's stronger than ever. I... I can't defeat him. Help me! You know what, Quinn? You're nothing but trash now. Your company is a lost cause, and so are you. So tell me, why should I even consider your request? Fernando taunted. Quinn's voice trembled as he responded. Because Damon is your enemy, and I can be your loyal companion, your dog. A sly smile crept across Fernando's face. He then pointed toward a fierce-looking bulldog nearby and said, If you want to be a dog so badly, prove yourself. Defeat my bulldog, and maybe I'll consider helping you get back on your feet. Quinn had willingly descended into the depths of darkness, willing to do whatever it took to bring Damon down. Put the dog in a cage, Fernando commanded. Quinn acquiesced. Bulldogs were notorious for their powerful attacks and aggressive nature. Quinn, already crippled by Damon, was now in an even worse state than before. Blood flowed from his wounds as he let out a heart-wrenching scream. But fueled by an indomitable will and the burning desire to witness Damon's demise, Quinn tapped into the wellspring of unimaginable strength. He launched himself at the bulldog, gripping its neck tightly. The bulldog thrashed and clawed at him in a frenzy. As the man and the dog battled inside the cage, Fernando stood outside, accompanied by his friends and subordinates, laughing. They didn't believe that Quinn would win against such a ferocious bulldog. Quinn took a deep breath, shutting his eyes tightly, and delivered a powerful punch to the bulldog's stomach. The beast shuddered and fell, silent. The iron cage slowly opened and Quinn stepped out. Master, look at me. I've defeated your dog. Now will you help me? Fernardo slapped him across the face. What the hell, Quinn? How dare you beat my dog to death? Fernardo sneered. His lackeys understood his unspoken command. They grabbed Quinn and tossed him out of the yard like garbage. Quinn screamed at the sky, his rage boiling over. Damon, this is all your fault. You turned me into this monster. Quinn's phone rang, jolting him from his thoughts. He fished out his phone and saw that it was just another call from his uncle. His uncle delivered a single sentence that shattered Quinn's world into a million pieces. Your mother's gone. If you still have a conscience, come back and see her. Quinn desperately tried to process the devastating news. He had always believed that his uncle's intentions were tainted, that he was trying to swindle him out of his hard-earned money. Never in his wildest dreams did he imagine that this call would bring such a heart-wrenching news. In a state of panic, Quinn frantically dialed numbers, desperately seeking answers, but his attempts were met with silence, as if the whole world was conspiring against him, leaving him to face this tragedy alone. Determined to be by his mother's side, Quinn resolved to book a flight ticket back home. However, his plans were thwarted when he discovered that all of his accounts had been frozen. The weight of despair settled upon him. In a moment of desperation, Quinn turned to his secretary, the one person who had always been there for him. Through thick and thin, he dialed her number. Hey, it's Quinn. Help me book a plane ticket. Before he could finish his sentence, his secretary's voice cut through his plea, devoid of any loyalty or compassion. I don't have any allegiance to you anymore. Quinn felt his heart sink even further, as the realization of his isolation hit home like a ton of bricks. With nothing but money in his pocket, Quinn embarked on a journey back to his hometown. His uncle reluctantly led Quinn to the grave. Money was tight and Quinn's mother's burial site lacked a proper headstone. One would have believed that the son of the tomb's owner was once a billionaire. As Quinn knelt before his mother's grave, he wept. Mother, I'm so sorry. Uncle Bart smoked a cigarette. I heard he committed a crime. You should turn yourself in. Even though our family's poor, we've never had any criminals among us. Quinn's grip on the cold gravestone tightened. Revenge was all he desired, and he blamed it all on Damon. If he didn't exact his revenge on Damon in this lifetime, he believed that he would never find peace in the afterlife. Uncle Bart challenged Quinn's perspective. Is that so? Are you saying that Quinn is responsible for everything? The killings, the arson, the tax evasion, and the oppression of others? Quinn's predicament had become the talk of the town, with everyone insisting that the only course of action was for him to turn himself in. But Quinn vehemently shook his head, his denial growing more frantic with each passing moment. His uncle sighed, realizing that his words were falling on deaf ears, and left him to his own devices. A sudden gust of wind swept through the cemetery, causing Quinn to shudder involuntarily. The wind carried an eerie chill that made him feel as if something ominous was lurking in the midst. 
Quinn's life was a roller coaster ride of ups and downs. Unfortunately, his journey came to an abrupt end when he was bitten by a wild dog and succumbed to rabies within a couple of hours. When Damon heard the news, he couldn't help but sigh. Quinn's life was short, and toward the end, he had sold his soul to evil forces. Even after establishing Rothschild Limited, he still lived under the shadow of Fernardo. He was always living for others and never for himself. Perhaps death was his best home, where he could finally find peace and rest. At night, Damon sat down at the dinner table with his family. Just as they were about to dig into their meal, Damon's phone buzzed. It was a message from the intelligence personnel. Quinn had been killed by Fernardo, who had sicked a wild dog on him. But there was a silver lining. They had finally found out where Fernardo lived. Meanwhile, Fifi's phone rang. It was her mother, Karen, and they were in deep financial trouble. Fifi turned to Damon with a determined look in her eye. Cupcake, I need to go see my mother. I have to do something to help. Damon nodded, understanding the urgency in her voice. Of course, whenever you're ready. Fifi wasted no time. How about tomorrow? Damon sprang into action, pulling out his phone to call Pitbull and arrange Fifi's flight. The next morning, as the clock struck 10, Damon emerged from the house with Fifi by his side. Pitbull had already gathered a group of his loyal followers at the entrance, ready to put on a grand display to welcome them. The sight left the neighbors and security guards in utter disbelief. Fifi's family had always been an enigma, living in a lavish mansion in Meyerson despite not being particularly wealthy. Perhaps it was Fifi's stunning beauty or the fact that she was a widow, but she had become an object of desire for many men. Some men were willing to leave their wives in a heartbeat if Fifi would only agree to date them. Yet Fifi remained unmoved by their advances. Living in this exclusive district meant that everyone was well acquainted with Pitbull. However, no one could have anticipated his presence in the neighborhood, let alone his grand gesture of opening the car door for Damon and Fifi, bowing in a show of respect. What did this mean? It meant that Pitbull was willingly placing himself in a lower position than Damon. Damon's calm and collected demeanor only added to the shock and intrigue surrounding him. Fifi and Damon stepped into the private jet, ready for a quiet visit with her mother, but Pitbull had already arranged for a grand reception on the ground. As they approached, a fleet of luxurious cars and staff were waiting for them. Damon wasn't thrilled about the attention. He just wanted to see Fifi's family without any fuss, but he couldn't blame the staff. They are just doing their job for Pitbull. After a brief meeting, Damon dismissed them and took Fifi to Karen's home. Karen's company had been struggling since her divorce from Fifi's father, and lately things had only gotten worse. Her family had turned on her, blaming her for not contributing enough money. They even kicked her out of her own home. She was forced to rent a small apartment in a dangerous area. Damon was shocked when he saw Karen again. She looked tired and worn down, a far cry from the confident woman he remembered. Despite her success as a businesswoman, her family had taken advantage of her for years. And now that her company was struggling, they had abandoned her completely. Mom. Fifi's voice trembled as she saw Karen's appearance. Tears streamed down her face, and Karen quickly wiped them away with a gentle smile. Come on, let's get something to eat, Fifi suggested, trying to lighten the mood. But Karen had an appointment that night, so she had to leave. Damon and Fifi left to find food on their own. As they walked through the bustling streets, Fifi couldn't help but feel a strong sense of nostalgia. She hadn't been back in years, and without Damon by her side, she never felt like she could truly enjoy the city's vibrancy. Though she was worried about her mother, she leaned her head on Damon's shoulder, and for a second, all of her concerns melted away. Fifi took Damon to a restaurant she remembered frequenting in music school. Suddenly, a voice broke through the crowd. Fifi, is that you? Damon and Fifi turned to find a woman staring at them in disbelief. Oh my god, Jojo? Fifi cried. It all clicked into place for Damon. Jojo was Fifi's former roommate from music school. He remembered how she and another roommate, Florence, had never quite warmed up to him back then. Oh my goodness, Fifi, it really is you! Jojo exclaimed. I can't believe it's been so long since we last saw each other. Wow, time flies! Fifi nodded, her eyes sparkling as she looked at Damon. Jojo couldn't help but notice the tender expression on her friend's face. It's been a while, Damon, Jojo said. Damon nodded, a small smile playing on his lips. Yes, it has. I never would have guessed that you two would end up together, she said. Hey, Fifi, how about we find Florence after dinner? Fifi smiled at the mention of Florence. Yes, let's do that. What's she up to these days? Have you heard the latest gossip? Jojo leaned closer. Florence's new boyfriend is a total catch. He's the son of a big shot in the entertainment industry, and he's loaded with cash and power. 
No wonder Florence has been killing it in the industry lately. Fifi nodded, impressed by Florence's rise to fame. A handsome man walked in and Fifi beckoned him over. Babe, meet my best friend Fifi and her husband Damon. This is Gideon, my husband and fellow teacher here at the school. Gideon shook their hands, his eyes lighting up as he looked at Damon. Wait a second, are you the founder of Astromar? Damon grinned. Do you know me? Gideon's jaw dropped. I heard you died. Damon chuckled. Fortunately, I'm alive and kicking. Fifi frowned. Wait a second, is Damon really the founder of Astromar? Gideon confirmed it. It's true. Damon used to be my idol back in the day. Jojo's eyes widened in amazement. Fifi, you're so bad. Why didn't you tell me your husband is such a powerful figure? Fifi shyly shrugged. Gideon joined in the banter, his smile widening. It's not her fault, Jojo. After all, Astamar. Uh, forget it. Let's not talk about this anymore. He quickly changed the subject, sensing Damon's discomfort. Let's treat you to a meal. Gideon understood that Astamar was a sensitive subject, so it was best to avoid discussing it. The four of them found a quiet room and settled in, engaging in lighthearted conversation. Jojo was itching to ask Damon about Astamar, but Gideon skillfully redirected the conversation. As the meal came to an end, Damon stood up and declared, It's on me. To his surprise, Gideon had already taken care of the bill. With a playful grin, he replied, Your money's no good here, buddy. Jojo stood up. Okay, are you guys ready to go meet Florence? Forget it. Gideon muttered, You guys should go on without me. Jojo's frustration boiled over. Why are you always like this? She hissed. Stop being so self-righteous. Just relax and have fun. Gideon's face turned red with embarrassment, but Jojo wasn't done yet. Can't you compromise for me? She pleaded. Gideon deflated like a balloon, defeated. All right, he conceded. As they walked, Damon asked about Florence's boyfriend, who was rumored to be in the entertainment industry. You're a music teacher, he said to Gideon. You should know him, right? Gideon smiled bitterly. We can't talk about it now, he said. <sighs> You'll understand when you meet him. Damon respected Gideon's honesty and felt an immediate kinship with him. If Gideon didn't like someone, Damon figured he probably wouldn't either. As they approached the school building, their eyes were immediately drawn to an impressive lineup of luxury cars parked downstairs. The noise emanating from the gathering was deafening, echoing through the campus. It was no wonder Gideon had a distaste for these people. Florence! Jojo called out. Florence's face lit up with delight as she spotted Jojo walking over to her. Without wasting a moment, Jojo grabbed Florence's arm eagerly and exclaimed, Florence, you won't believe who I've run into. The darkness of the night made it difficult for Florence to see clearly. Who is it? With a smile that could rival the sun, Fifi stepped forward and revealed herself. Florence, it's me, she announced, causing Florence's eyes to widen in astonishment. Fifi? Wow, this is incredible. Why didn't you let me know you were back in town? Jojo, why didn't you tell me Fifi was here? Fifi shrugged helplessly. I didn't tell Jojo either. We bumped into each other at the restaurant, she explained. Florence's mood lifted even higher. So Fifi, you forgot about both of us, huh? Well, no worries. You'll just have to make up for it by drinking two extra glasses of wine later. As Florence turned her head, her eyes finally landed on Damon. Damon flashed a charming smile. Hello there. Fifi grabbed Damon's hand and announced, Damon and I are married. Florence clapped her hands. Wow, that's wild. It's been ages since we last saw each other. We're not leaving until we're all drunk. Just then, Florence's boyfriend, Lionel, strolled over. He was the son of a talent management mogul. Damon's old classmate, Levi, was a superstar under Lionel's father's banner. Fifi also knew Lionel from her time in the industry, and as soon as he laid eyes on her, he grinned lecherously. But when Lionel noticed Damon standing beside Fifi, his expression soured. Lionel had tried to pursue Fifi years ago, but she had rejected him. He thought she was a widow, but now he realized she had a husband. Though he quickly regained his composure, his jealousy was palpable. Hey there, Fifi, it's been ages, hasn't it? I never thought I'd run into you again. Lionel said, extending his hand for a friendly shake. Fifi shook his hand limply. Damon, sensing Fifi's unease, flashed a reassuring smile, but remained silent. Lionel, undeterred, rubbed his hands together eagerly. All right, everyone, let's get going. I've got an incredible night planned for us. A fleet of luxurious cars pulled up, ready to whisk them away. Fifi hopped into one of the vehicles, but as Damon was about to join her, a white-haired man in the driver's seat locked the door and said apologetically, Sorry, sir, no more room in this car. Damon pointed toward the empty seat beside Fifi. 
Isn't there another spot? The white haired man repeated, Sorry, this car is reserved for women only. Damon persisted, Then why is he sitting in there? Gesturing toward Lionel, who occupied the passenger seat, the white haired man shot Damon a challenging look. He's the boss, got a problem with that? Fifi's expression changed as she declared, Well, in that case, I won't get in either. Lionel was about to retort with a frosty expression, but Florence interjected, Lionel, they're husband and wife, how can you separate them? Lionel responded coldly, Fine, let him get in the car. However, Damon shook his head and said, Never mind, we'll ride with Gideon and Jojo. Before Florence could respond, Fifi had already grabbed Damon's hand and hopped into the waiting vehicle. Florence couldn't contain her frustration any longer as she confronted Lionel. Seriously, why did you have to treat Damon like that? What did he ever do to you? Lionel dismissed her concerns out of the second thought. Enough of the theatrics, Florence. I don't like him, plain and simple. Gritting her teeth, Florence refused to back down. She knew Lionel's tricks all too well and wasn't about to let him off the hook. Don't think for a second that I'm oblivious to your games, Lionel. I didn't say a word when you were fooling around outside, but Fifi is my friend. How could you do this to her? The driver piped up. My dear, you shouldn't be too hard on Lionel. He's a good man. Florence felt defeated. She knew she couldn't win against Lionel's stubbornness. On top of that, her father's life depended on Lionel's financial support due to his terminal illness. She felt trapped, left with no choice but to compromise and let her tears flow. Meanwhile, in the other car, Jojo was curious. Fifi, why didn't you want to sit with Florence? Is everything all right? Fifi flashed a smile, trying to ease Jojo's concerns. Oh, don't worry about it. We'll catch up later at the bar. It's all good. Jojo chuckled, impressed by Fifi's ability to navigate any situation. You've always been so smooth with your words. Gideon nudged Damon. Bro, take care of Fifi. You have to protect her, you know? Damon understood the underlining message in Gideon's words and responded with gratitude. Thank you. I will. The car drove to Caesar's Imperial Palace Bar. Lionel, Florence, and the rest of the gang had already arrived. However, just as the car was about to come to a halt, a security guard stepped in. Hold on there, buddy. You can't park here. Gideon's face fell, clearly disappointed. Are there no parking spots left inside? The security guard scoffed. With a car like yours, do you think you deserve to park inside? As the car pulled over to the side of the road, a pack of motorcycles zoomed past them. To Damon's surprise, he recognized the riders. It was Brock and Lars, the gangsters who had harassed Wendy and tried to kill Veronica. Damon's frown deepened as he noticed Lionel, who had been waiting at the door, burst into laughter and rushed over to embrace Brock. Damon beat them up the last time he saw them, and they were still wrapped in bandages. Despite their injuries, they were in high spirits. You guys go on ahead. I'll just step out for a smoke. Damon wanted to avoid them. Not wanting to leave Damon alone, Gideon quickly chimed in. I'll join you for a smoke then. If he had to spend time with Lionel or Brock, Gideon would feel as uncomfortable as sitting on pins and needles. He despised those guys. As they made their way to the designated smoking area, Gideon couldn't help but inquire about Damon's miraculous escape from death. Why hadn't there been any media coverage? After all, someone like the founder of Astrobar, who had narrowly escaped death, shouldn't go unnoticed. Damon proceeded to recount the events leading up to his escape, and Gideon listened intently, his eyes widening in disbelief. Everyone had assumed Damon was dead, but he had defied the odds. That's incredible. It wasn't easy, but you made it. Even though Astromar may be gone, there's still hope. You'll make a comeback. Surprisingly, Damon's expression didn't reflect the expected sadness one would feel after losing something as significant as Astromar. Thank you, but to me, Astromar doesn't matter anymore. He radiated an unwavering confidence that left Gideon in awe of his resilience. After finishing their cigarettes, Damien and Gideon were eager to see Fifi and Jojo. As they made their way to a private room, Gideon suddenly collided with a massive man sporting sunglasses. The man barked at him, Are you blind? You just bumped into a living, breathing human being! It was obvious that the man in sunglasses was one who couldn't see where he was going, and he had run into Gideon. But instead of admitting his mistake, he decided to point fingers. Despite feeling intimidated, Gideon remained calm and quickly apologized. He hoped that the man in sunglasses would let the matter go, considering he was at fault. But to his surprise, one of the man's subordinates, a security guard, started to get aggressive. Damon realized he was the same security guard who had prevented Gideon from parking earlier. Although Gideon was willing to apologize, he didn't want to be falsely accused. He stood his ground and said, You guys are the ones who hit me. I'm sorry, but what else do you want? 
The security guard was furious. If you don't shut up, I'll kick your butt. Gideon stood his ground, his voice unwavering. If you even think about laying a finger on me, I'll have the police on speed dial. But the security guard didn't seem to care about Gideon's warning. He raised his leg and aimed a kick at him. Gideon sidestepped, narrowly avoiding the attack. The guards were relentless, shouting and preparing to strike again. That's when Damon stepped in. With lightning-fast reflexes, he lifted the guard's foot and sent him crashing into the wall. How dare you attack my friend! Damon roared, his anger palpable. But the sunglasses wearing man next to them was even more furious. He took off his shades and bellowed. In this Caesar Imperial Palace, I'm the king! Who gave you the right- When his sunglasses were off, he could see Damon's face. He interrupted himself. Oh my god, Damon! Damon was equally stunned. He recognized Wilder from Meyerson. They had become friends after Damon won a bar fight that earned Wilder's respect. But after Damon's supposed death, Wilder left Meyerson and became a small-time boss in this new place. As soon as Damon saw Wilder, he burst out laughing. Wow, it's been ages since we last met. And look at you, you're getting more handsome by the day. Wilder blushed and hung his head. Ah, I'm sorry, Damon. Please forgive me. He turned to Gideon and added, I had no idea you and Mr. Walker were friends. I'm sorry if I offended you earlier. To make it up to you, I insist on treating you to anything you want today. Food, drinks, you name it. Everyone around them was stunned, including the little security guard who stuttered. But boss, who is this guy? Wilder didn't hesitate to put him in his place. Show some respect, kid. He scolded before turning back to Damon. Did I hear that this guy wouldn't let you park in the lot? Unacceptable. Gideon, let me make it up to you by having your car move to the valet area. Sound good? The security guard scurried off to move the car. Damon, I must apologize once again. Wilder said. Gideon found it peculiar that Wilder held such deep respect for Damon. However, as he pondered on it, everything started to make sense. After all, Damon had been a true hero in his own right back in the day. Damon nodded in understanding. The past is behind us. Let's move on and forget about it. Wilder nodded. But boss, why didn't you seek out your old partners in crime now that you're alive? The people around them were left speechless, their jaws dropping in astonishment. They had always assumed that Wilder and Damon were merely acquaintances, perhaps even just friends. Little did they know that Wilder had held an immense admiration for Damon, far beyond what anyone could have imagined. Wilder was shocked and delighted to run into Damon at the bar. Why didn't you tell me you were alive? Wilder breathed. Damon chuckled and patted Wilder's shoulder. It's a long story, my friend. I'll tell you all about it when we have the chance. Wilder was practically bouncing with anticipation. Quick, let's get the best private room cleaned, he said to an employee. But there's someone inside, the employee protested. I don't care who's in there, tell them to leave. Wilder insisted. Damon shook his head. No need for that, Wilder. I still have things to do. Let's chat another time, he said with a smile. Wilder suddenly remembered that Damon had come with friends and felt embarrassed. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Walker. Can you give me your contact number? The brothers haven't seen you for so many years, though I'll miss you. Damon exchanged contact information with Wilder. Little did he know, in the private room where Fifi was sitting with the others, trouble was brewing. The large private room was dimly lit. In the spotlight at the front of the room, a handsome man was captivating the audience with his mesmerizing voice. It was none other than Damon's former classmate, Levi. Brock sat on the couch. His attention never wavered from Fifi. Lionel, your girlfriend and her friends are absolutely stunning!" Brock exclaimed, his mouth almost watering with desire. Get them to come over here and take a few shots with me! Lionel snapped his fingers. He didn't want to cross Brock and Lars. Hey Florence, why don't you, Fifi, and Jojo propose a toast? Florence hesitated, feeling a little uneasy about the idea, but she knew better than to go against Lionel's wishes. With a helpless sigh, she stood up and motioned for Fifi and Jojo to join her. Florence cleared her throat. Brock, we're so glad you could make it. Thank you for coming. Cheers. With that, Florence took a shot and Fifi and Jojo followed suit. Brock's eyes locked on Fifi with a predatory intensity. Lars laughed evilly. Come on, ladies. Don't be so uptight. Have a few more drinks with Brock. You're not scared of him, are you? Florence poured two shots of tequila and downed them in one gulp, feeling the alcohol start to take effect. Lars narrowed his eyes. Florence, you need to get your friends to drink with you. Those are the rules. Florence was on the verge of tears, and Fifi and Jojo looked just as scared. 
but Fifi and Jojo weren't going to let their friends suffer alone. They downed two shots each, coughing violently as they did so. Brock and Lars laughed, enjoying the spectacle. The women were horrified by the shamelessness of these guys, but when Lars asked if they had any objections, no one dared to speak up. Even Lionel, Florence's husband, didn't want to offend Lars, so when Lars suggested that the girls sit beside them to liven things up, Lionel meekly agreed. It was a sad state of affairs, but the girls had no choice but to go along with it. They tried to put on a brave face. It was clear that Lars and Brock were up to no good, but what could they do? Lars grinned with satisfaction as he turned to Florence. You see, even your husband has no objections. What's stopping you? Of course, you can choose not to sit with us, but be warned, the consequences won't be pleasant. Florence reluctantly took a seat beside Lars. As she sat there, Lars leaned in close, taking a deep sniff. Ta! <laughs> Lionel, your wife smells divine. I want to bar her for a few days of fun. Lionel forced a smile, trying to brush off Lars's crude comment. Come on, Lars, you must be joking. Lars rolled his eyes. Who said I was joking? Don't worry, Lionel, I won't lay a finger on your precious wife. Lighten up! If that wasn't enough, Lars turned his attention to Fifi. And as for you, why'd you go with Brock? Fifi shook her head. I'm sorry, but I have a husband. She took a step back, putting as much distance between herself and Lars and Brock as possible. Lars's anger flared up. I gave you an order. Are your ears broken? Brock arched an eyebrow. Fifi, you need to think carefully about how you want this night to go. Lars sneered. Fifi, Brock has money and status, and he's interested in you. So why don't you kick your useless husband to the curb and come with us? Fifi crossed her arms. I expect to be treated with respect. I only agreed to join you all because you're Florence's friends, but this is going too far. A woman sat in a dark corner, smacking her gum loudly. She had been silent until now. Ladies, you have no idea what you're missing out on. Brock and Lars can offer you so much more than your pathetic boyfriends and husbands ever could. Fifi's eyes widened as she recognized the woman. It was Grisella, the same woman who threw acid on Veronica. She was one of the notorious gangsters under Brock and Lars' command. Fifi's first instinct was to flee from the room, but before she could make a move, Grisella stood up and grabbed her arm. The commotion caught the attention of Levi, who had been singing on the stage. He threw down the microphone and exclaimed, What on earth is going on here? The room fell silent as all eyes turned toward Levi. Brock let out a wild laugh, mocking Levi's interruption. How about you focus on singing your lousy songs and stay out of my business? Lars grabbed a wine bottle and hurled it toward Levi. Who do you think you are? Levi skillfully dodged the flying bottle. Lionel rose from his seat. Levi, you're getting too arrogant. Do you want to meet your end? Levi stood his ground. Lionel, you're the one who invited me here tonight. Is this how you show respect? Lionel's face twisted into a menacing expression. Are you trying to get yourself killed? Lionel took a step forward and delivered a powerful slap across Levi's face. Apologize to Brock and Lars for ruining their evening. Levi felt the urge to fight back, but before he could react, Lionel's hand struck him down to the ground. Levi may have been a superstar, but he was still under the control of Lionel's father's talent agency. He couldn't risk his entire career by defying Lionel. As Levi lay on the ground, Lars stood up with a wicked smile on his face. With a swift motion, Lars raised his hand and struck Levi, causing blood to trickle down his face. Suddenly, the door swung open, and Damon finally made his entrance. Damon swiftly grabbed Lars and delivered a powerful kick, sending him flying. The two other young men in the room reacted quickly, rushing toward Damon. Before they could even throw a punch, Damon's legs were already in the air, striking them with precision. They let out agonizing cries and collapsed onto the sofa. No one dared to make a move against them. Damn it! It's... it's you! Brock gasped. Damon smirked. That's right. Brock and his cronies thought they were tough. Damon had already clashed with them before when they harassed Wendy. They didn't know they'd actually fought with him twice because when he appeared to save Veronica, he'd been wearing a clown mask. Brock pursed his lips. Last time I ran into you outside the SeaTac offices, I thought I made it clear I wanted you to suffer. And now you come to me? Big mistake! With a roar, Brock ordered his lackeys to attack Damon. They grabbed stools and wine bottles, ready to pummel him into submission. Levi wasn't about to let his old friend get beaten up. How dare you hit him? I'll fight you all to the death! He shouted, ready to jump into the fray. Damon didn't give them a chance to show their off their fighting skills. As he worked his combat magic, the dim light made it hard to see what was happening. All they could hear were the screams of pain. 
When Fifi finally turned on the lights, she saw Brock and Lars lying on the ground defeated. Lionel hurried over to Brock. Brock, are you alright? He asked. Are you blind? Brock snapped. Lionel pointed an accusing finger at Damon's nose and cursed. Damn you! I know the owner of this club. I'm going to get him to deal with you. Go ahead. Try it. Damon challenged. Just then, Wilder burst into the room. Lionel clapped his hands. Wilder, look what this jerk did to Brock. Lars in the club. Thank God you're here. Little did Lionel know, Wilder had already seen everything through the surveillance cameras. A mischievous smile played on his lips as he turned to Damon. To everyone's shock, Wilder swiftly approached Lionel and delivered a resounding slap. Lionel cried out in pain. Witnessing her husband's punishment, Florence felt an unexpected sense of relief. Ever since she married Lionel, she had become dependent on him, sacrificing her freedom and dignity just to beg for pocket money. He treated her as less than human, humiliating and bullying her, even fooling around with other women. Florence had learned to put up a facade in front of others, but behind closed doors she suffered. Fifi's heart raced as she watched Wilder relentlessly pummel Lionel. She knew that with each passing moment, Florence's safety at home grew more precarious. She urgently called out, Please stop! Wilder halted his assault. Consider yourself lucky today. I'll spare you because she asked me to. Before anyone could fully process what had just happened, Brock's voice thundered through the air. How dare you lay a hand on my people? Lars added, I'm dialing Lucho now. Wilder stepped forward and slapped Lars. You think you could scare me? Lars cried out in pain, his pleas growing louder with each strike. Please, no more! My father will have you all killed! Every fiber of Brock's being trembled with anger, but he knew better than to make a sound. The last thing he wanted was to attract Wilder's attention and find himself in trouble. With a cold smile playing on his lips, Wilder approached Brock, accusing him of causing a commotion. You were trying to take advantage of these women, weren't you? Brock's heart raced. He knew he had to defend himself, but before he could utter a word, Wilder raised a wine bottle and hurled it at Brock's already broken leg. The pain was excruciating. Grizella rushed to Brock's aid. She leapt onto Wilder's back, desperately trying to stop him from inflicting further harm. But Wilder simply shrugged her off. I know you're working with them, Grizella, he taunted, and I have a special way of dealing with you. With a snap of his fingers, Wilder summoned the fiercest woman in their shop. Within moments, a strong and heavy-set woman appeared before them. Boss, you looking for me? Wilder pointed a finger at Grizella. Take her away and teach her a lesson she won't forget. The woman nodded obediently, her grip tightening around Grizella's arm. Grizella resisted with all of her might, but her pleas fell on deaf ears. The strong woman effortlessly swung Grizella over her shoulder and stormed out. A staff member burst into the room. Boss, there's a whole crowd of people outside, surrounding our place. Wilder's expression shifted. Who are they? The young man hesitated. I... I believe it's Lucho and his men. Lucho? Wilder's voice trembled slightly, revealing the fear that this name invoked in him. Ever since Wilder had arrived in the town, he had dreamt of making a big name for himself. But fate had other plans. He found himself constantly at odds with the local power players, unable to establish dominance. And at the top of that power pyramid stood Lucho, a formidable force that even Wilder couldn't deny. Lucho was like a ferocious dragon surpassing Wilder in strength and influence. Though it was never explicitly stated, Wilder knew he had to show respect to Lucho if he wanted to continue working in the city. Why is he here? Wilder's voice quivered. The staff member bit his lip. He said Lars called him. Wilder's face contorted with worry as he recalled Lars's warning. He could only imagine that the young man had come to aid Brock and the others. Lars burst into laughter. <laughs> Lucho has arrived! You're done for! Damon, sensing the tension, approached. Is there a problem? Wilder quickly shook his head, trying to maintain composure. No problem at all, Mr. Walker. Please have a seat, I just need to attend to a few matters. Wilder strode outside, his men following closely behind. No matter what, he said firmly, we must not let them come in. Get out of my way! Someone yelled. Wilder turned to see a group of people approaching, flanked by security guards. The leader was a tall, imposing figure with the full beard and piercing eyes. Wilder felt a bead of sweat trickle down his forehead as he recognized the man. L lucho He stammered. What brings you here? Lucho raised his head proudly. Wilder, I haven't seen you in for a while. You're getting cocky. I heard that you were beating up some of my friends. Don't you think that's unwise? Let me through. Wilder's heart sank. 
Lucho, you, you can't go inside right now. Go away, Lucho roared, his anger rising. What, could it be that you want to challenge my authority? Get lost! Lucho lashed out with a kick, but Wilder blocked it just in time. He knew that he had to hold his ground no matter what. Lucho was not going to pass, not on his watch. For years, Wilder had known the ferocity and brutality of Lucho. Wilder knew that this was Lucho's territory, but Wilder was determined. He had made up his mind that if Damon and Lucho ever had a conflict, he would stand on Damon's side, even if it meant risking his own life. Lucho was livid with anger, but Wilder's unwavering loyalty only fueled his rage. Lucho's men quickly surrounded Wilder's group, making it clear that if Wilder wanted to challenge Lucho, he would have to think twice. But it was too late for Wilder to back down now. Amid the chaos, Brock managed to escape from the club and run for his life. He cried out for help, hoping that someone would come to his rescue. Please, save me! And then a voice answered him. Brock, is that you? Lucho's eyes turned yellow with fury when he saw Brock's battered state. He had been told that Brock was being attacked, and he had come to put an end to it. Lucho's eyes bore into Wilder's. Wilder, my dear friend, he sneered. How do you propose we solve this little predicament? Wilder remained silent, knowing full well that the decision rested in Damon's hands. Brock, nursing his wounds, pointed towards the private room. Lucho, the main culprit is in there. That scoundrel beat me to a pulp. Before Lucho could storm in, Wilder swiftly intervened, blocking his path. Lucho, you can't lay a finger on those people inside. Lucho's rage radiated from his every pore. Is that so? I'd love to see who it is that I'm forbidden to touch. Get out of my way! Wilder refused to budge. Lucio latched out, delivering a powerful kick to Wilder's stomach. Wilder swiftly retaliated. He possessed an unparalleled strength. Under Damon's guidance, his combat skills had skyrocketed. It was this very reason that allowed Wilder to establish himself in his territory, even without any support. Yet Wilder knew that if he were to face an opponent as formidable as Lucho, he would surely be defeated. Lucho's speed surpassed his own, and his blows were stronger, fiercer, and more overpowering. Lucho's fist struck Wilder's nose, sending him flying through the air. Wilder gazed at Lucho in disbelief. He had always known Lucho was powerful, but he had believed he could withstand at least ten of Lucho's strikes. Now he realized he had been gravely mistaken. In the presence of Lucho, he was nothing more than an insignificant ant. Lucho could easily crush him like a bug. Listen up, folks! Lucho declared with a commanding tone. In this world, there are those who can be offended and those who can't. And let me tell you, I'm not one to be messed with. Brock and Lars were practically trembling with excitement. Finally, someone was standing up for them. Meanwhile, in the private room, Damon remained calm and collected, while Fifi, Jojo, and the rest were quivering with fear. Suddenly, Lucho's voice boomed through the door. What's the matter? Are you too scared to come out? Or do you want me to come in there and finish you off myself? Lars rallied his two little friends and charged into the private room. But before they could even lay a finger on Damon, screams echoed through the air, followed by the sound of bodies hurled across the room like cannonballs. You're asking for it! Lucho yelled. But Damon just smiled calmly and stepped out of the room. Oh really? He said. I'm afraid you're out of your league. Lucho's body quivered uncontrollably as an electric current was running through his veins. The young man standing before him seemed strangely familiar yet he couldn't quite put his finger on it. Damon's icy smile sent shivers down Lucho's spine. What's the matter? Have you forgotten who I am? Lucho's mind raced, desperately trying to make sense of the situation. Damon bore a striking resemblance to someone he knew, but it seemed too surreal to be true. After all, when Damon had first arrived at the city, Pitbull had made sure everyone was aware of his arrival, including Lucho. Although Lucho held a prominent position in the team, he was well aware of the gap that separated him from the true power players. Hence, when Lucho laid eyes on Damon for the first time, he couldn't bring himself to believe it despite the familiarity. Damon's smirk grew wider. Lucho, aren't you supposed to be on your knees in my presence? If there had been any lingering doubts in Lucho's mind, they were instantly shattered by Damon's words. His commanding tone and piercing gaze left no room for doubt. A cold sweat began to trickle down Lucho's back. He dropped to his knees and stammered out an apology. I, I, I didn't know you were here. I'm sorry. I, I was wrong. Damn it. The sight was so shocking that Brock, Lars, and Lionel's eyeballs nearly popped out of their sockets. They had all known Lucho for quite some time, 
but never in their wildest dreams had they imagined witnessing such a scene. Lucho, the powerful figure they had always looked up to, was now on his knees begging for mercy. These people were well aware of Lucho's reputation. He was someone who could make problems disappear at the single phone call. Even their incredibly influential boss had vouched for Lucho's abilities, assuring them that he could handle any situation that arose. Lucho's initial display of dominance when he first arrived had only solidified their belief in his power. They had never doubted him before, but now a sense of unease settled over the young men. To make matters worse, they knew that Damon would soon deliver a devastating blow. The impending pain and suffering loomed over them, causing a dark shadow on their once confident spirits. Brock couldn't believe what he was hearing from Lucho. How could he defend that idiot Damon Walker? He had called Lucho for help, expecting him to be on his side, but now it seemed like Lucho had switched loyalties. It was a betrayal that Brock couldn't tolerate. He had trusted Lucho, and this is how he repaid him? Brock clenched his hands in a fist. Lucho's face turned pale. He had submitted to Damon, but that didn't mean he would bow down to anyone else. He locked eyes with Damon. Damon gave him a nod of approval. It was all the confirmation Lucho needed. Without hesitation, Lucho rose from the ground and lunged at Lars. Damn it! Don't you dare underestimate me! Just because you have a gang of people doesn't mean I'm scared of you! If you got the guts, try laying a finger on me! Lars shouted defiantly. Despite Lars's imposing physique, it was surprising to see Lucho, who appeared skinny, display such incredible strength. With lightning speed, he grabbed Lars by the neck, exerting all of his might. Lars was left gasping for air. With one swift punch, Lars crumpled to the ground. With Damon by his side, Lucho had no reason to fear a mere gangster. Even if it was the most powerful person in the world, Lucho would show no mercy. Damon, what should we do with them? Lucho asked. How dare they bully Damon's friends? They deserve nothing less than death. Even if Damon were to command Lucho to kill Lars and Brock in front of everyone, he wouldn't hesitate for a moment. Damon's eyes burned with an intense hatred as he glared at Lars and Brock. These two despicable bullies not only dared to torment Fifi and Wendy, but they also had plans to harm Veronica. It was a line Damon refused to let them cross. Though Damon wasn't ready to resort to murder just yet, he wasn't about to let Lars and Brock off the hook either. Lucho motioned for the group of strong men to seize the troublemakers and drag them outside. Once Lars and Brock were out of sight, the sound of their agonizing screams echoed through the air, growing fainter with each passing moment. There was no doubt that they were enduring a terrifying ordeal. The women who had been victimized by Lars and Brock felt a wave of relief wash over them. They couldn't help but feel a twinge of sympathy for the beating Lucho had unleashed upon the bullies. However, they knew deep down that Lars and Brock had brought this upon themselves. Besides, if it weren't for Damon and Lucho's connection, Lucho might have turned his wrath toward Damon, Levi and Gideon instead. They couldn't even fathom the consequences of crossing paths with these brutes. They should count themselves lucky. As for the group of people who had accompanied Brock and were still acting like tyrants, their fate was uncertain when they witnessed the sorry state of Lars and Brock. Those who had once reveled in their tyranny were now reduced to trembling wrecks. One by one, the young men and women fell to their knees. Please spare us! We have no association with those two jerks! We are merely bystanders! It's true, we had no idea they were so vile. We wouldn't have associated with them if we had known. The group knew they had to cut ties with Lars and Brock, but it was easier said than done. Brock's words had a strange power over them like they were under a spell. But Damon wasn't buying it. It was too little too late. Damon turned to Lucho and said, These people are just as bad as those two jerks. We need to figure out how to deal with them. Within seconds, a group of rough-looking men stormed in, ready to do Lucho's bidding. The young hoodlums knew what was coming and fought back with all their might, but it was no use. Lucho's men were pros. They dragged the gangsters out as they kicked and screamed. Damon's gaze shifted toward Lionel. Lionel pleaded with a face full of terror. I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to do it. P please, don't kill me! Earlier, Lionel had been arrogant in front of Damon, but now faced with Damon's overwhelming dominance and brutality, Lionel was petrified. He realized that even powerful figures like Brock and Lars would be crushed by Damon with the mere flick of his hand. Damon's expression turned ugly. Suddenly, Lionel raised his hand and struck his own face, declaring, I deserve to die! I'm a fool! Lionel's self-inflicted blows left his face swollen and bruised. Florence, Lionel's wife, stood up and pleaded with Damon. Damon, please spare my husband! He didn't mean any harm! I'll do anything if you just let him go! Despite Lionel's flaws, Florence's love and reliance on him were unwavering. Damon gave Lionel a disgusted look, then put his arm around Fifi's shoulder. Come on, babe. 
I think that's enough excitement for one night. As Damon and Fifi stepped through the front door of Karen's house, they were greeted by an eerie darkness. It seemed that Karen had yet to return home. Hours passed and the clock struck midnight when suddenly, the stillness was shattered by the sound of footsteps in the living room. It was Karen, stumbling in, clearly intoxicated. Fifi couldn't contain her concern any longer and rushed to her mother's side. Mom, are you drunk? Damon sprang into action, pouring a glass of water for Karen in an attempt to help her sober up. Karen shook her head, her words slurred. It's nothing, really, just a few extra glasses with the client. Tears swelled up in Fifi's eyes. The past few years have been tough for Karen's struggling company. She was under a tremendous amount of stress. Fifi handed her mother a glass of water. Mom, your health is more important than any business. Karen looked at Damon. I'm doing this for your future. She sighed, her words carrying a hidden meaning. Ever since the news of Damon's supposed death had reached them, Karen had repeatedly expressed her desire for Fifi to remarry. There were plenty of eligible suitors that were eager to marry her. However, Karen eventually gave up on trying to persuade her daughter and instead focused on working tirelessly to secure their financial stability. In Karen's mind, Damon had been the cause of her daughter's delayed life. Even though he had returned, Astamar was no longer there, and to make matters worse, Damon was poor. Karen could not help but question his right to provide a high-quality life for his family. Mom, you don't have to worry about me. With Damon around, the future for me and the baby will be bright. Fifi murmured. Karen found it hard to believe. Shaking her head, she dismissed their conversation. It's late. You guys should go get some sleep. Once they were back in the room, Damon noticed that Fifi's eyes were downcast. He hugged her. Don't worry. Your mother's company is facing some trouble, but I'll find a way to solve it. Thanks, Cupcake, she whispered. Damon's smile turned mischievous. Thank me. Is that all you can do? Fifi's face turned red. Then, how do you want me to thank you? Damon's smile grew even more sly. Do I need to spell it out for you? Fifi glanced at the closed door and began to undress. The next morning, Damon and Fifi woke up to find Karen at the breakfast table. An evening gown sat on a box on a chair next to her. Hey, what's the occasion? Fifi asked curiously. Karen beamed at her daughter. Tonight, you're accompanying me to a fancy banquet. Karen turned to find Damon and said, As for you, Damon, you can just find a place to eat tonight, or there will be plenty of food in the fridge. Damon was about to reply when Fifi cut in. Mom, why can't Damon come with me? Karen hesitated for a moment before finally admitting, It's a gathering of the upper class, mainly for socialites. I'm not sure if it's appropriate for Damon to attend. Fifi wasn't having any of it. If Damon doesn't go, then I don't go either. Karen sighed, realizing she couldn't keep the truth from her daughter any longer. Okay, fine. There are a few potential investors who will be there. I just want you to come with me to increase our chances of success. Fifi understood immediately. She was determined to get those angel investors, no matter what it took. Fifi couldn't resist her mother's request, but she wasn't going to give in without setting some conditions. Sure, I'll go to the banquet, but only if Damon accompanies me. Otherwise, count me out. Karen sighed, realizing Fifi wasn't going to budge. Fine then. Damon, you're coming too, but you'll have to find something suitable to wear. Just make sure it's not too cheap. Fifi grinned, satisfied with her victory. That's more like it. Damon and I will go buy a tuxedo this afternoon. On the way to the hotel, Karen took the opportunity to brief Fifi and Damon on the do's and don'ts of the evening. She emphasized how to interact with aristocratic families, how to handle dining etiquette, and other important social protocols. Fifi had been raised in a privileged environment and was well-versed in these matters, but Karen was really addressing Damon. She was worried that Damon's humble upbringing would ruin her good reputation. Luxury cars lined the streets, and high-ranking officials mingled inside. Karen and her entourage didn't cause much of a stir, but the stunning Fifi turned heads wherever she went. Karen used Fifi's beauty to her advantage, chatting up men who could help her career while Damon wandered the banquet hall, bored out of his mind. But then something caught Damon's eye. It was his cousin Miranda working as a waiter. Damon had heard rumors about the Brokerton's downfall, but he never thought it would come to this. What had happened to his family? 